have your cooperation by filling the front seats first. Thank you. Uh, a very good morning, ladies and gentlemen, honoured guests and esteemed panellists. Um, we are really very happy to have you here, both in person and online. Um, if, if we have guests coming in, could you please fill the front row seats first, please? Thank you. Okay, so we'd like to welcome you to the Gender, Health and Science Forum R&D 2024. My name is Roshwini and I am your MC for today. Uh, together with my lovely co MC, Dr. Hidayah. This forum is organized in partnership with the Ministry of Health Malaysia, Siviraj Mahidol University, Thailand, Monash University, Malaysia, and the Institute of HIV Research and Innovation, Thailand. Today, we gather to delve into critical discussions surrounding gender inclusivity in healthcare and scientific research. Additionally, we are delighted to celebrate a milestone for DNDI, the 20th anniversary of its groundbreaking efforts in addressing neglected diseases globally for the most neglected populations. Just an interesting fact for everyone here. In the last 20 years, DNDI has developed 12 treatments for six deadly diseases globally. And we do this by working with our worldwide network of partners, which includes the Ministry of Health Malaysia. The Ministry of Health Malaysia is a proud founding member of DNDI and is also on the board of DNDI. Now, this hybrid forum today will be held simultaneously in the NIH Institute Malaysia and MUIC in Thailand. It will encompass four very diverse sessions, and it is our honor to welcome our distinguished panelists comprising of 20 remarkable experts from Malaysia, Thailand, Sri Lanka, and Nigeria, all of whom are women. What a fitting tribute for the coming International Women's Day, which is going to be held on March the 8th. And uh, may I just say, as a female as well, this is a huge yes for female em empowerment. And also, may I add, Roche, we have two female MCs here today, which is us. And uh, for your information, today's event is the grand finale and follow-up to two Women in Science events that DNDI has held last year in Malaysia and Thailand. We have a short video for all of you to enjoy. Before we proceed further, let us familiarize ourselves with the house rule of today's forum that will be displayed on the screen. Now, without further ado, let us officially begin this exciting forum with a word of welcome from Ms. Kaori Nakatani, the director of DNDI Japan, who will say a few words on the significance of our forum today. Ms. Nakatani has gathered an extensive knowledge of strategic health programs globally, having worked with organizations such as UNAIDS, UNDP, JICA, focusing on public health and universal health coverage. 
Thank you very much for the introduction, distinguished guest, guest of honor, members of the media, members of the audience, speakers, and fellow women in science. I extend a warm welcome to everyone, both those of you physically present at the National Institute of Health in Malaysia and those joining us virtually across the globe to the DNDI's 20th anniversary forum on gender, health, and science and research and development. It is great pleasure to have you with us today as we delve into crucial discussions surrounding gender inclusivity in health and science and R&D. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to deliver the opening remarks for this significant event and wish to express my sincere appreciation to the organizing committee, including the National Institute of Health, Ministry of Health Malaysia, the Faculty of Medicine, Sidiraz Hospital, Mahidong University, Thailand, the Institute of HIV Research and Innovation, Thailand, and Monash University, Malaysia. Your collaborative efforts have been instrumental in bringing the forum to fruition. Prior to, prior to today's event, the co-organizers have set up two Women in Science networking events, one in Kuala Lumpur in April 2023, and another one in Bangkok in August 2023. These events brought together women leaders and experts, encouraging discussions on the challenges faced by women in science, such as gender inclusivity issues and the need for more women mentors. The success of these events fueled our enthusiasm to organize today's forum with the objective of exploring gender inclusivity and ways to work together to deliver the best science. In Japan, we face similar challenges, such as low representation of women in scientific research. Today's topic is not only relevant to Southeast Asia, but important regionally and globally. We aim to encourage the acknowledgement of women's contributions in gender, health, and science R&D, develop pathways for more women to contribute as principal investigators and scientific leaders, and push boundaries through creative and collaborative thinking to help neglected patients in need. It is fitting as we commemorate DNDI's 20-year journey, today's event will also feature 20 remarkable women who will address various aspects. In session one, we will explore gender-specific health challenges on diseases such as dengue, HIV, HCV, and STIs. Session two, we look at uh, gender inclusive healthcare, discussing why public healthcare policies needs to be inclusive. Session three, we will examine the issues surrounding the inclusion of adolescent and pregnant women in clinical trials. Finally, session four, we feature insights from four accomplished women in health and science who will share their personal experiences and ideas. As we embark on this journey of gender empowerment and inclusivity, I extend my deepest gratitude to all participants and stakeholders for their unwavering support. Together, let us continue to champion the cause of neglected patients, strive for um, universal access to life-saving treatment, and let's be proactive in ensuring more women play a part in achieving these goals and are recognized as such. Thank you very much. Thank you for your warm words of welcome, Ms. Nakatani. It is now my distinct pleasure to present a special tribute marking DNDI's 20th anniversary. We will be showcasing a short film titled Out of the Shadows, highlighting the efforts of DNDI scientists from Brazil, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and Sri Lanka. Now this film follows the work of discovery, 
develop and deliver cures for patients who have lived in the shadows for far too long. Stay tuned as we witness this journey to bring hope to those who are most neglected. I've watched this personally a few times and each time I still get very emotionally um, affected. So I hope you all will enjoy this. Thank you. The sudden onset of the monsoons has taken most people by surprise. 40,000 infections and 25 deaths. When we were kids, we hadn't heard of dengue. All dengue endemic countries are having increasing dengue outbreaks every year. Things are getting worse because of climate change. Comme médecin, effectivement, on enregistre des décès. Ils ont dit ça. Ça l'a boué. Il n'arrive pas. Il a un problème de coordination. Beaucoup de décès des enfants. Ça ne va pas garder. De... Donc, il y a beaucoup de signes neurologiques. Il est vraiment lourdement malade. Neglected patients live in very remote areas and they are very poor. Ils ont des problèmes de santé pour tous lesquels il n'y a pas de solution adaptée. Ils n'intéressent personne. We are not seeing a strong investment for diseases affecting billions of people all around the world. You're in the shadow. Nobody knows about you because nobody knows you exist. Patients suffer in silence. When I look back to where we started, all these diseases in all these countries, patients not having the treatments to save their lives. In 2003, people from all around the world, from Brazil, from India, Malaysia, Kenya, from Paris, from MSF, they came and they said, let's fix this situation and let's show that we can have an alternative model of research and development. Our patients are dying, not because their diseases are incurable, but because as consumers, they do not provide a viable market for pharmaceutical products. They created DNDR. DNDR is a not-for-profit drug research and development organization that discovers, develops, and delivers treatments for neglected patients. In 20 years, we have delivered 12 treatments. We've been able to save millions of lives. We are making progress, but it's not over. O que acontece muitas vezes é que esses pacientes eles são infectados pelos parasitas ainda na infância e então esse quadro ele evolui ao longo dos anos, né, muitas vezes passando totalmente despercebido pelos pacientes. Não existe mais a condições do tratamento da doença de Chagas em si. E gera esse senso de urgência como pesquisadores, são necessários novos tratamentos. Despite causing really havoc for over 30 years in Southeast Asia and Latin America, unfortunately we still don't have a treatment for dengue. It's not the time to wait until somebody else finds you a solution, it's about us finding solutions ourselves. The way we do research needs to change, working in isolation, not sharing data, actually hinders the development of science. A DNDI, no, nos seus esforços de descoberta de novos medicamentos, trabalha com os melhores parceiros, os melhores grupos de investigação ao redor do mundo. By forming such partnership, you are bringing everybody to a common platform where they can collaborate with each other, openly share their data, and progress much faster than working alone.
the NDI, it's about people. We sincerely hope. Thank you. We sincerely hope everyone enjoyed the short film and tribute. Now, Rosh, I know you are with the NDI, and I just wanted to say, wow, that was a very amazing and inspiring video. Congratulations on your organization's 20th. Thank you, Dr. Hidayah. And for us at the NDI, um, we are most proud actually of working with our partners, not only in the region but globally. And we are very inspired always with MOH and the work that you do in Malaysia. So, um, how do you like our breakfast just now? Have you all had enjoyed our breakfast? How was the breakfast today? It was okay? It was enough for you? I uh, don't think you guys maybe had enough because those claps were very uh, weak, you know. I kind of was expecting a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, I mean... <laughs> Are you all excited for our lineup of speakers today? Yeah, well, we are as well because we read all their bios and it was very impressive. Yeah, um, these are women, I think, who never took a break in their careers. Very much go-getters. So, you know, I'm really excited for all of you to be very inspired for, for what they've done and probably inspire you to also go after some great achievements and milestones. And we welcome all the participants who have just arrived. We would like to get your cooperation once again to fill up the prime rules first. So for this forum, we will be using the Slido platform where attendees can engage actively with panelists for questions and discussions. We will display the Slido QR code throughout each session. So our first session, Exploring Gender-Specific Health Challenges on Diseases, promises to be enlightening as we dive into specific diseases such as dengue, hepatitis C virus, HIV, and HPV. This session will be chaired by Dr. Anat Son, the Director of Therapeutics Research, Education, and AIDS Training, Treat Asia, and Vice President of the Foundation for AIDS Research, Amfa Thailand. She is also an Associate Clinical Professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of California, San Francisco. Since 2008, she has been overseeing the implementation of Treat Asia's research, training and community advocacy activities. Dr. Son works very closely with WHO on the elimination of mother-to-child transmission of HIV, syphilis and hepatitis B. With her, we have three expert panelists leading this session, which include Dr. Nilika Malavich, Head of Dengue Global Program and Scientific Affairs, DNDI South Asia. She is also a professor at the Department of Immunology and Molecular Medicine, University of Sri Jayawardenepura, Sri Lanka. She is an academic visitor at the MRH Human Immunology Unit, University of Oxford, and a member of the Executive Committee of the International Society of Infectious Diseases. She has been focusing on immunopathogenesis of dengue, vascular leak and biomarkers, as well as translating these findings into clinical trials. Alongside, we have Dr. Nitaya Panupa, is the Executive Director at Institute of HIV Research and Innovation, IHRI Thailand. She also has an interest in key population-led health services, KPLHS. Dr. Nitaya has also served as Chair co-chair and is a member of several WHO guidelines development groups and strategic and technical advisory committees. In addition, she is also governing council representative of Asia and the Pacific Islands International AIDS Society. With them joining is no, no, sorry, Nurul Iza Anwar, the co-chair of Secretariat Advisory Committee to the Finance Minister Malaysia. Nurul Iza Anwar was formerly member of parliament for Pematang Pau Malaysia. Prior to being an MP, she was known as a strong proponent of political and civil rights with a special interest in prisoners of conscience to pursue a holistic reform agenda and to expand Malaysia's democratic space. Some of her initiatives as MP was to help the most vulnerable communities of her constituency 
which includes program roles in collaboration with University Malaya. Now, passing the floor to you, Dr. Son. Thank you so much for those warm introductions, and I'm very pleased to be here together with our esteemed speakers. For today's session, we will have each of the three speakers present on dengue, hepatitis C, and HIV, and then human papillomavirus. Following their presentations, we will have a period for question and answers, and I hope that during all of the talks, you and the audience will be coming up with some great questions that can be presented to our panelists. And so without further ado, I would like to introduce or have Dr. Nalika give the first presentation for today on dengue fever. Dr. Nalika. Uh, thank you so much for this invitation and to uh, share uh, things how uh, how dengue affects uh, it's a proportionately affect women. I, I uh, hope everybody can uh, see my slides in full screen. Can everybody see my slides in full screen? And not quite yet. I think the NIH screen, there we go. Please proceed. All right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so it's indeed an honor to speak uh, uh, on this Women's Day and the 20th anniversary. Uh, so I'll be talking about the changing epidemiology of dengue and how we can face the new challenges. So just to start off, uh, I mean, since the COVID pandemic has been going down, dengue has been emerging. And because of especially what happened during uh, since 2022 and 2023, where there was an explosion of cases of dengue everywhere. Uh, January, this January, WHO declared it as a global health emergency. And uh, uh, Bangladesh, for instance, recorded the highest number of cases last year with 1,705 deaths. Uh, and in, I mean, dengue has been affecting all tropical and uh, subtropical countries from Latin America to Southeast Asia. And although Africa was spared uh, earlier, uh, last year Africa saw really a, a lot of countries being affected, 11 countries in Africa, uh, with Burkina Faso being specifically affected. So there was a ninefold increase in dengue cases in uh, African region alone. So if you look at the presentations, what everybody talks like maybe five years ago, uh, people were questioning is there dengue in Africa uh, and, and what's going on, but you know, uh, dengue is now affecting all uh, tropical and subtropical countries. Now, with the changing epidemiology, how does it affect is the important question I want to uh, uh, talk about today. So, this is data from Thailand, where initially in the 1980s and before, dengue was predominantly a childhood infection. But as to, uh, with time, I mean, of course, the population gradually aged, but uh, disproportionate to the aging population, you can see that uh, dengue hemorrhagic fever was specifically affecting old individuals. So as of 2017 and now, dengue does affect a large proportion of uh, young adults and old individuals. In Sri Lanka, so I'm coming from Sri Lanka, and this is Sri Lanka data where you see uh, dengue gradually uh, spreading all over the country. And uh, like all other countries in the world, uh, for instance, in two, uh, year 2000, the vast majority of cases were in children, but the vast majority of cases now are in uh, between in the reproductive age group. So when you have uh, uh, more infections in adults, uh, it affects, of course, pregnant women. You have more dengue in pregnancy in old individuals and in those with comorbidities. So specifically, I will be talking about uh, dengue in pregnancy uh, and how why that is important and also uh, de dengue in women, how different it is uh, and, and the specific uh, health problems in women. So sadly, uh, in 2017, uh, because of uh, how disproportionately pregnant women are affected by dengue, uh, dengue was the number one cause of maternal mortality in 2017. So when a pregnant uh, woman gets dengue, uh, it, it, it affects maternal death by three times uh, and dengue hemorrhagic fever increases uh, by 450 times. That's a huge uh, proportion of increase in uh, death due to dengue hemorrhagic fever during pregnancy compared to non-pregnant women. And pregnant women are more likely to require ICU admission ventilatory support and multi-organ failure. 
And apart from complications in the woman, uh, you also have fetal complications in the form of stillbirth, low birth weight, preterm pre delivery, uh, fetal distress, and miscarriages. So when dengue affects uh, women who are pregnant, it has a wide variety of complications in women all over the world. I mean, these studies are from Brazil, uh, from Latin America to uh, Malaysia, Vietnam, and so on. So uh, in all countries, and also affects uh, the, the unborn baby. And so what have been the policymakers, stakeholders uh, doing about this and responding to this increased uh, uh, vulnerability of pregnant women? Uh, for instance, in Sri Lanka, uh, there is uh, Sri Lanka put out these management guidelines for dengue in pregnancy, a specific separate guidelines for management of dengue in pregnancy because of the increased morbidity and, and because it was an unborn cause of maternal mortality in 2017. Uh, recently, uh, 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 yeah, so uh, we do have such management protocols in dengue in pregnancy in India. Recently, Bangladesh, or, uh, sorry, pa Pakistan also put out similar guidelines. But many countries do not have, uh, let's say, how do you uh, management guidelines for pregnancy. In Malaysia, for instance, there's like a two-pager in the adult dengue guidelines. But many uh, stakeholders, policymakers have not focused on how to treat a dengue in pregnancy. So, uh, to, uh, so the most important questions we need to answer when it comes to uh, pregnancy in women is when dengue hemorrhagic fever or dengue occurs at the time of delivery, how do we make delivery safe for the mother and baby? Because this is a mother who is excessively bleeding or, you know, has a bleeding tendency and how do you actually deliver such a mother? And these sort of things have uh, ended in uh, devastation uh, with a lot of complications. And how can we reduce complications during a dengue in pregnancy? And how do we prevent fetal distress and associated complications? Because these are very important things. So my just suggestions uh, to, to uh, also for the discussion is would be establishing a color because this affect women in all countries uh, everywhere. And of course, the incidence is rising to establish collaborative research networks to evaluate the effects of dengue in pregnancy for mother and baby including risk factors and complications, because we don't have enough data to actually understand all this, how it affects, how much it affects pregnant, uh, pregnant women and the actual effects on, on the babies. And uh, when it comes to developing drugs, we need to develop drugs that are safe to use in pregnancy and include uh, pregnant women in clinical trials using drugs that are safe. So lastly, apart from uh, pregnant women, how uh, else does uh, dengue affect women? And if you look at the bleeding manifestations in dengue, uh, gum bleeding is the most frequent uh, manifestation, which is not a very serious one. But of the serious manifestations, menstrual bleeding uh, occurs in about 5% of uh, individuals, uh, women. Altogether, this is like, this, this is men and women. So if you just took women, it would be, the proportion would be much higher. But when it comes to, so, uh, we did this uh, clinical trial in Sri Lanka, which was an outpatient study, uh, including 231 patients uh, with, with a, a drug called Rupertity, and six patients in the placebo arm and seven patients uh, uh, on Rupertity and uh, developed bleeding manifestations. And the most frequent bleeding manifestations was pervaginal bleeding. Five out of six patients on Rupertity and five out of seven patients on the placebo developed pervaginal bleeding. And uh, so because of this uh, bleeding tendency and uh, uh, in, in women, we started this clinical trial in Sri Lanka to address this. How do you uh, manage bleeding, pervaginal bleeding uh, in, in dengue in, in women? Uh, so we started this trial on oral methotestrone uh, versus uh, oral tranexamic acid alone. So the combination of tranexamic acid, with, which is some a drug that uh, reduces bleeding or uh, given for excessive bleeding with norepisterone versus tranexamic acid alone. And we started this trial in 2017, but we had to end this because uh, the the PI of this uh, study was uh, a member of our clinical working group of the Dengue Alliance. I, I was also involved in this, but we had to terminate this trial because we didn't have enough funds. Uh, so after recruiting 68 patients, because uh, we didn't have funding. The government had to stop funding after the Easter bombings and all that. The government ran out of money. So we only recruited 68 patients. 
And uh, five of them, uh, which is around 7% of women in this trial, uh, required blood transfusions because of bleeding. So that's a, that's a large number who actually required blood transfusions uh, because they had such a lot of bleeding during a uh, uh, vaginal bleeding. So the important questions to answer is the what, what is the ideal treatment for vaginal bleeding uh, during dengue? And should women in reproductive age when they actually develop dengue or dengue hemorrhagic fever because of the known complications of uh, the pervadinal bleeding, prophylactically be given tranexamic acid or narachistrone, or how do we actually uh, address this uh, bleeding in uh, uh, pervadinal bleeding? And this is, has been very neglected with no clinical trials except for this one that was terminated in Sri Lanka addressing these issues in women. So, uh, so although dengue affects men and women equally, there are specific problems in women, uh, like dengue in pregnancy and pervaginal bleeding, which we need to focus on. So that's it, uh, and thank, that's all from me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nalika. And and I think, uh, even though I'm an infectious disease specialist, uh, I was really I found the data you shared quite sobering about the very high risk to pregnant women and to women in general with regard to vaginal bleeding. So hopefully we'll have some questions and discussion about that later on in the session. Our next speaker is Dr. Nitya Panupak and Dr. Nitya, we'll turn it over to you to share about hepatitis C and HIV. Thank you very much. I'm going to share uh, my screen um, here and hope uh, you can um, see it in full screen soon. Does that work all right? Do you see the full yes. screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so, so, um, thank you, the, the moderator for the kind introduction as well. And it is truly my great pleasure to be part of, uh, the forum, um, today. And, um, I would like to actually start by declaring that even though the, the session, uh, this session is titled Gender Specific Health Challenges on Diseases. And I'm going to talk about, um, HIV and hepatitis C, which are diseases, um, but through a, t a gender lens. Uh, I have to say that I don't believe um, that we can address any public health challenges using just a gender lens and to talk about diseases, but not the people. Um, so I strongly believe that we must move beyond examining individual factors, um, but focuses on the relationships and interactions between um, factors and only through uh, the intersectionality lens uh, here that we can map um, health inequities more uh, with more precisions and, and chart more effective directions in policy and program development. Um, but yes, I'm very glad to talk about HIV and HCV today because these are the two viruses that we have most powerful tools uh, to treat and to test and to treat them. Um, and for HIV in particular, we now uh, also have uh, an extremely strong tools for prevention um, as well. So let me start uh, with this uh, HIV status neutral approach um, to to um, HIV um, slide to explain what I just mentioned. Um, here to design um, HIV service delivery model, once individuals come in for HIV testing, we must give equal importance uh, to serve them regardless of their HIV um, status. If you test HIV positive, you will be uh, uh, offered to start antiretroviral treatment or ART immediately in order to bring you um, to achieve the goal of having zero risk of transmitting HIV to uh, other people as soon as possible um, sexually, uh, which is called U equals U or uh, undetectable equals untransmittable. Um, status. But if you test HIV negative, you will also be offered um, PrEP or PEP, which is pre or and post exposure prophylaxis immediately in order for you to achieve the goal of having negligible risk of uh, HIV acquisition, since PrEP can prevent HIV by more than 99%. Um, however, not enough people can access these powerful tools like U equals U and PrEP, partly because we have not done good enough to conduct U equals U and PrEP research and or plan its implementation through a gender lens. 
For U equals U, uh, published research focused on the impact of U equals U to reduce internalized um, stigma, reduce fear, and to return dignity and allow sexual pleasure among gay and other men who have sex with men. But are women also allowed to have pleasurable sex? without fear of transmitting HIV to their sexual partners. If this is the serious question, especially in settings like some parts of Africa when ART service is seen as a way to promote free sex among women. Women are often being seen just as the body to prevent transmission to babies or partners, not as an individual. Women also have um, these legal and uh, rights related factors which influence their ability to access ART and to reach and sustain um, undetectable viral loads. And since U equals U research has not focused much on um, a beyond um, sexual transmission, data are limited um, uh, around um, um, uh, U equals U and transmission during pregnancy or during breastfeeding uh, periods. However, why research uh, continues um, in these areas? Care providers must now help parents to make informed decisions, informed choices, and provide support for those who choose to have babies or to breastfeed their babies in a non-judgmental way, especially in uh, high income or low uh, or middle income um, settings where guidelines against vaginal birth and against breastfeeding have directed clinical practices for decades. Um, PrEP research also has affected um, its implementation um, and its successful scale-up. Um, PrEP randomized control trial focused on heterosexual women and men in Africa and um, men who have sex with men outside of Africa and therefore PrEP implementation programs in uh, many countries right now are leaving behind men who have sex with men in Africa and heterosexual men and women um, outside of Africa. Um, uh, in addition, um, eligibility, eligibility criteria, risk eligibility criteria used in these uh, randomized controlled trials to uh, effectively um, demonstrate uh, uh, PrEP efficacy also uh, resulted in PrEP being stigmatized uh, as for uh, people who so much enjoy um, um, pleasurable sex without condoms or with high um, STI rates. And lastly, with the lack of trans people um, focused uh, PrEP research. Uh, with research in the past lumping uh, together uh, transgender people with men who have sex with men, there have been uncertainties about potential interactions between PrEP and gender affirming hormones used by transgender uh, women and transgender men, which severely delayed PrEP scale up for transgender people. For HCV, the availability of DAA uh, has brought kill to more than 95% of people uh, with uh, HCV infection. However, I feel it is more concerning than HIV uh, research. Since HCV research focusing on women, transgender, uh, or non-binary people are even more limited, we know that around one quarter to one third of people who inject drugs are women. We at least know uh, that um, among people who inject drugs, HCV incidence is higher among women than men, and women are initiating uh, treatment at lower rates than men. But we know almost nothing about HCV infection and treatment access and uptake among transgender or non-binary people who inject drugs. And no HCV research should be done without laying appropriate and all-round harm reduction services groundwork to ensure human rights are not violated in a research context. Um, OAT, opioid agonist therapy, is one component of harm reduction for those who use opioid. And there are complex gender disparities in accessing OAT. Women often face um, barriers in accessing OAT due to gender-based um, violence, family responsibilities, or fear that children will be removed from their cares, and um, pervasive stigma and discrimination, not only as an individual injecting drugs, but also as a woman, as a wife, as the mother who inject drugs. Um, and even in uh, prison setting, women who inject drugs are less likely to be treated for HCV due to insufficient length of stay. And to conclude, um, I believe that we must apply a gender lens throughout the whole research and implementation cycle. I'm not just talking about the research cycle because I believe that every research must um, start with the end in mind that it will lead to implementation.
we must also ensure meaningful engagement of people with intersectionality throughout the cycle. And here, and here, investment in capacity building for academic researchers in applying good participatory practice and in addressing um, stigma and discrimination, which often originated um, from researchers themselves, are uh, needed. And lastly, an engagement of the community to the level um, of uh, making this a community um, led research and service delivery is critical um, because um, I uh, think that we are, if we are going to be serious about addressing global health issues, uh, having community led research and uh, community led service delivery um, are, are, are the way uh, forward to go. And I'm sure we can uh, discuss more during the panel uh, session. And so thank you very much for now. Thank you so much, Dr. Nitya, for your presentation. I think one of the things that came through in your slides, and again, we will hopefully be able to speak about during the Q&A, is the heterogeneity that we see across different populations, whether it's women, transgender women, men, depending on where you are in the world, risk is risk varies, whether you're in sub-Saharan Africa or Southeast Asia. And so hopefully we'll have a chance to talk more about that and potential solutions to close those gaps during the Q&A. And now we have our third and final speaker. I'm very pleased to welcome Ms. Nurul Isa Anwar to give a presentation related to human papillomavirus. Thank, Thank you so, so much, much uh, Dr. Nath and, and the esteemed panelists. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace for everyone and, and also a uh, very, very good, good morning. morning. I, I am I supposed to share my slides now? now? Yeah. Yes, please. Okay, let's, let's see. I had, I had it, it earlier. earlier. Okay, well, well I, I do that. that. Let me just start, start since time is of the essence. essence. Um, I think, I think we're, we're meeting, meeting right now at such, such an opportune, opportune time, time, not, not just, just um, back, back in 20, from the 2nd, 28th January, January, we had a cervical cancer, cancer awareness campaign, campaign. And, and now, now of course, uh, we began the our main um, hosts and sponsors, the 20th anniversary. I cannot stress how important, important it is, not just um, from, from NIH, NIH Ministry of Health, Health but, but also a Malaysian campaigner. And I feel, I feel like very humbled, humbled because, because as, as I, I try to share my slides, I feel, I feel very humbled to actually see on this subject matter. And I hope that it can be seen as some of the experiences we've had to help shine, shine light, light for others. For others. So, so I think, think when, when we talk, talk about HDV, one, one of the key things we look, look at, whether it's from, from the NDI experience with hepatitis C, the NDI has been so instrumental in Malaysia um, in helping drive down the cost of hep C treatment. But that model, one of my laptop devices, how do we do that? No, I'm sorry, we lost you there. So, so I, I don't understand you would want my devices. devices. There's, There's no devices, devices right, right now. now. How about, How about now? now? Can you hear me clearly? That sounded better to me. Okay. okay. Let, Let me just work on sharing, sharing my slides. slides. If not, we'll, we'll miss it completely. completely. So, so I, I hope, hope Dr. Nett will forgive me, but for whatever reason, I can share my slides, perhaps because it's only allowed for my medical practitioners. Okay, okay um, I think right now, what, what I want to focus on is the fact that cervical cancer is a disease of global inequity. So it's very, very crucial because it showcases this huge disparity between um, healthcare access, awareness, screening practices, or other factors, whether it's awards, innovation, um, all these policies that are enacted will impact. And for countries to combat such health disparities, there's a growing call. And I think this is inspired by the NDI 
to actually um, look for uh, not, not just um, a South-South collaboration with countries facing similar challenges. HPV is a disease with a preventable solution through vaccines because the, the cause of this vaccine then, then become a barrier to widespread adoption. So unlike dengue, you know, you already have a workable vaccine. So to address this, I think I wanted to quote an economist from South Korea, Hyun Lee, because he premised in the art of economic catch-up, regulations, especially those that benchmark the global north, should not end up burdening the growth of innovative and affordable therapeutics for developing nations. So for HPV, there are two sets of data points that I want to share. First, women living in low and middle income countries are disproportionately affected with 80% and 90% of cases. 80% of cases involved in low and middle income countries and 90% deaths due to seminal cancer and occurring in such nations. Such nations. And, the and the second set, set is the data from Malaysia. Malaysia. We, we have about 16.8 million women, and current estimates indicate each year around 1,740 women are diagnosed, and 991 die from, from disease. So I think it's important to also know HGV is a common virus globally. But the issue, and 89% of women and men will definitely, um, you know, be cleared by their own immune system. However, around 10% of cases with persistent HGV infection can lead to constant inflammation and that of course leads to cancer. Now, the high risk HGV types um, are responsible for anal genital, cutaneous warts, and several other cancers, including cervical, anal, vulva, vaginal, penile, and oropharyngeal cancer. So I, I remember just now the media presented on HIV patients. Now those and women living with HIV are six times more likely to develop cervical cancer compared to women without. So now moving forward, right? Rather, rather than the agenda, agenda to kind of mix all of this um, uh, elements together, we need, need to empower LMICs, low and medium income nations. So, so they, they have the ability to adopt, adopt comprehensive cervical cancer prevention program as the overall public health strategy, including engagement on the ground. ground. Now, now I, want I want to share for Malaysia, we, we are, are looking at the WHO Cervical Cancer Elimination Initiative Roadmap. Map. You have, have the 90, 70, 90 targets. targets. So Dr. Andrew, Dr. Andrew, 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 you have more well-known this. We have vaccination, 90% fully vaccinated with the HPV vaccine, vaccine by the age of 15. 70% screen using high-performance high tests by the age of 35. And again, by 45. And, and three, the third, treatment. 90% of women with pre-cancer treated and 90% of women with invasive cancer managed. So for Malaysia, University of Malaya data tracks. Alhamdulillah, like, like Malaysia has in the past 10 years completed this vaccination program. So, so we have 90% reduction in vaccine targeted HGV between 16 and 18. And everyone knows what happened? The pandemic hit. So when the pandemic hit, schools were closed. Of course, it has an impact because you're talking about the need for cash up vaccination. So, this implementation of the HGV vaccination program it varies across countries. And most of the countries that recommend HGV for at least one cohort or adolescent or pre adolescent girls starting from nine years of age, this is the one we're trying to encourage. So, I look at Australia, and since we're looking at many countries in comparison, it is on track to eliminate cervical cancer by 2035. And that's why it will be the first country. God, God willing, in, in the world to eliminate the disease if its 2025 target is achieved. So you need a whole lot of political will and an agreement in, in, in basically in investing in something that clearly has and will bear results. So in 2013, Australia was the first to also include voice. And I think globally, only by 2019, 4% of boys have received the full cost of the vaccine compared to 15% of girls. 
So, so by, by the time, time 2023, um, um, the, the current, current minister, minister who was then, then a, a member of parliament, parliament and the head of the, of the parliamentary select, select committee on, on health chairman, Dr. Zoll, um, um, he reported and he alerted um, everyone about uh, uh, HDB. HDB. And, and there, there was contribution from pharma to give about 300,000 doses of HGB vaccines worth 90 million ringgit to be disseminated throughout the constituency. What does this matter? Again, it's about stakeholder engagement. So you have select committees, you know, could be from the same party, could be different, but bipartisan agreement with the government that this is a priority. And um, so other than that, of course, we have considered it is cost prohibitive. Is, is it a factor that blocks the ability of the government to dispense, right, uh, with the vaccinations? Perhaps, Perhaps Malaysia uh, is in a better position, position but you have to look at it across the spectrum of countries in need to eliminate cervical cancer. cancer. Now, now, screening. So, so just, just to touch on the screening, Dr. Ted, um, we had the former Deputy Prime, Prime Minister to support the screening program by an entity called, called the Rose Program. program. Um, it's, it's under University of Malaya, Malaya the, you know, the set up a foundation. But, but this, this is where we have, have to see each of these ongoing programs synergized as, as part of the great Malaysian or the, the great national uh, strategy. Because it doesn't, it doesn't really matter uh, whether, whether the name grows or not. not. The name is really, really something that, that we need uh, work and that we want to promote people. people. So, so I, I think, think um, when you talk about uh, program Rose, uh, one, one of the examples I want to share before I, I close is, is we, we actually went, went down to the, the various markets. And we, we asked the husbands, have your, you know, has your wife got, got, gotten the screen for cervical cancer, cancer, right? right? Whether, whether the pap smear, whether the HDB DNA. DNA. And of, and of course, HDB DNA is fast period to test the mechanism. But, but you, you can fight the taboo. You, you get, get men who are aware, you know, has my wife been, been screened? And whether, whether my son and my, my daughter has, has been vaccinated. And, and for a country with, with a predominantly Muslim, um, Muslims in, in it, you certainly have to make sure you normalize the need for everyone to plan in uh, to, to together. So, so I, I think, think that's, that's important. And, and I want to stress here that it, it costs about 1,000 ringgit, yeah. uh, Malaysian ringgit, ringgit actually, per person. That's the calculation that we've made. To make, make sure, sure that um, we can, can eliminate it in Malaysia. Malaysia. So, so for, for us, us, this kind of investment, investment is very, very crucial. And, and there's, there's much more that needs to be done to ensure that every child, child not just in Malaysia, Malaysia but the whole Southeast South Asia, Asia, Africa, Africa has, has access to HDB vaccination, vaccination affordable, affordable, and, and that all women have access to higher precision HDB DIA testing. Now, now I, I want to say as a final note on DIA, this is a anniversary. Um, it's, it's important, important to consider the HDB as a topic of research. research. I, think I think we, we, we want, want to make sure that, that uh, you know, whether it's the disease itself or uh, to implement part of this campaign, uh, campaign uh, to eliminate. Um, and, and, and I think in, in terms, terms of research, research angles, angles, I, 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 I looked at uh, Jean-Michel Jean earlier, that, that it, it has, has to be credible and placed in, in the gender-based budgeting of government budgets every year. year. It's, it's very, very difficult. difficult. You, you actually need everybody in cabinet, cabinet and in society, society to understand. Okay, it's, it's great, great to have, have this wonderful research. research. But at the end of the day, how do you put the money, you know, where it matters, where it matters most. most? Because, because no, no money, money, you can't, can't talk. It's, it's going to be a great research and great product. product. But, but it's, it's not going to be um, having, having a lot of impact on the ground. ground. So, so I, I just um, appeal and I, I thank everybody. But I feel that we must focus on the, on the research, research angles related really to gender-specific gender aspect of the disease. But we, we also must ensure that, that we band together, together mandated by, by professionals through DNDI and, and its mandate, policy makers, government reps, academics, medical experts, patient advocates, civil society organizations, and, and responsible industry and pharma to ensure, ensure that, that no women, no child, even in, 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 in a wartime and genocide and invasions, are left behind. behind. So, so we... Here, yeah, with this opportunity, should get, get the ball rolling. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you so much, Nurul Isa, and especially because you were able to make it through all the technical challenges with the slides and still deliver a very passionate and clear message 
with regards to the burden of HPV and as well intersectionality with HIV and other conditions. And so now we have until 20 past the hour for a question and answer session. And I have some questions for all of our speakers, but we are beginning to get questions in the room. So for those of you who have questions, please make sure that the DNBI staff are aware so that they can share them with us and then we will convey them to the speaker. So we'll start first with Dr. Nalika. So as I mentioned, Dr. Nalika, I, I think that those people who are perhaps not as familiar with dengue were maybe a bit shocked to see that having dengue hemorrhagic fever during pregnancy was associated with a 450 times increased risk of mortality. There are very few things in this world that increase your risk of death to that extent. And it was so disappointing to hear that the study that you were doing to try to find a treatment or a way to prevent this uh, was stopped because of funding. And so dengue has been with us for so, so, so long. And yet, as you noted, there are very few collaborative research networks. You mentioned the difficulty with funding. This truly reflects the Drug for Neglected Diseases initiative title. This is a very much a neglected disease. Can you talk more about why do you think that is? Why are there such major gaps despite the heavy burden of disease that the world faces with dengue? Yes, so uh, most importantly, uh, thank you for those questions. So dengue, uh, 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 when it started in Southeast Asia, it predominantly affected uh, children. And also in Latin America, it predominantly affected children. And so then dengue in pregnancy was not a, a issue because pregnant women were, were not affected in that way. And also her vaginal bleeding in, in healthy, normal, non-pregnant women was also not that much seen because it was young age groups that were affected. But with shift of age and more and more people getting dengue in the reproductive age groups. So for instance, in Sri Lanka last year, 75% of the cases were in the reproductive age group. So that's when, you know, things start getting really serious, uh, affecting women of reproductive age. Uh, so the data of uh, how dengue affects pregnancy and pregnant women. Uh, so we don't have a lot of data because I think still a lot of people are thinking, OK, yes, it's children. Yes, it's children. There's no question about it. But uh, so women, uh, when it comes to pregnancy and women, how it affects them, there's very limited data. So the study I quoted was a large study done in Brazil, which showed uh, if you get dengue hemorrhagic fever in pregnancy, your inc uh, 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 chances of death increases 450 times, which sounds ridiculous. And uh, and also uh, studies from India showing the organ dysfunction, higher mortality rate and all that. So it's, it's universal. But we need networks and DNDI uh, has uh, established this dengue alliance. Uh, Ministry of Health Malaysia is a part of it, which we are very proud to be uh, uh, in the Dengue Alliance together, along with uh, Mahidol University, Sivraj. Uh, then we've got THSTI uh, from India. We have got two institutes, Fio Cruz and UFT from Brazil. So it's an a, a endemic country-led alliance. And the aim is to find a treatment for things that uh, that affect us. So dengue has been very much neglected because it has not been affecting high income countries. But I think the most important thing that uh, COVID showed us that we, we are able to find solutions ourselves because when everybody had to fend for themselves during COVID time, uh, the global south, uh, India, Malaysia, Brazil, all countries did come up with solutions, diagnostics, uh, treatments, uh, vaccines for our own population. So we are able to leave this. And through this alliance, I, uh, we are already working on trying to uh, uh, get treatment. And of course, uh, the treatment has to be safe because if the treatment cannot be given to pregnant women, I think, you know, uh, that type, if, if it excludes uh, pregnant women, uh, then I think, you know, that sort of treatment, that then you're completely excluding the, the, the people who are most likely to, uh, you know, get see the disease and, and die of it. So, so those are important issues. And also the trial that we started in Sri Lanka to address uh, pervaginal bleeding, which was very much affecting girls and, and younger women. Uh, unfortunately, that was, you know, had to be terminated because of funding. But through these large global partnerships, alliances, hopefully we, we can find a treatment for all these neglected issues. So when it comes to women, it's a neglected among the neglected, I would say. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Nalika. And, and we have an update. We actually have until 50 past the hour. And so in fact, we have a number of questions coming in. So we have a lot of time for discussion. So maybe one follow-up for, for Dr. Nalika. Uh, uh, there are many treatments that are contraindicated in pregnancy. And in fact, one of our challenges is that pregnant women are often excluded from clinical trials of vaccines or medications because of the concern of, of, of teratogenicity or risk to the developing baby. Will DNDI future studies including? That's a, that's a very, very important statement and a question. So uh, uh, in, the, in our Dengue Alliance, which DNDI is a partner along with Ministry of Health Malaysia and, and all the partners I mentioned, the initial aim to is to look at repurposed drugs uh, for treatment for dengue. So the important of using repurposing drugs, repurposed drugs is repurposing drugs. We already know their safety profile and we know whether they have been used in pregnancy, the safety in pregnancy, and, and uh, also we will be able to uh, do the trial soon because we already know the safety. So that is the initial aim, trying to use repurposed drugs for treatment of dengue. And in such cases, just yes, definitely, uh, there's no question that pregnant women would be included. Uh, but at the same time, I think we're also engaging in, with uh, uh, industry partners who are in, uh, currently doing uh, or just about to do phase two trials to see if we can also explore new chemical entities because we have to find many drugs as possible for dengue because we don't know which one will work. In such instances, after the phase two trials and we know that certain things are safe, I think it is very, very crucial that we include pregnant women. But at the same time, as I mentioned, we need more data of what exactly does a dengue in pregnancy do to the woman, but we have very limited data about what it does to the baby. We know it causes miscarriages, fetal distress, intrauterine death, but we lack data. Indeed, thank you so much. We'll go ahead and give you a break and move on to Dr. Nithya. And, and Dr. Nithya, Based on UNAIDS data, more than 95% of new infections that occur in our region in the Asia Pacific are occurring in people who identify in key populations and their partners. This is in such a difference from Sub-Saharan Africa, which is very dominated by HIV infections in adolescent girls and young women. Consequently, within our region, outside of perhaps only small areas uh, cisgender women are often left behind in the responses that are emerging other than, as you mentioned, when they are pregnant. And so how do we help to address this lack of awareness and lack of focus on cisgender women's needs with regards to HIV? And in particular, as Neural Isa mentioned, cervical cancer being the number one risk for cancer and uh, AIDS-defining illness among cisgender women. Um, that's a tough question, Annette, because I, I think um, all of us uh, realized um, very clearly um, why we are now like um, being stuck in the key populations um, um, way of working in HIV. Um, and it is because like um, we, we, we over the past uh, 15 years have been trying to, to get attention to the explosive epidemics of HIV among key populations at that time and to draw in um, um, interest, funding interest, and also like um, research interest in, into those populations. But now we are doing... Um, quite okay in some countries, not still not very okay in many countries. Uh, but we are also uh, realizing by ourselves that by just focusing on certain populations, we will always leave um, some populations behind, right? Um, so um, for example, in Thailand, we can see that, um, yes, the uh, HIV prevalence and incidence among men who have sex with men, transgender women, sex workers have been stabilizing or even uh, decreasing with um, research and uh, funding um, focuses on uh, to these populations over the past decade. But we are seeing increasing um, prevalence and incidence of um, STI, especially syphilis among um, young women and pregnant women and also uh, congenital syphilis in our country, which has already been awarded um, the elimination of um, um, the three diseases in pregnant women 
um, since 2016. Um, so, so, so this is like the, the, the real example of, of how, uh, you will, you will face like the recurring epidemics in certain populations and, and controlling, uh, in some uh, populations if we are not, um, thinking outside of the, population boxes. Um, so for me, I, I feel that um, it is time now that um, we uh, have, like, we have learned, we have experiences, we have infrastructure um, being uh, laid out um, to address um, people-centered uh, ways of doing research and, and, and designing service delivery uh, that we should not, like, just uh, keep ourselves in our own comfort zones that we are very good at um, um, designing research and um, um, design service delivery for I mean, have sex with men and transgender women that we should not do the same thing for women or we could not do the same thing for women. We may have to learn, uh, relearn again um, how you can do a uh, women-led or women-focused um, research and service delivery. And that that is uh, uh, something that we need to invest um, among us who are uh, researchers um, or who are implementers of the program. Um, and yes, uh, when you talk about um, you equals you. I mean, this is like beyond research, beyond service delivery, but just just how you apply the concept uh, to um, the populations outside of the the populations that that you are comfortable with. Um, you you feel it uh, very frustrating, uh, not knowing how um, you can talk. Um, you equals you uh, to. Um, women living with HIV or women um, living with HIV uh, or, or, or women um, affected by HIV uh, to, to, to make sure that they also benefit uh, from the, the um, stigma and discrimination, uh, which could be addressed, um, external stigma discrimination, internal uh, stigma discrimination that can be addressed um, very um, um, efficiently by you equals you messages. And, and, and that's uh, when um, here in Thailand, we are like, gradually um, re-engaging uh, communities uh, of women and women living with HIV into the U equals U discussion and to see if we can like revitalize our um, PMTCT programs, um, integrating um, U equals U message into uh, that as well. Um, and, and, and that certainly will lead to uh, what uh, new rules uh, uh, mentioning about um, uh, the integration of um, sexual and reproductive health, uh, including um, um, cervical cancer um, screening and management uh, among um, women living with HIV as well, because that has been like um, just like the in the, in the plateau stage of um, implementing that's a service implementation that, that we can do much, much more better. Mm. And, and can you please clarify for those people in the audience who may not be familiar with what U equals U is and why is it that uh, this is an issue for women, given you had mentioned the lack of data in this population relative to among MSM? Mm. So um, U equals U or undetectable um, equals untransmittable um, is like the the wording, the campaign that is used to back up, um, or to translate the science of knowing that, um, any, uh, individual living with HIV who, uh, is diagnosed and treated, uh, with, um, antiretroviral treatment and, uh, to the level of the, uh, of having undetectable viral load cannot transmit HIV sexually to their partners. And it's uh, so, so we can say zero risk of sexual transmission of HIV from an individual living with HIV on ART with suppressed viral load um, to their sexual partners. Um, however, um, this uh, message uh, has come uh, from um, um, three to four uh, major studies um, in um, heterosexual uh, men and women um, and um, gay and bisexual uh, men who have sex with men. Right um, to to prove that um, the uh, risk of um, sexual transmission uh, is zero. However, we have uh, such a limited data on uh, whether or not uh, once an uh, individual living with HIV uh, or women living with HIV with a suppressed viral load uh, will also have zero transmission uh, to uh, their baby if they are pregnant women or to their uh, breastfeeding uh, infants if they are uh, breastfeeding their infants. Um, 
um, limited um, data right now suggested that you may equals you uh, if you uh, have undetectable viral load um, at the time of um, delivery or at the time of breastfeeding. But it will also depends on how soon uh, you have become uh, undetectable prior to getting pregnancy. Uh, uh, getting pregnant as well. Uh, if you uh, uh, can take and access um, antiretroviral treatment and achieve undetectable viral load prior to pregnancy, throughout pregnancy and throughout the breastfeeding period, you will equals you uh, for these women as well. But how we can translate this information uh, into um, um, choices offered to women living with HIV when they uh, uh, plan for their pregnancy or, or when they plan their breastfeeding uh, is another other story. Um, same thing, um, because uh, we learned that we cannot even translate this simple message of you equals you for sexual transmission uh, to uh, people living with HIV or, or people affected by HIV um, easily in our society. And this mainly is because pervasive um, stigma around uh, sex, around sexual pleasure, around uh, living with HIV. Thank you so much. And we'll come back to you again, but now I'd like to ask a, a question for Nurul Iza uh, from our audience. Cervical cancer is the third most common cancer among women in Malaysia. Are there enough resources being invested in research and development to find affordable, sustainable, and equitable solutions? for cervical cancer. And maybe I can ask you to also comment on what you're learning in Malaysia and potentially how that might impact other countries in the region. Uh, thanks, uh, I think it's a very crucial question because, because um, there's, there's not been many, many models, models that has worked in the past. Um, and then I have no, no idea what's from my advice, so please, I apologize for that echo. Uh, basically, you look, look at the DNBI collaboration, collaboration with, with Ministry of Health, and it was really crucial because we were spending so much on trying to secure drugs for hep C. So right now, the basic calculation uh, is a HPV vaccination, together with two high precision tests for cervical cancer prevention, it's about, about US dollars 214. Uh, and, 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 uh, you know, I, I pray that, that it doesn't, you know, our currency doesn't, doesn't you know, reduce further. further. But, but the, the point, point is, um, it is, it is considered high, that, right? Because, because you're stacking, stacking up. up. Of course, it's important, uh, to address HDG. We're campaigning, we're stating that it's one of the cancers that can be eliminated. But, from the government, from the, you know, the kind of, the executive perspective, the, the budget, budget pool is only this, this much. And you look at the other sort of treatments, uh, breast cancer patients, and other sort of researches that also be quiet. And, and that's, that's why I go back, back to the model that was really headed by the idea, idea. Uh, uh, whether it, it, there's a term called um, uh, basically in terms, in terms of the licensing matters related to the Ministry of Health, where you know, you know, for, for the, the purpose, purpose or the benefit of the, the community, the government can step in and, and find out the alternatives um, in generic versions. versions. And of course, it can, it can be, be very controversial, controversial, but I think it shouldn't be. Because, because in a time where we could not dispense it with and we could, could not deploy, uh, you know, COVID, COVID vaccine, vaccine in time for the, the poorer communities vis-a-vis -vis versus, versus countries who can afford to, to, to buy them. And, and we also know the limitations of course, uh, uh, in terms of expanding the extra option, extra option. Extra extra option. So, so for me, we have, have to go back, back and look at, at, to look at the, the model, model whereby, whereby we exercise all the options at disposal. We are thankful because um, that the current 90 million ringgit that was given by, um, by, 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 of course, uh, Pharma, and I want to mention the whole kind of framework of support here. here. Not, not that we're not thankful, thankful but I think it's important. Uh, but, but, you know, by, by the same token, to reduce the cost further, further we're also asking, right, the different, different types of uh, different stakeholders are uh, trying to seek options, options so that, that it can, can be something that is um, a no-brainer, um, something that the government can definitely um, implement and utilize. So, one, we don't, don't want to be tied to only uh, certain products uh, but, but also, um, making sure, sure in, in such a development, this will also include, this will also include 
not, not just drop baby purposing. purposing. And, and I, I think, think Lilika, you're absolutely, absolutely right, right because I think this particular field is not being heavily invested, invested in. It. You, you, you can, can ask uh, many, many, many quarters. It's very, very difficult interest vis-a-vis -vis drug repurposing. But similarly, in terms of producing um, uh, types of, of medication that, that provides for more options um, and reducing costs, that's also a challenge. Now, now if, if anything, the, uh, the last bit I would like to add is basically um, we, we have, have yet, yet, yet to see the government implement a policy whether they will or will not vaccinate male adolescents. So, so this is as of, of, of 2023. Um, so, so I think, I think it's important, important because, you know, you, you want to kind of carry um, a more holistic um, elimination strategy. So you also need to put voice in, in, in this regard. Thank you. And, and actually, if I could follow up with you on that, you started to answer another question that's been raised about vaccination for HPV and the concern about the interruption of COVID. There are so many things that have been affected by COVID, by uh, whether it's tuberculosis, HIV diagnoses, follow-up treatment, hepatitis, and uh, certainly vaccination programs. And sadly, some of the concerns about COVID vaccine have fed into misinformation about vaccinations, vaccine hesitancy. Uh, we've seen this in the Philippines for dengue vaccine, which I'll ask you about, Dr. Nalika, after finishing with, with Neural Isa. But can you share about the situation in Malaysia? How do you think the country is catching up with vaccination for HPV and sort of the future planning for at least the core program that was present and starting to scale up before COVID? You know, you know uh, Dr. Annette, you're, you're, you're absolutely on point. point. I think, I think uh, it's, it's not, it wasn't, wasn't easy. I remember, you know, all, all of us, us uh, at the time, time I was still member of parliament, we actually had to show our arms, uh, you, know, you know, getting, getting that, that, that COVID, COVID uh, shot. Because, because, you know, you know there's, there's so, so much, much fear, fear, right? And then, of course, we all understand uh, mRNA, the whole science behind it, and then you know, getting going, going uh, can never end to that whole discussion. But it has really impacted on how people view vaccines, vaccines. In, in, in a country, country where, where we had, had full deployment. deployment. You, know, you know, people, for example, for um, BCG, etc. And, you know, it's, it's not directly related, related but, but I, I mean, mean, my um, my, my third uh, boy, I mean, he, he had, had measles. measles. You know, know Malaysia, Malaysia actually did, did not see any, any cases of measles, measles but, but because, because there was some course of food, either the skip purposely or uh, because the schools were closed, you have, have a new, uh, of course, uh, epidemic. So, I think not, not an epidemic, epidemic in Malaysia. Malaysia, Malaysia of Health, relax, I'm just sharing. It's under control, it's under control. I'm just saying, thank God, God my, my son um, was partially, um, you, know, you know, vaccinated. So, I think that's, that's why we talk about HDV. Um, I, I, I give, uh, uh, you know, full credit to the current minister and the previous because they, they were open, open to the offer made by MSD, Israeli well, Pharma, um, there's an AIA, AIA public, public health and insurance, insurance company, company together, the Rotary Foundation, and the Muamalat Bank, Bank uh, Malaysia. But the, the point is, at least to continue that, that this vaccine has been deployed by the respective members of parliament across, across the country. country. Uh, but, but of course, course the second, second bit is you know, in, in ensuring, ensuring that, that uh, vaccination should take place. place other than the hesitancy, is, is the cost. Because the remaining um, vaccination that the government has to bear the cost, right? right? So, so that's, that's why R&D will have to be included in, this, in a sense. Um, we need to find ways how to make it more accessible. Uh, not, not just for Malaysia. I look at Laos, I look at Cambodia. I mean, I mean we, we can't, can't keep thinking, thinking we're okay if our country, country, country is okay. okay. I think and we, we have, have to look at it from a perspective of the region, uh, the, the fact, fact that, that so many, many people in Sub-Saharan Africa, Africa were, were denied the vaccine, and, and that's why, why other than, than fighting this hesitancy, I think, think it would do a lot better if you can, can showcase that, that profit is, is not driving this, this, this kind of um, effort, right? right? So, so the, the message of government, government, ministries, the, the, the message you showcase up front, you, you need to preserve and protect your credibility. Because that goes a long way, that you're really concerned about not, not really helping the, the, the downline or the, 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 the,
the, the, the profit margins, margins of, you know, um, how do I say, uh, struggling uh, pharmaceuticals, but actually it is really about the communities, about the communities in order to, to secure that vaccination for protect them. Thank you so much. I think that emphasis on how local public health is really regional and global public health and national security. And there's an intersection there that sometimes we forget about. And the need for, for us to recognize that borders are porous. People travel a lot these days. And so for that reason, if there's a measles outbreak in one area of our region, it won't take very long before that virus can get to another part of the world. And so I think it's important for us to be in support of standard public health interventions that we know work. And so maybe a follow up on the vaccine question for Dr. Nalika. What are your thoughts on the dengue vaccine and its impact on dengue, especially for women? So that's a good question. And I think you brought up the issue that happened in the Philippines as well. So I think that's a good, important uh, lesson for us to learn. Uh, especially in the context of uh, post-COVID uh, vaccine hesitancy, you know, the anti-vaccine campaigns being very strong and, and measles outbreaks, which are happening everywhere in the world. I think not, not just in Malaysia, we have measles outbreaks everywhere, either people, because people didn't take their vaccines or schools were closed, many reasons. So what happened in Philippines was, uh, I believe, uh, giving the vaccine to all kids, uh, irrespective of their zero status, when there was actually evidence to show uh, that children with some signals that were, were already there showing that kids who never had dengue, never were infected with dengue, were more likely to develop severe disease when they were vaccinated. In other words, that the vaccine didn't work as well as in people, uh, kids who haven't had dengue, who actually make, may cause severe disease. So that signal was already there when uh, Philippines introduced this vaccine. And we know that it ended up uh, in, in a sort of a uh, vaccine hesitancy and uh, subsequently measles outbreaks and all that as well. So I, I think uh, there are many other vaccines now. We have the Takeda vaccine coming up. We have, uh, in, uh, which has been registered in some countries. We have the NIH vaccine, uh, uh, which, which is uh, tested by Bhutan and uh, uh, other places also uh, putting out their two-year data. So I think uh, the important thing is uh, in, in the Takeda vaccine, because the, the NIH vaccine is only two-year data, uh, it shows that, again, the Takeda vaccine, that uh, it is not as effective in zero-negative people as it is in zero-positive people. So you have to be mindful of these things because, you know, you, you definitely want, want to, uh, you know, give back vaccinate people and prevent dengue, especially pregnant women. Because uh, we know that I uh, we, we just I just told you the data, share the data about how uh, you know dengue disproportionately may exhibit uh, dengue worse in, in pregnant women. So definitely, you would want to give vaccinate women before they get dengue. But be mindful that uh, these vaccine campaigns, uh, the the vaccines, don't seem to be as effective in people who've not had dengue. And, and and we need more data whether it actually causes more severe disease or uh, for some serotypes, for instance, it's not effective. So uh, you have to be mindful for, of these things because the golden rule of immunization is, is you know, you have to, you're giving it to healthy individuals, so it has to benefit them. Uh, and uh, so we need more data, but definitely pregnant women who have been previously exposed to dengue, they would definitely benefit from getting a dengue vaccine before they get pregnant. Thank you so much, Dr. Nalika. And maybe we'll we'll now kind of shift a little bit in our discussion in through a question for Dr. Nithya. How important is the gender inclusive healthcare approach that you shared about to prevent biases in seeking health care? And maybe a corollary to that question is, how important is community engagement and advocacy in helping to achieve gender-inclusive health care? Yeah, actually, I, I, I have uh, one related question to, to what uh, uh, Nuru and, and, and Dr. Nelika uh, just, just uh, addressed, um, and, and that's um, how the... Um, how the efforts um, trying to scale up um, vaccination um, for HPV or for um, 
um, dengue uh, has involved communities um, affected by by HPV or or dengue uh, before? Because I I think um, I I was just asked the, a very similar question of uh, whether or not we can actually end HIV if we have HIV vaccine, uh, and and we are still I, I I believe we are still far away from having an effective HIV vaccine. But learning from um, the challenges in in, in vaccination programs for um, all other um, pandemics and, and public health conditions, uh, what should we uh, prepare better? I mean, in terms of preparing communities or engaging communities uh, in preparation uh, for um, any future uh, preventive um, measures, including vaccinations. Um, I, I, I probably <laughs> may want to learn more uh, from both of you as well, if, 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 if I may, and before I um, go to, to address uh, your question. Yes, certainly. And I think that that really gets already at this issue of community engagement. And Nural Itha, you had already mentioned that in your com- in your uh, presentation. Could you share more about how that directly impacted vaccination? And then we'll ask Dr. Nalik of the same thing. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I just, just want, want to share first uh, uh, about uh, the tenet and the yeah. yeah, there, there is, is a, a paper, paper because we have our post here at NIH um, on, on an, an, an analyzing the budget, budget impact of two treatment, treatment approaches, approaches for, for, for Hep C. C. In Malaysia, Malaysia to, to the, the use of voluntary and compulsory licensing options. And, and I'll, I'll share, share, I'll share the link afterwards. afterwards. But, but I think, um, you know, know one, of course, in terms of the cost. So, so in, in a way, way the job of, of the government or the caretaker is manifold. It's is multidimensional, as are the needs of the patients receiving help, right? right? So, so you, you have, have to consider cost options. options. It's, it's always, always a zero sum game. game. I always, I always say, say it is um, because you'll be taking from, from another particular program. program. So, so you have, have to really make a, a, a set, set of priorities of what, what kind of investments you want to make. Mm. We, we argue, of course, HDB is very crucial. crucial. But, but by, by the same token, token every, every life is, 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 of course, uh, you know, crucial and, and, and deserves saving. saving. That's, That's one. one. But, but on, on the other front, the actual campaign. And, and I think, think uh, from a Malaysia's perspective, perspective, it had, had to be a whole of society, you know, know all the members of parliament, parliament regardless of their parties, parties you know, just had to like either get vaccinated publicly. Um, I actually had a special day we organized, especially for people with disabilities, where we bring them from their homes uh, to the, you know, chosen placement to get vaccinated, then we'll drive them back, you know, to their homes. And it required volunteers. Uh, from, from the, the different, different offices uh, of the one member, member of parliament, state family person. But, but it just gives a sense that, that, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a whole, you know, kind of um, collaborative approach. And, and you, you need to also look at different, different people, people and different, different people with different, different sets, sets of needs. Um, um, you, you, you can't, can't assume everyone, everyone can just go and buy and then be vaccinated, right? So I think that was so... You know, important, important because, because if you didn't, didn't you look at this the straw and this is assessment on how much, much work the Ministry of Health officials had to do because they actually went um, to the long houses in the hinterlands of Sabah and Sarawak, especially Sarawak, to, to, to go, go to the, uh, the, the villages and get them vaccinated. And, and I think their rate was uh, I think one, one of the highest in all the states, states in, in, in Malaysia. Malaysia. So, so I think, you know, um, it's, it's really important to go through the campaign, not just uh, in terms of showcasing your, you know, your sincerity, you have to be earnest in doing that, but also the media coverage of it, right? Because we had uh, media coverage, we had people from the religious leaders, from the different, um, you know, stakeholders, and you also take a look, okay, some societies more conservative, some societies more open, the point is we kind of call leaders of influence in that particular society who can then join in the effort. Um, you know, and we were very worried if we had one uh, Ustaz who were against vaccination. I mean, that was going to be very explosive. But I, I think managing it from, from, from the word go, and I have to say, uh, at the time, the Minister of Health, and of course, consequently, we had uh, prioritized vaccinations. We didn't have any naysayers. Uh, which, which is very important, important to always be led by, by evidence. I know, I know in, in this grouping, you guys have, have no problem, problem 
but, but we, we had, had a, a lot, lot of sound problems, problems because, um, you, know, you know, I think, I think at, at the time, there was some advocating for alternative medication. And I'm, I'm, I'm really supportive for supplements. But for me, when, when you talk, talk about vaccination, you just have to take it. So, so sometimes evidence-based uh, policy making, we, we can't, can't decide, decide on that. that. And, and I think, I think when, when uh, um, Dr. Nagia mentioned, mentioned about the Philippines experience, I think, I think we, we have to also to communicate what happened, how, you know, what, you know, what lessons, lessons we could learn, could learn and, and how, how can we ensure that it doesn't repeat itself. itself. So, so these, these are the things, things ready, ready answers to shared across, across nations, nations so that, that we can together work, work hard to allay the naysayers. Because they will do that. It's just a question of making sure their percentage is reduced, and, and we, we went over different groupings. So, so it's, it's a lot of hard work. work. Um, I, I think you also had to employ celebrities. I was the opposition then, but, you know, my, my point is, you know, know we, we completely uh, were in agreement. Uh, every former prime, prime minister uh, had, had to, you know, come, come and get vaccinated. Also publicly. So, so I think later, it, it is an ongoing campaign. campaign. It's like, like you, can't, can't, you can't you assume that five years, years ago, everyone was in love with vaccination that, People, people are the same. same. The, the, the pandemic, pandemic really hit people, people hard, hard, right? And, and they've, they've lost their, their loved ones. ones. They also saw, saw of course, some, some side effects. effects. Maybe it's a challenging times, but at the end of the day, it, it was, was the right thing that saved lives. Life. So, so that's, that's the, the kind of message you have to have over and over again. again. So, so with regards, regards to, um, of course, uh, what Nikia uh, asked further, I think um, campaigning and making sure what what you want to kind of get requires a lot of convincing of uh, a physical illness. So, so we, we try, try to do that. that. Sometimes, Sometimes people don't get it right. right. Some people get it wrong. But, but this active campaign, campaign with, with different um, parties that are involved is very important. And I'm not talking about parties, but the parties, I'm talking about parties on the ground, operationally. Like, like I feel that uh, a bit embarrassed. I only learned about the NDI in my third term. Like, like hello, you know, know that was like before this. this. So, so I felt like it's it's such a... It's such, such a valuable agenda, agenda that I, I wish I knew when I was 18, 18 something like that, that, you know? Because, because you, you just don't understand how, how many lives you'll touch. touch. You just you don't understand how impactful it will be. But you, you have, have to get it right. right. You have to convince um, governments and policy makers, please not, not just do that, but evidence, but, but be led by compassion. compassion. Unmute um, myself. Thank you so much for that. Dr. Nilika, do you want to also respond to Dr. Nithya's question? Yes, I, I, I think uh, one important thing was mentioned was evidence and community engagement. How do you uh, go ahead? And of course, the cost. Uh, so you so you have to be uh, like for COVID, there was no question. Uh, although you know COVID vaccines did have certain issues, uh, were rapidly developed. That was the best strategy uh, that we had. And we had to do such a lot of public engagement. Uh, but, but I think each vaccine uh, ha has different things. You know, like COVID, we were in a pandemic and, and that's what you're supposed to do. It affected everybody. When it comes to dengue, uh, 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 big cities are more affected. People in big cities are more affected than, say, rural areas. And we see that in Sri Lanka and, and when, like the incidence of dengue is very low in rural areas, in mountain areas. We just finished island-wide zero surveillance study, which shows that that dengue incidence transmission is very high. So uh, then the cost effectiveness of actually vaccinating people in hill countries where you, uh, in, the, in the hill uh, area of the countries where there is hardly any mosquitoes, no, no dengue, I mean, that would not be cost effective. So then you would have to have very targeted approach. So I think based on the type of vaccine you want to roll out, it has to be evidence based. It should uh, it should be cost effective, and uh, and and then you can do a really good public engagement, community engagement program because uh, that that would be the best for that community. So it has to be handled very carefully uh, and and suitable for that particular community. You can't have one you know one size that feels fits all sort of approach for uh, every vaccine and every community. Thank you. So it sounds like a couple things taking away from, from what you've shared and maybe Nitya can reflect as well is the importance of a whole of society approach and the recognition that one size does not fit all. We have to try to accommodate who our end users are and think about the context, the societies, the communities in which they live. Nitya, any other thoughts about that? 
Mm, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm uh, very happy and, and, and feel very honored to be part of the panel listening to uh, Nuru and, and, and Elika. Uh, and I, I, I think that, um, yes, I, I mean, because when you, you ask about community engagement and, and you only focus on gender, I, I, I think it's, it's beyond that. Uh, and we, we have to admit the intersectionality and use intersectionality lens um, <clears throat> to really uh, plan um, not only like at, at the implementation stage, but at the research uh, questions uh, development stage and, and all through the research uh, cycle, um, as I already mentioned in my presentation, because um, I, I feel that um, it would be really um, useful uh, for any product um, development uh, to really listen to uh, the communities of potential users uh, even prior to <clears throat> developing the product and 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 um, otherwise like we learned again and again uh, from um, HIV prevention products that you have a very a good uh, product uh, with high efficacy but no one will use them or no programs will be able to implement uh, them. But um, I, I, I don't think this is like the end of the world because we can really um, restart um, at the beginning of developing any products, um, asking communities uh, what they want, um, testing the idea with the community so that you can adapt the product or adapt the way that you see uh, the product implementation um, accordingly to what, what is really needed and what, what can actually be implemented in um, certain um, settings. Um, and I, I, I feel this is very important. And, and back to the question of um, how uh, we, we see the benefit of having um, the, the uh, gender uh, focus um, service delivery. I think, I think that's, that's, um, that's, 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 that should not be a question anymore because uh, once you have a, uh, once you listen to the community, um, for, for us, uh, it is because of the, um, pervasive stigma discrimination towards LGBT communities in Thailand that affect um, HIV service uptake that we um, started <clears throat> doing this like LGBT friendly clinics uh, where you um, work with the communities, let them design the service delivery and let them co-deliver services. Uh, and, and then we learned that that's very effective. We uh, double up or triple up uh, the uptake of HIV testing and PrEP uh, among LGBT communities in Thailand. But uh, what you can see right now is that these uh, community um, um, led uh, services um, do not only provide like gender friendly services um, to no rules um, point that uh, they are also um, using this intersectionality lens to provide um, services for LGBT with disability, LGBT who are migrant workers in Thailand, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so it, it's it's not like um, you can just use gender lens. You need to use intersectionality lens and admit what you don't know and invest in um, um, build capacity yourself to be able to um, address um, um, public health concerns with intersectionality lens. Yeah. Thank you so much and and i think one of our final questions is actually one that a few people have asked for multiple speakers and that has to do with funding and so i'm going to open it up to all three of you to to answer the question about challenges that people are facing in obtaining funding as female researchers as well as the difficulties in getting money to do research on priorities related to women and potentially for reasons that we've already discussed during this panel. And so thoughts that you might have about where the research and development funding should come from, can come from. Why are these, why is it so difficult to obtain the money? And, and in, in particular for the, the women researchers in our audience, what kind of encouragement could you provide? So any aspect of those questions, uh, maybe we can start with Dr. Nalika. Yes, so uh, as, as uh, mentioned in the beginning, uh, dengue is uh, considered a neglected disease globally, and that's because it's uh, uh, not in affected, uh, affecting high-income countries, but only LMICs and low-income countries. And uh, so the amount of fund in our countries, for instance, dengue is not a neglected disease, but a priority disease. 
because specifically, you know, everybody is trying to control dengue and reduce the incidence of dengue. But uh, when it comes to funding, uh, what I see is not just in Sri Lanka, but in many governments is uh, not realizing if you want to control something that is, you know, rapidly emerging, you need to have a different approach and funding for that. So if, if you take dengue, for instance, most of the, the money in the government goes into public health campaigns of cleaning your environment and vector control. But despite doing that over and over again for so many years, we still see that incidence increasing. So then the governments don't seem to realize that you have to take a different approach and invest on R&D for treatments, for diagnostics, for biomarkers. So it, it's the it's the difficulty in convincing policymakers. Okay, it is a it is a priority to disease in our countries, but then how do you change the way you think? So so this is uh, one of the big challenges. And specifically, when I spoke about, for instance, uh, issues related to pregnancy uh, and, and dengue, and also things like vaginal bleeding, which is a complication that just happens in women, uh, those type of things, I, I mean, come. Uh, get a real backseat, I would say. And uh, so governments don't think, okay, we really need to invest and, and find these things. So it's about the policymakers uh, don't seem to be convinced, uh, except the traditional thinking of, uh, seem to be, they find it difficult to come out of the traditional thinking. And uh, so, so so this would be the main issue, I, I would say, uh, when it comes to funding in Dengue. Thank you. Uh, Nurul Isa, would you like to go next? Sure, uh, it's a very important question. I'm just uh, basically want to share that if you look at the UNESCO data, uh, you have less than 30% of women, um, and the, the world's researchers, researchers yeah, are women. Are women. So, so, you know, as, as a, I, was I studied, um, you know, very humbly engineering, uh, so math and science was something completely like, you know, I, I, I would think um, my, my first, first choice. choice and, uh, you know, of course, course we want, want more, more importantly, you alluded, alluded to this. this. You alluded to this. Is, is the, the issue that you must not forget to include the, you know, the women's perspective in, in, in whether research, research and in making sure, sure that whatever strategies, strategies we employ, this is, you know, especially dengue. dengue. I'm a dengue, dengue survivor, survivor and, and I cannot imagine being pregnant, pregnant and, and getting dengue. dengue. Like, like, I, you know, know I can't, can't imagine, imagine the risk that I face, how my body reacted. Um, and and it's it, it just including um, that as a country, as, as uh, many nations, you know, face um, this tropical disease. So even during, during the pandemic, pandemic, when you talk, talk about, you know, uh, the, the monsoon season, season, you can actually cover up the different uh, increases of, of dengue, dengue cases. cases. So, so it's, it's really important to kind of prioritize, and this includes not just female researchers, also, also male researchers, researchers, first and, and foremost, to include it in the agenda. agenda. I think, I think so, so before you go, go to the, the, the funding, funding, it's about, you know, you, you have, have to understand, if you don't, don't have this perspective, perspective you, you will not be able to tackle such a huge chunk, chunk of population, especially those who are vulnerable, vulnerable and in need of support. support. One. So, so when, when we, when we did the multidimensional poverty index study, um, I, I had, had to, um, woo a female, female economist. economist. It, it took me about a year to woo her, but she agreed to conduct, and we had a COVID adjusted uh, poverty, poverty line, line because, because we did this survey, survey and we went, went to the households uh, of bottom 40% of the, of the community in 2021, in 2021 at the height of the, the COVID scare and, and COVID attacks. Yeah? And, and we realized that the majority of those uh, struggling with, with that privation are women. women. Women, especially women headed households, single mothers. mothers. So, so they're, they're far worse off. off and, and even the, the aid dispense um, in, in terms, terms of access to healthcare, healthcare they need more, far, far more, more right? So, so of course, this data, data I'm pretty, pretty sure, is going to be similar, similar if you look, look at, at the different, um, conduct different, different exercises across, across the, 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 the region. region. But, but it just, um, um, you know, for me, it's, it's about making sure that it's part of the agenda. agenda. Um, and, and then, of course, then, then you have to, again, place the funding. And, and that's, that's why, why credible research, um, I, I think, think it's also incumbent on us to kind of promote women who have done work in this particular field or any field. So, so sometimes, sometimes there's, there's that conscious um, effort. Uh, I know, you know it's easier just to, to, to use the term sisterhood, 
But, but, but really, it is, it is that, um, you know, know, I could have gotten, gotten other economists, but I wanted Fatima Mahkari. You know, she's, she's a Sarawakian, she did work on MPI, women, she did numbers on our retiree database. So for me, um, it's, it's really twofold. And I, I guess women in science and, 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 and you know, remarkable women such as yourself, I think, I think it's, it's also trying to figure out once we have an agenda, agenda because... Clearly, it is, it is not on the dengue agenda. agenda. Like, like, how, how can, can we miss this, this, this kind, kind of caution on, on the needs of pregnant women? women? You know? And then because of that, we were, you know, every single time there's dengue case, uh, uh, I think you don't have to know this, there'll be the same usual, okay, fine, fogging, but the adult mosquitoes, we're going to send money for other kind of cleanliness and other work. But we should actually be right looking, was there a pregnant woman, right, in the household? You know, how, what are the kind of, uh, action, action plans plan that's included in it. So, so the strategies need to change at the times and the times that, that we is in need, we need, you know, know need to include the gender uh, perspective. Thank you. And, and Nithya, any thoughts from you on these questions? Um, yes, I, I believe, um, there are two points, uh, here. No? Um, first is that we need to have a clear and strong research, research questions if we are going to advocate for more funding, uh, towards, um, <clears throat> uh, women's agenda. Um, and, um, um, this can only happen. I mean, we can only have a strong and clear research question if we work with the communities. And here for, for me, uh, who is working with, um, HIV, HCV and, and STIs, uh, I would say that we, we must work, uh, with women living with HIV, women, uh, who use substances, uh, women who access abortion services, for example, to, to really identify what are, uh, the research questions that we would like to get more funding um, towards um, um, research and implementation um, and and I think we must do this regardless of uh, which gender identity uh, we, we we have as a researchers uh, yes it's true that uh, we as a, a, a woman researcher may have more empathy on certain uh, health conditions but it does not mean that uh, if you are a transgender researchers if you are a male researcher you, 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 you should not um, do the same thing and the second point is um, the need, and I think it's, it's, uh, it's an obvious need, uh, for us to educate and sensitize our funders, um, especially in, in terms of HIV, uh, hepatitis C, to think beyond, uh, the, the usual suspects of key populations and, 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 and be, and, and feel more confident um, for, for them because even if they're funders, they need to find money from elsewhere, right? For, for them to be more confident in advocating for uh, funding uh, to, to, to come uh, to uh, uh, a more people-centered uh, way of um, uh, funding um, research rather than to just put um, um, the amount of money into boxes of populations. Thank you, Nitya. And Nurul Iza, would you like to... So sorry, because um, I have a best friend who's a doctor, so she's giving me some inputs which I would like to add. The first is the issue of global funding for South South collaborations. I think we have to have more of that. But, but uh, we also have the local government in South East Asia or ASEAN or ASEAN Plus that need to band together and demand for kind of match funding from high-income governments as they come to negotiate. I think we sometimes do so in silos. We don't, we don't really see ourselves, ourselves as, as a collective, collective whole. whole. And a and lot, a lot of, of the problems, problems that we face, for example, tropical, tropical diseases, diseases, sometimes cannot be based on research uh, overseas or in, in Western, Western nations, nations because it's something, something that we experience that researchers rightly know more in this particular region. region. And, and I think that kind of has to be a message that's related to work. And then you have entities such as Global Funders and Islamic Development Bank. Uh, I, I think they cover about 57 uh, countries, mostly in, in, in Africa as well. And they are live and um, live in the livelihoods fund, right? right? So, so please kind of share your information and available uh, funding, funding out there for researchers, for female researchers, researchers to kind of uh, be part in. So, so then, then we can eventually, as uh, Nithya um, mentioned earlier, the, the co-design of the research and grassroots uh, should be done in, in collaboration with Grassroots communities and, 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 and Sorry, thanks for giving me the additional time. No, I think that's an 
excellent way for us to close. And you really brought together these issues of gender specific health challenges. There is no doubt from the three presentations we heard today from the and highly interesting discussion for me and I'm hopefully for all of our audience why this is truly important, but that the solutions to address these gender specific health challenges need to be multi-sectoral, need to be intersectional. We have to have community, academia, nonprofit organizations like DNDI and government and policymakers, as well as funders, external and local funders, work together to create truly whole of society solutions. And we cannot continue to exist in separate silos. We saw a lot of similarities between the challenges being faced across these diseases, but not each disease has the same sort of ear of the public or media attention that it needs to have. And instead of continuing to work separately, hopefully we can find more ways to work together. So on behalf of the organizers, thanks so much to our speakers, our panelists, discussants, the amazing women that I, I just am so honored to have been able to be with you today during today's session. And so now we'll turn it over to our moderators for the rest of the session. Thank you so much. Thank you to our SM speakers for an enlightening discussion in session one. Your insights on gender-specific health challenges were invaluable, especially seeing how there is limited data when it comes to how diseases affect certain populations, particularly pregnant and breastfeeding mothers. So there is a need for researchers to, collabor to collaborate more to address this issue. So Roche, after this very mind-blowing session, I think we all deserve a well-earned break, don't we? Yeah, we certainly do. I think we all, we all learned quite a bit. So let's go for a little bit of a coffee break and then we can dive right back in. Yeah, we will now have a short break for coffee and tea when we'll reconvene back at 11 a.m. for session two. Thank you. Uh, coffee will be served at the ballroom. Yeah, thank you. Uh, 400 people suffering from hepatitis C. It is a major public health Hello, concern. Can you hear me? You're quiet to me. Let me see if I can. Hey, Tanya and Anjana, I hope that it all goes well. Thanks, Annette. I was like, difficult to follow, Hi. Annette. How do we oh, know those amazing speakers? That was, I, I don't remember, that was so... I know that the doctor who gave us a story, gave us a story, and then he said, this disease is very serious, it will be a disease, and then it will be a cancer, and then it will be a disease. 然后有一个小小愿望啦 Hepatitis C is basically it's a virus. Primarily, it will affect your liver. It's sometimes called um, the silent disease because people with the disease don't know they've had the infection. And it's only many years later that some of them develop um, cirrhosis, liver cirrhosis, or liver cancer. Then I asked him, 
，医生给我是和打针的啦，啊，要远吃跟打针的。The treatment in the past is so, well, I would say horrible to a certain extent and perhaps toxic because we were dealing with the treatment like interferon before and rebarbarin. And the treatment was also for a very long duration, and the cure rate was also very low. 没有吃了这个药啊，五个月，医生在 test 啦，抽血 test 了，说我对我这个身体没有效果啊，啊，他说我的 virus 还还有存在啦，在我体内，只是医生跟我讲说，就是等新的药进来罢了啦，外外国的新药进来马来西亚，然后就等等等一等就是等。等等等等，超过已经十年了。There is actually a revolution treatment in hepatitis C, the DAA. When the DAA came in, that was sometimes in 2015, I think, into Malaysia, um, and it's a major breakthrough. But the issue is the cost. It's very expensive, uh, and not many people can have access uh, to uh, the treatment. DNDI, or Drugs for Neglected Disease Initiatives, is a non-profit organization, and it works to get treatment for neglected population. When DNDI was studying the DAA landscape, they came across Rapidesvir. And we also found out that an Egyptian company, pharmaceutical company, uh, Farco, had done a clinical trial using Rapidesvir, and the results were very promising. Following this, um, DNDI, together with the Ministry of Health in Malaysia and the Ministry of Public Health in Thailand, conducted a clinical trial on the safety and efficacy of Rabidasvir. We had a 97% efficacy, which made it comparable to the other DAAs. And these are better tolerated by the patient, it has fewer side effects, and it had a better cure rate. The, a project of this magnitude and complexity requires a number of partners. So together uh, with agencies and other societies, we can make the impossible possible. For all of us who have been involved, we're extremely excited that now there is a treatment option, an affordable treatment option for people with this patient. Now we can tell the patient now, I have the treatment for you right now because you all have been waiting. We have also been waiting, but now we have the, the treatment for you. The almost 100% of those patients who have been treated on this clinical trial clear the virus. Well, the target of WHO is to end hepatitis C in 2030. The question is how to achieve the goal. Our part now is that we should try as much as possible to get as many people as possible to be screened and those who are tested positive should be accessed for treatment. When I reflect back, it, it, it could be like a magical journey to me. No doubt that we have challenges, we have lots of problem issues along the way. This is worth uh, an effort. This is so fulfilling and gratifying. We were going to walk through this journey together until the finishing line.
Hello everyone. Um, I see there's only a few of you here. Everyone else is stuck at coffee still, <laughs> but we will proceed, okay? Uh, so welcome back and we're going to continue with our second session. Um, in this session, we will be focusing on gender inclusive healthcare. This session will shed light on the importance of inclusive public health policies, showcasing examples such as the Tangerine Clinic in Thailand and to better understand challenges for gender inclusive healthcare. This session will be chaired by Dr. Tanya Wansom, who is the Director of Research and Advocacy at Dream Lockman's Thailand and Protocol Chair of the Sea Free Study. Dr. Tanya is also an investigator on the Hepatitis Transformative Science Committee of the AIDS Clinical Trial Group. She is an American board certified in internal medicine and infectious disease and has completed her residency and fellowship training at the John Hopkins University School of Medicine in Baltimore. Dr. Tanya will then be joined by Ms. Rina, who is the program manager at the Institute of HIV Research and Innovation. 
IHRI Thailand, and co-establishment of the Tanjuni Clinic as the first transgender-led health clinic in the region. She has also worked as a project management specialist in HIV key populations for the United States Agency for International Development, Thailand. In addition, she was a co-founder of the Thai Transgender Alliance, the first of its kind in uh, Thailand. The next speaker that we have is Dr. Anjana Krukreja, who is an infectious disease consultant, physician and lecturer at the University of Malaya, Malaysia. She is most passionate about HIV medicine as how it relates to women and women living with it. She spearheads the wellness of women living with HIV project, an initiative targeting comprehensive health needs of women living with HIV, from mental health to metabolic wellness. Now, Dr. Anjana is also a Distinguished Capacity Development for HIV and Mental Health Research in Asia Fellow. It is an initiative by the Fogarty International US under NIH US. We will be displaying the Slido QR code throughout the um, session too, and so please use it to channel in all your questions that you may have for your panelists. Now, without further ado, I am delighted to pass the virtual floor over to Dr. Tanya. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this exciting session on gender inclusive healthcare. We have three great presentations on deck for you. And the first will be by Ms. Rina from IHRI on transgender healthcare. Yes, um, thank you very much for your kind introduction, the moderators and Dr. Tanya. So um, can you see my slides um, okay now? Yes, okay, thank you very much. And, and first of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to speak. And my today's presentation um, is about the gender-specific healthcare by um, using the lessons learned from the Tantoin Clinic where I have been uh, running it for um, seven years now. And the Tantoin Clinic is actually based in Bangkok, Thailand. And this is the, the outline of my talk. I will share a little bit about the HIV situations among transgender people in Thailand and also some of the data um, coming from Asia and the Pacific Islands. I, I will share with you about the Tangerine Clinic as an, a gender-inclusive transgender competent care model. And, and I will talk a little bit about the data and demographics um, and risk characteristics of the transgender people who attending the Tangerine Clinic in the past seven years. And I will end my presentation with um, a few key takeaway messages. And um, in terms of definition, um, according to the definition by the Asia Pacific Transgender Network or APTN, transgender people are the persons who identify themselves in a different gender than that assigned to them at birth. Trans people often identify themselves in a way that are locally, socially, culturally, religiously, and spe spiritually defined. And as we all know, transgender people, they experience multiple vulnerabilities or stigma and discriminations. Um, also, lots of trans people, they experience family rejection and domestic violence. Lots of young trans people, they experience bullying in school, and they, lots of them, they're lacking of education. Many of them, they experience physical, sexual, and gender-based violence, as well as unequal employment opportunities. And lots of trans people in our region, they, they experience housing, um, um, the lack of housing, and as well as the institutional life stigma and discrimination. In terms of healthcare, lots of trans people, they have very limited access to safe hormone use and other gender affirming care and surgery. And lots of trans people, they also share the HIV burden and other sexually transmitted infections or STIs. And as um, discussed by the previous um, um, session, we also learned that lots of transgender people, especially trans women, they also experience lots of mental health and substance use as well. And this data um, actually uh, uh, revealed by the APTN or the Asia Pacific Transgender Network as well. It was shown that 
uh, there would be around almost 10 million of the transgender people in the Asia and the Pacific um, region, which um, are quite a lot. And we also uh, wanted to ensure that trans people, they are visible in the region. And this data is actually, uh, I obtained from the, the data from the UNAIDS um, database back in 2017 before we established or or open the tendering clinic, we found that uh, a high HIV prevalence were observed in many certain cities in Asia and also in the Pacific Islands. From your far right, you can see that the HIV prevalence among transgender people, especially trans women, were observed in lots of countries and capitals in our Asian region. And you can see that 30% of the HIV prevalence among trans women were observed in Jakarta of Indonesia. You know, almost 24% were observed in Kuala Lumpur of Malaysia. 13% were observed in Chiang Mai or even in Cebu City and in Siem Maria of Cambodia. So you can see that lots of um, high HIV prevalence among trans women, especially were observed in our region as well, which showing that we need to do something to address the specific needs of the transgender communities in our region. And in Thailand specifically, according to the data from the Ministry of Public Health, it was estimated that there were, um, there were around 300,000 of the transgender women in Thailand. And of those, um, 62,000 of them, they were sexually active. And of those who were sexually active, 13,000 of them, they were at high risk of HIV acquisition. And HIV prevalence among transgender women in 2018 was almost 18%, which showing that um, the country needed to do something in order to provide the, to, to bring the HIV service delivery to the transgender community in Thailand. And in terms of stigma and discrimination in healthcare settings, and many of you may have perceived that Thailand is the paradise for LGBT communities. But in reality, um, a few studies show the data that almost um, half of the transgender participants in the study, they reported that they never received advice and counseling from healthcare providers on gender affirming care and hormone use. And almost half of the transgender participants in the study, they reported having negative experience from healthcare providers. And another study showed that around 15% of healthcare workers and healthcare providers, they thought that transgender women who live with HIV should be ashamed and blamed. It's really showing that in the Thai, Thailand's healthcare system has still have um, multi layers of double layers of stigma and discrimination against transgender identities and HIV status. So in 2015, um, the Institute of HIV Research and Innovation, we opened or established the first transgender-led clinic. We call the Tangerine Clinic through the community consultation. We actually invited lots of transgender leaders in the country to come together and we asked them and consulted with them what kind of healthcare services that the transgender communities wanted to see and wanted to receive in terms of healthcare services. And with the sub funding support from the United States Agency for International Development, we successfully launched or, or opened the Tangerine Clinic. So the Tangerine Clinic is actually the transgender center health clinic based in Bangkok, Thailand. We also provide transgender competent and gender affirming where we have integrated um, hormone treatment into the sexual health care services. And the, the clinic is actually led by and for transgender people. And you can see that this is the a group of the healthcare team where we have more than 90% of the transgender people who are the healthcare providers working to provide the services to the transgender communities. And here are the list of the comprehensive healthcare service package. You can see that um, on your right hand side is the, the key or the core services that we wanted to provide in terms of sexual health care, including HIV testing, syphilis testing. We also provide condoms and lubricants and services around anal and neovaginal pap smears. We also conduct high resolution anoscopy and neovaginoscopy. The clinic also prescribes pre-exported prophylaxis 
and post-exposure prophylaxis for those who seek HIV prevention. And if the, the transgender client tested HIV positive, we are able to initiate antiretroviral treatment on the same day of diagnosis if they are eligible. The tendering clinic also provides um, STI treatment and vaccination program for uh, hepatitis A, B, and HPV. And on your left-hand side, we actually also integrated gender-affirming care, including hormone treatment, um, um, as well as counseling on gender transition. We also prescribe hormone and hormone level monitoring to the transgender client. We're trying to make the, the healthcare service package as, as much as, um, as holistic and comprehensive as much as we can. And three years, um, ago, we have also integrated mental health and well-being services as part of the healthcare service package providing for our transgender population. You can see that we also provide peer counseling, psychosocial support intervention, and psycho psychiatric medication if our transgender clients experience with mental health condition. At the Tendering Clinic, we are also provide minor gender-affirming surgery as well as aesthetics um, services, including Botox and other skin cares, because we learned that lots of transgender people in Thailand, they also share syringe and needles when they administer Botox or other injecting uh, uh, cosmetic services in the communities. We also provide legal assistance referrals to the transgender-led human rights-based organization for those who experience gender-based violence or those who are the survivor from um, sexual harassment and sexual violence. And we, the Tantrin Clinic also work closely with the transgender social influencers in the country. You know, we have to engage the transgender community, even at the design of the clinic. And right now, in terms of implementation and communication, as well as marketing, we work closely with different diverse background of the transgender social influencers in the country in order for them to help promote the Tantrin Clinic into their communities and we work with lots of different transgender um, celebrities who are representing young transgender people and transgender in um, beauty pageants in the countries and here are the the data uh, from the tendering clinic which was updated from may last year you can see um, in the, the the data in orange at above uh, the tendering clinic were able was able to serve to more than six thousand of the transgender clients in the past seven years, and on your right, almost um, ninety five percent of them they are trans women or they identify themselves in the trans feminine spectrum, and the HIV testing uptake highlighted in green was very high. Was it was ninety one percent which uh, mean that we are also able to offer HIV testing services to 91% um, of the transgender women who visited the Tandrin Clinic in the past seven years. On your left-hand side, you can see that um, the HIV uh, positive rate was around 10%, and we are able to link 90% of them to initiate antiretroviral treatment and 98% they were virally suppressed after um, they initiated um, the treatment after six months of the, the ART treatment. On your right-hand side, you can see that for those who tested HIV negative, we are able to link 11% of them to post-exposure prophylaxis and almost 30% to pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP services. In terms of other sexually transmitted infections, we have observed that uh, syphilis um, uh, infection was very high among the transgender clients who visited the Tantrin Clinic. You can see that the syphilis um, reactive rate was 8%, while around 20%, 20% 27% of them, they were tested positive for chlamydia and gonorrhea. And in terms of demographic characteristic of the transgender women who visited the Tantuin Clinic, the median age of the women who came to use the services at the clinic was 25 years old. And you can see that on your right hand side, around 8%, they were non-Thai, which means that we, the Tantuin Clinic also reached to those who are living in Thailand, but they, they are not, uh, they are non-Thai national. 
most of the transgender clients who came to use um, the clinic who are non-Thai, they are coming from the Philippines, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, as well as from Myanmar. And, and we're still having some transgender clients traveling from Japan, from the United States, or even from Taiwan and Hong Kong to come to use the services at our clinic. We found that um, almost 45% of them, they have below special degrees education. 26% of them, they reported that they were unemployed at baseline. And 31%, they had depressive symptoms when they were screened by using the PHQ-9. 14% they reported that they engaged in sex work, while 11% they reported using amphetamine pipe stimulants or ATS. And around 70% they reported using um, alcohol at baseline of the clinic visit as well. It's really showing that the Tantrin Clinic is really serving the transgender community who are vulnerable or who are marginalized in the transgender communities in the countries. And here, I would like to share with you about the example of the community engagement from the Tangerin Clinic, uh, starting from your left-hand side um, under the community needs. Um, you know, the Tangerin Clinic, we have very uh, low prep uptake when we open the Tangerin Clinic in the first two years. And we wanted to know what are the reasons behind the low prep uptake or low prep services among the transgender communities at the clinic. And we asked um, our clients why you did not or you were not interested in taking PrEP. And one of the main concerns coming from the transgender women communities, they show that they were concerned about drug-drug interaction between PrEP and gender-affirming hormone treatment. And it's really alarming the research team at um, the Tantrin Clinic as well as IHRI that we need to do something moving on the right that um, it's really showing about the research question around um, the pharmacokinetic study looking at drug-drug interaction between PrEP and feminizing hormone among trans women. And we were very fortunate to receive the funding from the, the United States um, Agency for International Development to conduct the PK study looking at drug-drug interaction. And we engaged the transgender communities. We in, invited them as the community advisory board at the, the community recruitment, the research design, and, and until the, um, the, the research completion, we also share with the, the community advisory board about the research finding. And you can see that on your right hand side, um, this research um, we were we conducted um, called the IFAC study. We uh, one of the key messages that we learned from this research was that transgender women can actually take prep while feminizing hormone therapy still works. And the second message was that trans women who are on feminizing hormone therapy should adhere to daily prep in order to maintain the highest level of prep. So all of these messages that we got from the, the pharmacokinetics research has been used for the program implementation in order to decide the service delivery to ensure that lots of transgender women were able to, to be disseminated of the research messages. And one of the examples that was shown by Dr. Nitya at the previous session was that uh, the, the message from the research has been used to communicate with the transgender women in Thailand to the first transgender-led PrEP campaign. So the Tangerine Clinic, working with lots of multilateral international development organization, Ministry of Public Health in Thailand, and Bangkok Metropolitan administration to launch the PrEP in the city, which is the first transgender specific PrEP campaign by featuring four different characters of the transgender women in the cities and as well as to, to disseminate the positive game frame messages around PrEP use. The messages that we use for PrEP in the city campaign is non-stigmatizing the PrEP use among the transgender communities. And I would like to share with you about the, the impact or the outcome of using the, the research um, disseminated messages by translating into the gain frame counseling for PrEP at the Tangerine Clinic. You can see that this slide shows you about the data um, for, of the PrEP uptake at the Tangerine Clinic. So before the implementation of the, the, the PrEP gain frame 
PrEP um, counseling messages, the PrEP uptake among trans women was 13%. And after the implementation of the gain frame counseling for PrEP, we observed the overall PrEP uptake increased to 147% among transgender women who are at high risk of HIV acquisition. And for those who were perceived themselves um, that they were not at HIV risk, the, the PrEP uptake was reached to 700%. So in conclusion, I would like to, to end my presentation that by, um, you know, implementing the gender inclusive care can really increase the access to HIV and other healthcare services among the transgender women communities. Next, people centered healthcare services must be adopted and organized around the health needs of the people rather than focusing on the specific diseases. And lastly, community-led and community-owned programming is the key to the HIV response and it should be further sustained. And I would like to acknowledge all the support from these um, organization partners as well as the community-based organization who have made the Tentering Clinic work possible. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much for your excellent presentation. That was a very comprehensive overview of all the services um, that you uh, work so hard to provide to the trans community um, in Thailand and also in the region. So I think it's very um, touching or, you know, to see that so many people uh, really can um, avail themselves of these services, not just only in Thailand, but also regionally that people travel, you know, to get gender affirming care, comprehensive health care. But then also, I think one of the great messages from the talk is how you always use community engagement from the very beginning, you know, from the establishment of the clinic, throughout the clinic, using, um, making sure that staff are representative of the transgender community, and then also using research to really further implementation as we are part of a forum today on research needs and research and development. I think this is an excellent way of using um, clinical care questions to inform research that then gets actually translated into implementation and dissemination through the Prep in the City campaign. So I'm sure there'll be many more questions about that. Um, thank you so much, Rena. Next, uh, we have Dr. Antonau, and she is going to talk about women living with HIV. Dedicated to the wellness of women living with HIV, aiming to address holistic health in this community. There is a staggering 20 million women living with HIV globally, with over 40% of them living in the Asia-Pacific region. In Malaysia, the 2022 Global AIDS Monitoring Report, which reflected data from 2021, reported over 67,000 cases from surveillance. Yet, estimates reveal a larger reality, which is over 80,000 individuals living with HIV. Now, in this report, although spent, uh, gender specific breakdowns were not detailed, historical ratios from 2020, when extrapolated, suggest that more than 37,000 of these cases are women. And as transmission patterns shift in our region, um, we cannot overlook the persistent risk for women, including those in key populations, like Rina had mentioned, but also women who are currently living and aging with HIV. Women also face unique challenges based on the timing that they, they find out about their HIV diagnosis, whether it's during the vulnerable stages of pregnancy, menopause, or aging. Single mothers in this group manage added responsibilities, often compounded by caregiver stress, and his, some of them even have histories of abuse. Additionally, women grapple with higher internalized stigma. There are also substantial barriers to care, especially in patriarchal Asian settings, which impact healthcare access. HIV practitioners or their ID doctors often serve as the sole point of healthcare contact of these women, and other specialized health services are usually run independently from HIV clinics. There are also limited management guidelines surrounding various aspects of caring for women living with HIV. And so all of these insights coupled with clinic experiences, really prompted the initiation of the WOW Plus project. The WOW Plus project is an acronym for the wellness of women living with HIV. And the main goal of the project was to pioneer a women's wellness clinic at University Malaya Medical Center, where I'm currently working, 
which is dedicated to delivering holistic services for women across all socioeconomic backgrounds during their HIV follow-up. But what we really hope to do is to develop a model that can be adapted and expanded to the rest of the country and even hopefully regionally. But how do we make this vision of having an integrated wellness clinic for, for women a reality? Well, to actually understand the gaps, what's needed, we need research. And so we started by leveraging the expertise and resources that are available in our university to generate valuable insights and evidence to support the establishment of this clinic. But what we really hope is that the World Plus project will serve as a collaborative platform fostering research partnerships and knowledge exchange. So what aspects of women's health are we referring to? Guided by our national flower, the Bunga Raya, or hibiscus, and inspired by the strength and resilience of women at its core, each petal symbolizes a crucial facet of well-being. Cancer screening, metabolic health, mental health, social support services, and gynecological health. Our initial focus has been on cervical cancer screening and prevention, and I'd like to share a little bit of what we've done in this aspect with all of you. Now, we heard a lot this morning about cervical cancer screening, but women living with HIV are actually six times more likely to have cervical cancer compared to women without. And we all know cervical cancer is caused by the human papilloma virus. Not only is it preventable through HPV vaccination, but because of the nature of the virus and the time it takes to actually cause disease from the time one is infected, um, just by early screening and linkage to care, we can actually prevent cervical cancer as well. But the truth is, a lot of ID doctors, um, and I've been guilty of this myself, we just ask our patients to go to the local clinic to get a pap smear or go and see your gynae. But how many of these women actually really go? Because going means another clinic appointment, another day off work, another figuring out who's going to look after the children. It's just more cost. There's so many other reasons why women don't go. But despite that, and despite the increase of risk of acquiring cervical cancer in women living with HIV, we don't have much local or regional data. And in fact, in our local HIV management guidelines, which is excellent, but in the non-communicable disease section, there's actually no mention of cervical cancer screening recommendations at all. So what we did was an implementation science project where we integrated cervical cancer screening into our ID clinic. And I'd just like to share some of our experiences with you. So what we first did was we established the gaps in cervical cancer. We did so clearly people were not getting screened. So what we did, and I know this slide's a little busy, but I'll take you through it, is we instituted several interventions to start the process of integrating HPV self-testing into the clinic. So we made sure the swabs were available. We orientated the nurses and the doctors to how to order the test, how to talk to patients about the test. We even did knowledge and awareness questionnaires with the women to empower them to ask for survival cancer screening. And then what we did was at different time points, we evaluated two outcomes. So the light blue bars represent screening engagement. So how much was HPV screening talked about in a clinic follow-up? And the dark blue bars represent actual uptake. So how, much, how many HPV tests were done in that, in that clinic follow-up? And you can see that we generated a lot of interest right, in the blue bars, but there were real challenges in uptake in actually taking up the HPV test. And some of the challenges we faced was that education alone was not enough. Just educating the woman alone was not enough. We had to do it both with the, with the doctors as well as the women. Doctors were still saying that they forgot to bring it up. And then um, we are teaching hospitals, so every month we are rotating medical officers. And so each month we had to re-educate, retrain the new batch that comes in. The HPV test is also quite expensive in our center. It's 155 ringgit, which translates to about 30, 35 US dollars. Um, and so we've had to tackle each of these challenges and find innovative um, ways to improve. So for example, like um, when the doctors kept saying they forgot to bring it up, we just printed simple sticker reminders and added them on the cards. And this was done around this time. And you can see that really improved engagement quite a bit. We also um, engaged with Rose Foundation. You heard a bit about that earlier um, uh, to, to get um, subsidized HPV tests for, for, for those who can't afford to pay for the tests. 
But despite all these challenges, what I'm really happy to share is that we started with less than 10% of our population not being screened at all. And right now, we have one third of our women. So from just about 12 women, we have over 50 women who have now been successfully screened for cervical cancer. Thankfully, most of them um, had a negative test, but the few who had a positive test were promptly linked to care, and now they've been prevented from getting cervical cancer. So now our work is focusing on sustainability and to tackle the two-thirds who have not yet been screened. So besides cervical cancer, we've started a little bit of work in bone health and cardiovascular health. Um, for bone health, we found that the older Malaysian women, so those who are 50 and above, face underscreening and inadequate management of bone health. And this is important in our country because osteoporosis is quite prevalent and tenofovir amtricitabin is the first line medication for them, which is known to cause, um, you know, uh, bone issues in the long run. And so again, you know, we recently had the updated Malaysian osteoporosis guidelines released and there's no guidance for women living with HIV in, in that as well. Um, there are also significant gaps in the management of women living with, with HIV and cardiovascular comorbidities. Currently, um, I'm in the midst of addressing mental health through my camera training and support from AMFA. We're working on a pre-implementation project to integrate mental health screening and linkage to care for women in the ID clinic. So after identifying the gaps, we're actually now speaking to women and also had discussions with healthcare providers to get better insights on what women really want and need in terms of their mental health care. But although the study was on mental health, when I spoke to these women, I just learned so much from them, um, which can really be extended into the way they approach their other medical conditions as well. And I wanted to share some of those unique key themes we found with women with all of you. And the first recurring theme was that women did not like to be reminded of their HIV diagnosis. And this is illustrated by this quote here, where, she, where a woman said that, sometimes I don't like being asked so many questions. It makes me feel sad asking me, how you got this disease, this disease, it makes me feel bad. And she's referring to a HIV and people constantly asking her about her HIV diagnosis, even if she's gone for something totally different. Another theme was a preference to talk to ID healthcare professionals, be it the nurses or the doctors. And it's illustrated here when one of the women said that it's a support group. The clinic is actually something like that. It's not just coming in to see the doctors for meds, it's a support team. We don't talk to anyone else outside, definitely. And this really illustrates the role we have as ID clinicians um, to do the best for our patients. And another recurring theme that was highlighted during the interviews was a profound sense of responsibility towards their families, especially their children. And while this responsibility served as a powerful motivator for improving their health. It also presented a complex challenge. It's like a constant tug of war between prioritizing family obligations and prioritizing their own health needs. And so what I learned from these interviews really strengthens our resolve to develop a women's wellness clinic. For social support services, through efforts from my colleague um, and friend, Dr. Puili, we recently started a peer support group, which included women as well. And finally, for gynecological health, we're in the midst of getting ethical approval and we'll soon be starting a project on understanding the prevalence of menopausal and premenopausal symptoms among women in our center. So in a nutshell, there are significant gender gaps um, in research and guidance on managing different aspects of um, women living with HIV. And all the women that I spoke to want a one-stop centre. But there are multiple challenges to integrated care, um, such as structural stigma, cost, um, just limited healthcare and human resources. And so it's really necessary for us to have innovative approaches like task shifting to optimise care delivery. So moving forward, we remain steadfast in our pursuit of establishing a multidisciplinary clinic for women living with HIV. But to achieve comprehensive care, we need more research. We need to quantify burdens, identify specific needs, and facilitate collaboration among different disciplines and different centers. So this is my call for action. So if you are engaged in clinical care or perceived aspects, that might benefit women living with HIV. I encourage you to connect with me and we aim to address all dimensions of care. My email is um, over there and the QR code links you to our project so that you can learn more. 
Before I end, I would like to acknowledge and I would also be nowhere without my research um, assistant and to the various departments in the Faculty of Medicine who have been immensely supportive. But most importantly, this is for the women who brave and face the world living with HIV every day. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation, Dr. Anjana. I think you really highlighted the importance of gender inclusive healthcare or either gen even gender specific healthcare, just as Rena did with the Tangerine Clinic. And I think one of the overarching themes that I pulled out was like, it's so important for clinics to be safe spaces, actually. You know, they serve not just as, you know, a healthcare delivery. Um, station, uh, but it's really so much more than that, especially for a lot of people who are still struggling with stigma and discrimination or need, you know, a safe space just to talk about their issues that they don't feel comfortable, even in other healthcare settings, you know, uh, being asked all the time, how did you get this or, you know, um, being made to focus on something that makes them feel bad. And I think the other really uh, important point from your um, presentation is about the clinical guidelines, you know, not really being responsive to women's needs uh, that are living with HIV, uh, specifically in your local context, and how you're using data, you know, just from your clinic to try to really address that. So I think this is a ex excellent um, segue into my uh, presentation where I will talk about women who use drugs and um, their gender uh, needs. Okay, can you see my slides? I think yes. Okay, so um, I would also like to thank the organizers for inviting me to moderate and also speak on this panel on gender inclusive healthcare. Uh, I'm switching gears a little bit and talking about a study, but it's implementation. And so I think that it will have, um, you know, use and also lessons to be learned about how we can really support women um, who are also uh, have intersectional identities as, you know, women who use drugs. So this is about the C-Free um, study and lessons learned from C-Free, which was a community-based testing and treatment study of viral hepatitis, HIV, um, latent TB infection, STIs. And this was um, done in Thailand and for people who use drugs. So just some quick background, 700,000 people are estimated to have hep C antibody in Thailand. That's a prevalence of greater than 1%. And of course, we know the key populations who are disproportionately effective, affected. One of them are people who inject drugs and their HCV antibody prevalence has ranged from 42 to 90%, depending on the study in Thailand. And of people inject drugs on the right hand side, you can see in East and Southeast Asia, there's about 4 million people who are estimated to be uh, people who inject drugs. And then of those, almost 21% are actually women in East and Southeast Asia. And so, you know, one in five people who inject drugs are women and so have a uh, higher um, incidence of hepatitis C infection as a bloodborne uh, disease, as well as HIV. Another key population is HIV positive men who have sex with men, and we have seen that actually in the HIV negative MSM population as well. And this has uh, was in Bangkok. So P would face additional barriers to accessing care in Thailand. So actually, they were excluded from uh, treatment uh, until August 2022 in Thailand. And so, if you were a drug user active, or even if you know the healthcare provider thought that you had a chance to relapse, or even some participants um, in our study who said, you know, we, we're not using we're on methadone, but, you know, some healthcare providers would be like, you have to get off completely methadone first before you can be treated for hep C. So there was still a lot of stigma and discrimination um, and inability to access care for people who use drugs in Thailand. So because of this, um, we received a global fund grant um, to pilot and run this study, which was a model of community-based testing and treatment um, of these diseases, including hepatitis C, for people who use drugs and their partners in Thailand. And we actually chose to make it a community-based study and embed it in harm reduction services and drop-in centers that are also funded by the Global Fund um, throughout Thailand. And so these uh, harm reduction drop-in centers provide needle and syringe exchange, peer outreach, and uh, like Dr. Anjana and Rina talked about, a safe space for people who use drugs to, you know, really come hang out, get services, and also just feel, you know, that they're in a community of peers. 
And so this was the first time actually hepatitis C treatment was offered outside a clinical um, setting, so a clinic or a tertiary healthcare um, setting. And so that was very exciting for us. And these were the goals were just to uh, demonstrate the effectiveness of this community-based model of care, provide evidence for extension and support of community services as part of the national program, and then improve access to direct anti antivirals or DAAs, which are the curative treatment for hepatitis C in Thailand. So C-Free actually started in 2019 and we ended the first uh, project cycle in 2023. And we were really committed to um, not only having sites in Bangkok, you know, which I think Bangkok, of course, I live here. I think it's a great city. There's a lot of healthcare access, um, even though there are still challenges as, you know, many clinical studies and trials are run here just because of the prevalence of academic medical centers, resources, et cetera. But we really wanted to also include places that don't traditionally have implementation research or pull in um, partners, hospitals, and um, local communities that have a high prevalence of drug use, but you know would never participate in, for example, a registration trial or a new drug trial just because of their um, location. And so there's a map later. I will show you uh, the places that we are at in Thailand. And we actually enrolled 2,871 participants. And so all these people came to the harm reduction centers for testing. And so it's one of the largest rigorous study of this community-based care for people who inject drugs that we've seen actually globally. And we had participants come from 50 provinces in the country. And we also did not um, have any restriction on nationality or you know that you need to have your ID card to get treatment. And so we had migrants from Laos, Cambodia, and Myanmar as well. Um, and also, you know, people who were here during COVID, since this was during the COVID epidemic time. Close to 15% were female um, in our study and 1% were transgender women. Overall, 28% had HIV, 92% of them received antiretroviral therapy. Um, another key population we served, 17% uh, men who have sex with men. And uh, there was a lot of CT and NG among the MSM as well, 80% of those we found with chlamydia or gonorrhea had uh, or were MSM. Overall, of all the people we tested in our study, uh, almost half actually were found to have chronic hepatitis C. And so that was similar to some of the antibody prevalence surveys done of people who inject drugs in Thailand recently. And so of those, uh, we started 1,132 people started on treatment in the community center with cefosbuvir velpatosphere, and of those treated, 8.5% uh, were women and 0.8% were transgender women. Overall, we had an excellent cure rate, so 95% were cured per protocol, which means that they came to all the studies and actually came to their visit to, uh, you know, have their blood tested for cure. Um, if you included everyone, including people, you know, who were lost or didn't come back, 85% um, were cured, so it's still a very excellent cure rate for a community-based study, especially because we're targeting people who use drugs. And um, about a third of these were active injecting drug users. So because of the success of the program and many people were interested, other centers started um, you know, hearing about hep C treatment being available. Uh, we uh, applied for a follow-on grant, and so in this cycle, we are part of C-Free Central and Southeast Asia, and our uh, goals are just to extend access to advocacy and impact, and then catalyze access to other affordable hep C treatment regimens for the national program. One of the things that we are really proud of uh, as well was uh, part of our study results, uh, so I think one of the things we're talking about today is how we use research results to really push policymakers and change, you know, the clinical landscape in our own countries. And so uh, as part of our advocacy, our results were used to push the National Committee to eliminate the uh, requirement to not be an active drug user for national treatment. And so now in Thailand, um, drug users are actually a targeted key population for hep C treatment, and that is no longer part of the national policy. And so us and many others, you know, definitely work to provide evidence um, that whether or not you're an active drug user, you know, it does not make a meaningful difference on whether or not you'll be cured from hepatitis C. One of the videos I know that we watched during the break between the programs um, looked, uh, discussed the phosphor rivitisvir um, and rivitisvir specifically, uh, which is um, 
developed by DNDI in conjunction with FARCO, and we're actually using rivetisvir in our current um, study, C-free expansion. And so I just wanted to put in a plug for cefosbuvir rivetisvir um, as a direct acting antiviral com combination. And so it is pangenotypic. Uh, I think what's exciting about uh, rivetisvir was that the registration trials were conducted in Thailand and Malaysia. So, you know, a lot of our registration trials for any drug, you know, are often concentrated in Europe, US and Europe, and then we have to use it here. And we don't know, is it going to be the same among Asian populations, genotypes, genetics, et cetera. So I think it's uh, really excellent that the registration trials were conducted here in Thailand and also Malaysia. And it's currently used as the first line treatment in Malaysia for hepatitis C elimination and was added to the WHO essential medicine list in July, 2023. So I think some important um, distinctions here for the clinicians in the audience, uh, differences between sofosbuvir rivetisvir and sofosbuvir velpetisvir or softvel. So softvel cannot be used with ephedrine-based HIV regimens. And prior actually to quite recently in Thailand, ephedrine was still a first line treatment, but I think even in countries that, and including Thailand, which have now switched to dolutegravir, ephedrine is still very important with those living with HIV TB co-infection. And um, so I think, you know, this is a very important consideration that sofosbuvir or vatisvir has no drug-drug interactions with any ART. And so you don't need to switch or wait, um, you know, to have your hepatitis C treated. So I think that's an excellent um, benefit of sofosbuvir or vatisvir. One thing um, that is, Hopefully in the future, there may be a single dose regimen. So Safravi is not currently available in a single dose regimen. Um, so it increases the pill burden in some people, you know, who may have to take multiple medications. And then it's a longer course. So 24 weeks is given for those with cirrhosis. While in most cases for softball, just a 12 week standard course, regardless of whether or not your cirrhotic is given. Um, so these are just uh, for our current study that is currently enrolling our um, cohort study, uh, which is where you just come in and get tested at the community drop-in center. Uh, so we have any sex, age 18 or over, uh, any type of drug use, so ATS, opioids, any kind of drugs. If you ever use drugs, you can be tested. Uh, we expanded the eligibility criteria to include transgender persons uh, as those who are at high risk for hepatitis C and HIV, men who have sex with men, and sexual or life partners of participants from these high-risk groups. And then if you're found to have active hep C infection, you can be treated at the center if you are eligible. Um, and so this is just what I talked about earlier. So these are all the centers that are currently participating. And so you can see that we have uh, Bangkok in the center here. There are many centers in Bangkok, but we also have Kanken in the Northeast, um, Dak. Uh, in Miramat, Chiang Mai, Chiang Rai, and then in the south of uh, the border with Malaysia, um, Songkla, Naratiwat. And so uh, people can travel to these different sites. And we're opening um, some new sites soon also here. So to just increase the geographical avail availability of um, treatment, because people before were traveling like hours in a van to come to Bangkok to get treated. And because they use drugs, they had multiple issues like drug checkpoints, arrest, et cetera, or inability, you know, to get their methadone. And so we really wanted to try to uh, encompass as much of the um, country as possible. And then we partner with a lot of different hospitals at the district level or local level. And that has been really great, too, to increase capacity. Um, everybody likes pictures. So just to break it up with some pictures of the um, different sites and teams of people we, we work with. Um, and the community-based organizations that we're based at. And then I just really wanted to talk about, uh, close with like specific issues that women who use drugs um, face. And so for drug use, um, women actually are more likely to start using drugs in the context of sexual or social relationships. And they're actually uh, more likely to be second on the needle, which basically means that if they are injecting drugs, they're more likely to have another person inject them, often their sexual partner, and they often get whatever is left. And so the partner, you know, may inject if they're in a heterosexual relationship, would inject himself first, and then uh, the woman would be injected second. And so that has been seen commonly in many studies globally. And so obviously that increases the risk of bloodborne disease. Um, and then 
you know, women may not, uh, with the power dynamics, um, both Dr. Anjana and Rena brought up gender-based violence in both transgender, you know, and cisgender communities that women are subjected to gender-based violence. Um, Rena did uh, discuss this briefly in her presentation, which I thought was very interesting about transgender women um, and sex work and drugs. So there was like intertwined risks between sexual and injection related risks. So globally, close to 33% of women who inject drugs participate in sex work in exchange for drugs. And uh, interestingly, some of them also are using sex work as a way to get drugs for their heterosexual male partner. And so they're they're like, you need to get drugs this is the way, you know, to do it. And so they're actually supporting both their own and another person's um, needs for drugs. Uh, finally, criminalization. And so Thailand actually has the world's second highest rate of female incarceration. And I'm talking about specifically criminalization of drug use and or even like non-violent related, you know, drug crimes. So in 2018, in the World Prison Brief, um, the vast majority, 82% of close to 50,000 female prisoners in Thailand were incarcerated for drug-related offenses, and most of these were nonviolent. And then one thing that we also talked about here, Dr. Anjana specifically, you know, a lot of women in the world and the majority of incarcerated women actually globally are mothers. And so, you know, being a mother and having children to either care for or they either go with them to prison or, you know, are um, foster care or somebody else has to take care of them. And so this is actually one reason that many women who use drugs don't come forward for treatment uh, because they're worried about custody, losing custody of their children or being arrested or yeah, just all the family responsibilities that they have as well. And then um, as we've seen in many of the other clinics, sometimes uh, harm reduction programs, they're often are designed for and run by men. And men who inject drugs are um, more common than women. So you can see the right 20% of the people who inject drugs in East and Southeast Asia are women, but 80% are men. And so many of the peer outreach workers or sometimes these spaces, a lot of women say they don't necessarily feel safe or at home if it's like, you know, all predominated by men. And I think transgender women and women who live with HIV may feel the same way. And when they're in mostly spaces that are not designed for or run by them. And um, like Dr. Anjana mentioned, or Rena, you know, there's no gender specific services. And so there are a lack of sexual and reproductive health services um, there for them as well. So for C free, uh, we noticed that we do have women clients, but we would like to increase the number of women who are um, know about C free or who can come and get harm reduction services. And so we have talked to the collaborating community based organizations where we're embedded. And they're also focused on this. So we're increasing outreach to women through our collaborating community-based organizations and also other partners who serve both cis and transgender women to let them know that community-based hepatitis C treatment is available at our centers. Um, many of our community-based organizations are doing targeted outreach now to sex workers. As we talked about, there's often intersectionality between sex workers and people and women who use drugs. And so trying to get them into testing. Um, and then just education regarding the availability of services offered through C-Free. So some people right, may be like, I'm at low HIV risk, but we're like, we have viral hepatitis, we have vaccination, we have STI testing. And so just trying to get them in the door and then um, you know, providing comprehensive services as much as possible. And then also mobile testing or opportunities to recruit outside of male or other sexual partners. So Dr. Antona mentioned this in patriarchal societies sometimes difficult for women to access healthcare on their own or there are childcare challenges or so many other things. So really doing mobile testing or reaching out to them specifically where they are, um, we hope can be helpful. Uh, and then finally, I think for us as healthcare providers, um, we really need more capacity building and more focus on gender specific counseling services, just like Dr. Anshan said, like, hey, these people need HPV screening. And so we wanted to, uh, with our nurses and our staff as well, to really focus on gender-based violence and sexual and reproductive health to make sure we are, you know, asking the right questions or making sure that we're addressing needs, you know, as they come up rather than just having a blanket, like you're just going to be tested for this and then, you know, treated for this. And then finally, I think we all discussed this, but I think um, having specific safe spaces for women or maybe even like uh, providing something like uh, a possibility for a child care or, you know, women to 
um, help, you know, maybe look after each other's children if they're, you know, in the, in the small clinic setting um, could be really helpful and also perform peer support groups. So I think that is something we are exploring in the future as well. And these are all of our funders and supporters uh, that we would like to thank USAID, PEPFAR, EPIC, the Global Fund, and all of our collaborating organizations. And then, of course, all the people who come in uh, using drugs who are uh, placing their trust in us and joining um, our study. In. Oh, these are some more pictures. And that is the end of my presentation. So this concludes uh, the presentations. I think we had excellent presentations from all three of the speakers here today um, on gender inclusive healthcare and healthcare needs. And I think, um, yes, now we will move to the Q&A session. Okay, so the first question, I will just go back in the order uh, that we presented in. So for Rena, what are some of the key challenges you face in establishing the Tangerine Clinic? And can you share um, how you overcame these challenges? Oh. Yes, um, thank you very much, um, Dr. Tanya. I think first of all, congratulations on the wonderful presentation. It's very, it was eye-opening for me after uh, having heard about the C3 project for many oh. years. Yeah, thank you very much for, for sharing that. And I hope that transgender community would be able to access to these kind of services yes. in the near future. Yeah. Okay. To address your first question, I think when we organized the transgender community consultation back in 2015, they share with us that stigma and discrimination against transgender identity was at one of the major concerns when accessing to healthcare services. So what we did at the Tangerine Clinic was that we, they share with us that if you talk about HIV alone, you know, it's not going to be successful in linking transgender women into healthcare services or even into HIV services. So you, you have to decide um, integrated healthcare services or come up with a comprehensive healthcare service package. So um, my um, slide share with you that, you know, we're trying to, we don't talk mainly about HIV, but we talk about other healthcare needs as well. So we have integrated gender affirming care, hormone treatment, mental health as part of the healthcare services. And the second thing that we did was about um, to revisit the data collection forms because before we opened the Tangerine Clinic, we had like, you know, be using the bin binary data collection system, which um, it was, uh, it did not accommodate their preferred pronouns, their preferred um, nouns, you know, so that's why we developed like, you know, a new data collection system uh, in order to facilitate their preferred gender um, marker or prefer pronouns and prefer names in order to make sure that they feel very welcome and they feel that they are themselves when they're accessing to healthcare services. And another thing is that we did was to conduct a transgender competent care training to all healthcare providers at the clinic. It was not um, limited to healthcare provider, but we conducted the training to the receptionist, to the security guard, to the medical technologist, to the pharmacist who involved in providing healthcare in order to make sure that there won't be any potential um, stigma and discrimination against transgender people. So I think this is something that we did in order to ensure that we're trying to mitigate of the, of the, the potential stigma at the clinic. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for that comprehensive um, response. I think that is uh, so important, especially about what you said about the training. I think a lot of times they only focus on physicians or nurses and forget about all the other ancillary staff that really make the difference for people who are coming to our clinics. Um, next for Dr. Anjana, um, in your presentation, you mentioned advancing women's health through research. To what extent are women, including those living and aging with HIV, participating or being recruited as clinical trial subjects? And how important is it to have clinical trial data from women? Thank, thank you, Dr. Tanya. Thank you for the question. Before I answer, I just wanted to say, Dr. Tanya, I really enjoyed listening to your presentation. 
um, and especially at the end where you highlighted criminalization, um, I think that is something Malaysia is really working um, towards as well, drug dec decriminalization. And Prof. Adiba, who I'm sure is speaking, will speak about it this evening, um, is really pioneering this. And uh, I think that that's a big step in, in trying to address a lot of the issues. Um, okay, so just to ask the question. Um, so the first part of the question, um, yes, um, there, there are clinical trials that do involve people li living with HIV, um, although the majority of them are men. Uh, and there are trials that are just for women. But what's notable is a lot of these trials are actually in Africa. Um, there's very, very few clinical trials conducted in our region, um, which are focused at women or um, for women. And so this discrepancy really underscores the need for studies in our own region because we have to take into account that we have different cultural, societal and regional differences. And so these variations can really impact the efficacy and applicability of treatment outcomes. The other thing is having robust, the second part of the question, so having robust clinical trial data from women, particularly those living with HIV, is really important for a few reasons. And the first would be, um, it, gives, it will give us a more comprehensive understanding of how treatments and interventions may affect women differently than men, especially the hormonal variations, biological differences. And the other thing is just tailoring strategies to address challenges faced by women, which we've been discussing about in terms of family and things like that. And, and then we can improve um, health outcomes and quality of life. The other thing is if we have our own data within our own region, uh, then we know that the research findings are more applicable and relevant. And um, it, makes us, it, it makes it easier to implement it as well in a setting that we understand when a study is conducted in our setting. Um, yeah, so, so I do think it is really crucial to prioritize um, and support research efforts within our own region uh, to address the unique healthcare needs of women. Another question um, that I see from the um, participants uh, to me was the transgender community uh, face much discrimination socially, especially in very conservative settings. How do healthcare providers balance these sensitivities and still provide much needed medical care? And so um, I know Rena discussed this and she's probably the, more the expert than me on transgender specific um, competent care and also uh, training, you know, of healthcare providers. And I think actually they, um, IHRI and the Tangerine Clinic offer technical assistance and trainings, you know, to other countries, but Rena, you can correct me if I'm wrong on um, how to do that. I think for us as uh, clinicians and also providers, um, really trying to push for gender inclusive, uh, health education starting from medical school is really important. And so even when I went to medical school in the US, it was just really starting to talk about LGBT inclusive health care. You know, how can we really um, address their healthcare needs and also, you know, be culturally competent providers. And so I think that is often a missing area of medical education. You know, all of us who went to Medical school can maybe remember or not remember the Krebs cycle, but you know, there is like a basis and, you know, of science and, uh, you know, all the pathophysiology, all the drugs, everything that you learn. But I think these um, skills about providing culturally competent healthcare is often overlooked and um, not discussed. And aside from that, I think just talking about communication skills. So, okay, maybe. I don't know about pronouns or, you know, I'm not going to get everything right the first time, but I think patients really know if you are trying or care. And so I think having just even basic communication in proper communication styles and, you know, listening like with an open heart, being willing to learn um, is just really key to balancing, you know, providing, you know, what medical care, which is what we want to do and having them have the best outcome, but then also just like, listening uh, and being open to like what your patients have to tell you. Okay. Uh, finally, uh, I have one last question for all the speakers. Uh, so I think this session uh, was really enlightening to me to hear about all the initiatives uh, and specifically clinical initiatives, you know, in different um, clinics that people are 
um, trying to start or continue to address um, the needs of women and transgender women, um, not just around HIV, but around, you know, the whole spectrum of healthcare. And so one thing that I wanted to ask was, how do you think we or you could adapt these models or what advice would you have to other people in other countries or whoever is listening to adapt um, the model of care that you discussed during your presentation um, to their own uh, cultural or country context? So, Rina? Uh, yes, um, thank, thank you, Dr. Tanya, for the very important question. I think based on my experience running or implementing the Tantrin Clinic in the past um, seven years, I learned that you know working or engaging the community, I think is one of the first um, is the principle you know that we need to 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 take it into the consideration by you know the tendering clinic has engaged the community at the design stage of the clinic establishment, and then we employ we have transgender people as part of the healthcare team where we um, foster the learning environment between cisgender communities and transgender community at the clinic in order to balance the transgender competent and clinical care quality as well. So I think, and, and I think we may not engage them only, but we let them lead or even co-deliver some of the healthcare services. I saw um, Dr. Anjana's presentation talking about task shifting and task sharing. And based on um, one of the studies that we conducted at the Tangerine Clinic, we found that most of the transgender clients or trans women at the Tangerine Clinic, they prefer peer-led mental health services. So that's way they, we have to build up or strengthen the capacity of the transgender counselors at the clinic to be able to provide some certain level of the mental health care services in order to ensure that the clients will be able to receive the service they need. So engaging, let them lead, or even to co-delivering the healthcare services is the way to go. Thank you. And I'll just weigh in. Um, I, I totally agree with Rina. I think understanding what your community wants and needs is, is really the main thing. And But just to add on, once you've done that, um, I think it's really important to also form partnerships with relevant stakeholders. Um, you know, no man is an island, we can't work alone. And so not just the communities, but the different um, government organizations and non-government organizations or non-profit organizations, it's really important. And the other thing is, I think that's really important from my experience is to monitor and evaluate. It's always important to check in on what we've been doing. Is it working? Is it not working? Where can we improve? Um, I, I think those are very like having um, having outcomes that you can monitor to to do better for the community and to do better for the people. I think that's really important. But I think underlying all of that is really having a passion for what you do. And and it, that that has some that is something that I think really showed clearly this morning and as well when Dr. Tanya and Rina spoke about the different things that the different areas that they are working on. I think if we um, if our heart's in the right place, everything um, will fall into place just with time. Yeah. So just wanted to add that. I agree with what everyone else has said, and I really like what Dr. Anjana said, you know, about partnerships and what Rina said about um, letting them lead, you know, or letting people who are actually affected rather than us being like, we know everything. Here is, you know, our thought of how the clinic should run and how you would want to engage with our services. So really engaging um, throughout the whole cycle of, you know, asking about the needs, delivering, but then also, like you said, Dr. Anjana, monitoring and evaluation. So for other countries, I think one thing that um, is really unique about CFREE and uh, one of the great things about it is leveraging existing resources that we already have. And so, you know, these harm reduction centers were already in place uh, because of the Global Fund grant and support and, you know, these peer outreach workers and um, the people who work there are like well established in the community already. So I think for those of you out there, like you don't need to be like, oh, well, I'm going to reinvent the wheel. You know, there's probably Dr. Ajana said, you know, in your region or organizations that have been working on this specific issue, like maybe not forever, but for a long time that you can like really engage with. 
And so I think leveraging resources that you already have and maybe, you know, trying to add on something or just do a different spin. So I know uh, Rena said uh, transgender women were like, we are so sick of like hearing about HIV already. Like we want to hear about all different things. And that is actually the same with drug users. They were like, we are also sick of hearing about HIV already. You know, all people talk about is HIV and what we're interested in is hepatitis. And so we can see like, using what the people actually want or are interested in to, you know, first get them into care. And then you can talk about all the other different things, you know, and Tangerine Clinic has a really high uptake of HIV testing. Um, but right, they don't just go out and be like, all we do is HIV testing, because I think that is one thing that people can think about, like, what do people, you know, want in your country or really need, and then use that as a way to bring them in. And then you can offer them all the things they your HIV specific community treatment centers and what can we do to incorporate it as part of public health care and actually I think I will ask Rena this as well uh, for reimbursement. I'll, I'll start with, with I'll start to, with my experience in Malaysia at least. Um, I think the first challenge is stigma. Um, there is so much stigma even among the healthcare providers. I mean just recently a colleague of mine had a focus group discussion with some um, support staff, you know, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, about doing simple cognitive screening in people living with HIV. And we were horrified to find out that they didn't want to do it because they felt if they were going to be um, dealing with people living with HIV, they needed more allowances uh, because they're at risk of getting HIV, which was really ridiculous. And to still have that in this day and age, um, it's it's terrifying and it's one of those things that keeps us up at night, you know, and so I think stigma is really, really something that we need to to address even within our own healthcare, uh, the different levels of our healthcare. That's really the first challenge. The second, if you're talking about women, um, especially what I've noticed is many of our patients, they are in um, seroconcordant relationships. So they come to clinic with their spouses um, and they're very afraid to do things on their own. It's always, no, I'd, I'd rather just come with him. And um, I think this patriarchal setting, Asian thing, it's still, and I'm sure it's, it's also in, in other parts of Asia. I think this is the other thing that, that we can, uh, th that, that is a big challenge. Cost, of course, is a challenge. And the fact that there's just a lot of red tape, different things are run by different uh, societies or different governments or, you know, a different department. And just communicating between those departments can be a challenge. What we can do, I feel, is to start. I think a lot of times we look at the challenges and we think it's impossible. But if we start, then we can slowly address this challenge. And of course, sometimes things that take slower than, than we expect. But I think if we don't start, we will not even get there. Rina, do you want to go next just to talk about um, your challenges or successes maybe in having transgender healthcare covered under national health yes. um, I think one of the, the challenges that we are currently experiencing is about the sustainability of the transgender care in Thailand because based on my presentation you may have seen that lots of um, fundings actually coming from international donors or agencies right and I think uh, last year in October we were uh, working closely with the National Health Security Office to use the data from the Tangerine Clinic to advocate for the transgender care inclusion as part of the universal health coverage. And, and we also share with them the data from the clinic and from other community-based organizations in Thailand where they're serving transgender populations. And then in January this year, um, the Prime Minister announced that, you know, they are planning to include the transgender care as part of the universal health coverage. So it's still ongoing process, but I will I'm getting to the point, um, Dr. Anjana said that engaging the policy makers or policy stakeholders is is vital. You know, we have worked with National Health Security Office, who are the service payer in Thailand, as well as to we work with the Medical Council of Thailand to revise the transgender competent care guideline in order to make sure that the guideline cannot be like, you know, a way to prevent transgender community to access to healthcare services, but to make it more accessible and available to at the primary care um, um, level. So I think this um, uh, 
um, the regulation endorsed already endorsed by the medical council and it will be uh, in effect in the next um, 90 days. Oh, very soon. That is excellent news. Um, one thing that we have tried to do on IHRI, you know, has led the um, push for this as well is to advocate for reimbursement of community-based testing and community-based services. Um, so, you know, um, the payer generally has is set up, you know, to go through the Ministry of Health and to, to, to flow through district health, uh, you know, hospitals, clinics, et cetera. And there wasn't really a mechanism for people uh, or organizations, community-based organizations who largely in Thailand have been um, financially supported, you know, by USAID, PEPFAR, the Global Fund, other international donors. But as Rena said, like sustainability is really important. And so trying to push for a mechanism or a way that communities can be reimbursed for HIV testing, for treatment, um, and just, you know, increase the capacity building and sustainability of this. And so I think that's one thing that we have we have been challenged with, but, you know, are working towards that. And, you know, now people can get uh, reimbursed for some services that they provide. So that really is a pathway to sustainability for these community-based um, questions. Okay. Um, I think we have one more question that we could uh, possibly answer, just about views of self-testing. Um, if everybody could talk about their views on self-testing uh, for one minute, then I will wrap up. <laughs> Rina, do you want to say anything about self-testing? <laughs> Dr. Anjana, I'm sorry. Well, I was going to ask you not to go first. <laughs> um, oh, I, I, okay, I'll, I'll go first. I think I think it's, it's revolutionary, self-testing, but I do feel that it's really important to have a good linkage to care pathway um, so that, you know, we hit, I mean, when it comes to HIV, you hit the first 90, 95 targets, but you don't hit the next. Um, it, 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 it will be sad. Um, so I think self-testing is really good, but um, it, it must be coupled with a very good linkage to, to care pathway, including uh, even if it's a peer-led pathway. Um, and I think um, Rina has also done some really good work in that same-day ART and rapid ART testing. So maybe Rina can share some of it. Mm. Yes, uh, 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 to add on from um, Dr. Anjana's um, response, um, right now we are trying to focus more on people-centered approach and to empower our clients to be able to control their own health. And one of the innovative approach that we are implementing at the clinic and IHRI is to deliver HIV self-testing bundled with um, self-sampling collection for chlamydia and gonorrhea. And based on the implementation phase, we found interesting data that um, transgender women who receive HIV self-testing kits, we found a higher rate of HIV prevalence when comparing with the clinic-based clients. So I think it's a, uh, another innovative approach that we cannot interpret that by having a transgender-friendly clinic will be accommodating all transgender individuals' needs, right? There's some might be a lot of trans person who may be reluctant or who cannot come to the clinic or who cannot, uh, who may be afraid of the potential stigma and discrimination, might not be able to visit the clinic. But we have to make sure that our service delivery will be, you know, ensure that they will be able to receive it in their hands and they have the authority to be able to control their own health. So right now we're using SAV self-testing for, you know, ART linkage to care as well as for PrEP initiation and PrEP continuation as well as uh, uh, guided by the HIV status neutral approach developed by Dr. Nitya. Yes, so I think this is the way the way that we are doing right now. I agree that self-testing is uh, the wave of the future and not just for HIV, but as Rena mentioned, chlamydia and gonorrhea, and actually very soon hepatitis C as well. So we can bundle self-testing together and then maybe even use telehealth, you know, for initial counseling. Um, if confirmatory testing, you know, cannot be done immediately, I think that is all uh, in the horizon or even happening now. And so I think that will be uh, amazing and really will revolutionize um, preventive health care uh, by promoting early detection. 
And so I think this is time for us to wrap up. I just wanted to thank DNDI, um, all our amazing panelists today, and um, all the participants who uh, joined us for this session and hopefully for the rest of the afternoon. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, as we draw this second session to a close, we would like to take a moment to extend our sincerest gratitude to our esteemed chairperson and all our distinguished speakers who have shared their expertise with us today. Their contributions have truly enriched our understanding and inspired us to new heights. We would also like to congratulate the Tangerine and Wow Plus Clinic for such initiative to care for the specific populations. Let's give them a round of applause for their invaluable insights and dedication. Thank you all for your engaging participation. We will have our lunch and prayer break and resume promptly at 1.40 p.m. for our afternoon sessions. For Muslim participants who are physically attending at NIH, the prayer room is located at level 3 and our lunch will be served at the ballroom. Thank you. Thank you.
then the content and gender affirming where we have integrated um, hormone treatment. What are some of the key challenges you've faced in establishing the Tangerine Clinic? The people who work there, Rina, do you want to say anything about self-testing? <laughs> Dr. Anjana, I'm sorry. No, I was going to ask you to go first. Let's see. Just see. And I would also be nowhere without my research um, assistant. And to the various... ...and discrimination um, um, and inability to act as Tropical and uh, subtropical climate change from that. Now, now, without further ado, Kita bagi dua oh, orang yeah. yang kena lah.
focus on something that makes them feel bad. A lot of seats. We have together and then maybe even use telehealth for such initiative to care for specific people. Thank you. 
Hi. Good afternoon. Thank you. 
Uh, good morning. Good morning. Yeah, this is Hadiza. Hello. I just want to, yeah, I think uh, I'm in the, in the next session. Just want to confirm everything is okay. Yeah, I, I'm here. Okay, it's still, uh, all right. We Are we on break? Are we on break?
Roy dapat tak Roy? Roy dapat tak slide? Hello back everyone. Hi. Welcome back. How was lunch? Good? Yeah? Is everybody feeling a little bit sleepy? Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we hope you had like a nice cup of coffee as well with your lunch just to recharge a little bit. Yep. Okay, so we've got the next session um, that's going to take place right now. And we are excited because it's quite a dynamic session. It's going to be titled Clinical Trial and Gender, and you know, it's going to tackle important questions regarding how we address gender disparities in clinical trials. Okay? All right, so the panelists will explore interesting topics such as challenges in inclusion of adolescents and pregnant women in clinical trials, contraception as a barrier to clinical trial participation, 
and regulatory perspectives on the necessary for gender-inclusive clinical data. This session will be chaired by Datin Dr. Shamini, the Director of the Institute for Clinical Research, ICR, which is under NIH Malaysia. Dr. Shamini was a visiting scientist in Health Systems Group Program in the Department of Global Health and Population at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health from the year 2016 to 2017. Her area of research interest in the past includes healthcare systems and clinical epidemiology. And um, we are really happy that Datin Shamini, you've uh, agreed to, to chair this session. Dr. Shamini will also be joined by our other speakers, which are Professor Hadija, Hadiza Kaladachi, who is a professor of OBNG at the Bayoro University in Nigeria. She is also the director of a World Bank Supported Africa Center of Excellence for Population Health and Policy. She is an inspiring model for women, particularly women in clinical academics, being the first female OBNG and professor to be trained in Nigeria. She has also served as a member in several initiatives, including Align MNH. On top of that, she has won multiple awards for her leading work in maternal health, including the Figo Woman Award 2018 and the 2023 Heroine of Health Award. We are also joined by our next speaker, who is Prof Kulkanya, who is the founding director and consultant of Siviraj Institute of Clinical Research, CYCRES, in Thailand. She is also a professor of pediatrics at Faculty of Medicine, Siviraj Hospital. Professor Kunkanya specialty in pediatrics infectious diseases. Her research focus is on HIV AIDS and vaccines in children and adolescents. She is on the advisory board of the Ministry of Public Health Thailand for the National Immunization Program and Emerging Infectious Diseases. She is also on the executive board member of the National Vaccine Institute of Thailand and currently she is also the president of the Pediatric Infectious Disease Society of Thailand. Our last and final speaker is from Malaysia, Dr. T. Kim Boon, who, is cur who currently holds the position of Senior Principal Assistant Director at the National Pharmaceutical Regulatory Agency, NPRA Malaysia. With an extensive career spanning over 18 years, Dr. Tim is mainly involved in evaluating phase one to phase three clinical trial applications for clinical trial import licenses and clinical trial exemptions. Her expertise covers a diverse range of product types, including cell and gene therapy, biologics, and new chemical entities. So now before we get ready to sink our teeth into session three, a gentle, a gentle reminder to everyone to please use the Slido channel um, for you to funnel in all your questions and any kind of um, you know, queries you may have for our panel. The QR code will be displayed um, alongside during the session. I'd also like to now invite Dr. Dr. Shamini, uh, sorry, Dr. Dr. Shamini and Dr. T to the stage to begin this session in exploring clinical trials and gender. Thank you. Oh, sorry. I also like to highlight that um, uh, due to a mistake, there's an error on the flag for Dr. T Kim Boon. Who, who is Malaysian and not Thai? Yeah, I, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Right. Uh, very good afternoon to everyone. Um, it's actually good morning to Prof. Uh, Hadiza. Uh, it's 6.30 in the morning. Um, we were toying whether to have the session a bit later, but uh, she's uh, graciously agreed that it's so fine with her to start at 6.30. I can see you, Prof. Uh, thank you, DNDI, for inviting and giving this opportunity to speak on a very important topic, which is closing the gap, for, especially for agendas in clinical trials. This is something that 
I only realized a few months ago that we have actually not been looking into this area. And uh, we are very fortunate to have esteemed uh, panelists that includes Prof. Hadiza, Prof. Kokanya from Thailand, and even Dr. T. Um, as mentioned, she is the NPRA representative from Malaysia. So uh, without further ado, I think we'll start off uh, with the session. Uh, and we will kick off with actually Prof. Hadiza. Um, uh, informing us about the challenges of starting uh, conducting clinical trials in pregnant women. Now, uh, the panelists have decided to keep this session very light. Uh, we're not here to teach you or give didactic, but they are going to actually be sharing experiences. And the exciting thing after this session of sharing the experience of clinical trial is these three ladies are going to actually share how they are managing uh, doing research, uh, con uh, still continuing the services and uh, taking care of the family. So let's start off, uh, Prof, uh, good morning. Um, so the floor is yours. Prof, you're muted, I think. So I think, yeah, can, we can we find out why? Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, a very good uh, morning. Thank you so much, uh, the Director of the uh, Institute of uh, Child Health of the National Institute of Health, uh, Malaysia. And uh, of course, a very good morning to my other colleagues, uh, panelists, and then the participants. Uh, as uh, the, the chair said, it's very early in the morning, but uh, this is really um, a very topical, uh, uh, you know, uh, session that I really wanted to be part of it, that I could get up even early hours of the morning uh, to share my experience. Uh, can you see my slide? Can you see my slide? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Good. Okay. So really, um, uh, as mentioned by the MC and the chair, I'm going to talk about, you know, the the challenges, uh, uh, you know, of uh, doing a research uh, uh, with pregnant women, because as an obstetrician, that's where my expertise is. I mean, that's why what I do is to do clinical research with pregnant women, and therefore I can share my, my challenges and how I think we can close the gap as far as clinical trials is concerned. Now, first of all, I need, I wanted to mention this, uh, so that we can know how important it is for us to actually do trials in pregnant women. Uh, because right now, we know as far as achieving SDG3 is concerned, we're not on track. And uh, this is mainly in low middle income countries. In the current um, statistics, the current report that was shared in 2022, it was mentioned that still we have about almost 300,000 women globally that die from a maternal cost. And, and um, even though we know it's lower than what we had before, but it is still there. And of course, a lot of them are in the low socioeconomic, uh, I mean, low middle income countries. And when you look at that figure, what we're saying is about 800 maternal deaths occur every single year. I mean, every single day. And if it means every single day, you're talking about approximately one to two, every one, every two minutes, which means by the time we finish this particular session, almost about 30 uh, women would have died across the globe of a maternal cost. And of course, majority in low middle income country. Now this is the current statistics that is out. Now, which means we really need to do research to find out how we can address these issues. And, and uh, diseases like, you know, the common causes of, uh, uh, of uh, maternal death are preeclampsia. Uh, you have preterm birth, you have preparal sepsis where you need drugs. You have preterm birth where you need drugs. You have preeclampsia where you need drugs. For the last decades and decades, the only drug that we have for preeclampsia is magnesium sulfate. And that's almost two decades. And then in the preterm also is only the, uh, the, the, the steroids that are there. So, so it's taken the world so long for us to really answer 
questions that are related to pregnancy. And that is because we don't involve pregnant women in clinical trials. And you cannot do clinical trials that are related to pregnant women. If you do them in non-pregnant women, there is no way we can now bring them and use them in pregnant women. We've got to try them in pregnant women. And, and this really shows that no new drugs, no new technologies that are specific for pregnant women. And this is a gap, and it is a global issue. It's not only you and I, because pregnancy occurs all over the, the globe, even though I know preeclampsia uh, occurs may, more in the low middle income countries because more die. But still, we have people that get preeclampsia globally. We still have people that have preterm. In fact, preterm is it's, it's very, it's, it's uh, also high in high income countries because there are uh, uh, you know, factors that affect uh, the preterm. Uh, there as well. So, so really, this is a gap that is glaring at our eyes that we haven't been doing clinical trials in pregnant women, and we need answers to so many of their their problems. And you can get answers from from anywhere. You've got to get answers from them, uh, from themselves, which are the pregnant women. So, we really need to do clinical trials in pregnant women. Now, why is it so complex? Why is it that there's so much complexity as far as clinical trials in pregnant women is concerned? It's because there's so many stakeholders. There's so many interest groups, uh, you know, related to uh, the pregnant woman. You know, if it's just a man that wants to join a clinical trial, he just decides on himself right, whether he would join this trial or he doesn't want to join his trial. Or he, he signs a consent. Now, for a woman to sign a consent, there's so many things that have to go through her mind before she can sign. If they approach her to sign a consent, you're going to, you're going to, uh, you know, participate in this trial. She will not just sign because she now has to think herself. She now has to think, what about this pregnancy I'm carrying? Is it going to affect this pregnancy? What is my husband going to say? What is my mother going to say? What is my father going to say? What is the community going to say? On and on and on. So it's not her alone that decides. You know, the community has an interest. If anything happens to a pregnant woman, it's not her herself. It's, 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 it's like it is their, you know, their property. I'm sorry to say that, but there's so much concern because she's vulnerable. A man can decide on himself and they say, you, you know, you are an adult and you took a decision. That's up to you. But a woman is vulnerable. They feel she can't take a real decision on herself because, and it's beyond her because there's something else inside her. And that something that is inside her is not only hers, it's, it's virtually, you know, the family that owns that baby. So, so that is it. And then the healthcare themselves, the healthcare workers are key stakeholders. And sometimes they are the problems in clinical trials. If you approach them, you want to do a clinical trial, then they start thinking of, you know, is this safe? Will something happen? And then I will be accused, you know, because this is beyond just the, the mother herself. There's a pregnancy, supposing, you know, something happens to the pregnancy, she loses the pregnancy or, you know, she brings a baby that is deformed. We all know about the thalidomide trial. We all know about the Trovan trial. There is a trial that took place in Kano and, and it took us ages to be able to start clinical trials in Kano. In fact, people think you can't do a clinical trial in Kano. I come from Kano in Nigeria, which is northern Nigeria. Up till today, a study that took place by Pfizer, we're still having the effect over 30 years ago because people were delivered with deformities, they died and so on and so forth. And up to now, Pfizer is paying for it. This is like 30 years after. It's just recently they finished the, 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 the trial in the court. So in fact, everybody is afraid of any clinical trial in Kano. I mean, I was really at, at first afraid of getting into it, but then I realized that then, how can I help my people if I don't go into trials of conditions that concern them? Because even if you do trials sometimes outside your main people, translating it into your own community might need something. So you need to do implementation science uh, research, and therefore you need to do it within your people. And I had to take that courage. And then of course, legal issues, policy, as I said, now, if you want to do trial in Kano, you've got to go like step, step, steps to get approval so that you they really have to make sure that it's safe before they are allow it because of the experience. And then pharmaceutical companies, if they want to do trial, they don't want to, you know, uh, uh, 
recruit women because they don't know whether pregnancy will occur, then something will happen, and then they will say it is during their trial, and then, you know, as I said, Pfizer is paying for it. And then and then you have ethical, ethical co committees. Now, if it is just a trial of just adults that are without males, uh, you get approval immediately. But if it is concerning pregnant women, then you have series of approvals before you can uh, you can get it. So specifically in terms of the healthcare workers, why is it that we have challenges with them? And one is that the poor knowledge and skills of clinical trial. People really don't have these good skills because if you know the skills and you know the knowledge, then you know that clinical trials take every step to make sure that it is safe. I mean, there is so much into it to make sure that it's really safe if you're trying any drug. Nobody will give anybody any drug that they think they're not sure it's safe. And they would take precautions so that if you pick anything, you know, immediately report, do this, do that, do this. So you, when people don't have this knowledge, then you have problems. Then lack of trust, as we said. Some people will say, yes, they didn't do it in their place. They want to do it where the guinea pigs and they're using pregnant women as guinea pigs, yeah. And then train staff. If you want to do a clinical trial, you need so many staff. So if you don't have trained staff, then you are in trouble because you cannot be able to do good clinical trial. Then the anxiety of the potential harm. The healthcare workers are afraid. Supposing this happens to the pregnant woman, I'm going to be, I'm going to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, accused, and then something negative might happen. You know, uh, so so really, this is something that healthcare workers are also afraid, and they don't want to be part of it. And then, you know, there's so much work. You are a nurse, you are a doctor, you are, uh, uh, you know, a, a healthcare worker, and then you now have to do clinical trial. You need time for clinical trial. You cannot combine the two. So if you have so much work and as a clinical, as a clinician, doing clinical trial is real overwork. And then you need teamwork in clinical trial. A PI, a co-PI, cannot do it alone. He needs project manager. He needs data. He needs a interviewers he needs this he needs this and you need to work uh, together uh, so and then communication in clinical trial you need straight communication good communication uh, i just have two more slides and then i'll be done then you have the woman's concern what's the woman's concern as far as you know pregnancy and you know and uh, uh, inclusion or participating in a clinical trial uh, of, of course the first thing they think when you approach them to clinical trial is the potential harm to this baby, not even to themselves. They're thinking to this baby, they are responsible for this baby. This baby is the most vulnerable of them. So it, 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 they really are not thinking of themselves. In fact, when you approach any, in my experience, when you approach anybody, any woman for clinical trial and pregnancy, the first thing is that she'll tell you she can't sign, she has to go and discuss with her husband. And then the next thing, maybe they will even come with the husband and husband will have series of series of questions for you before she would sign. Just yesterday, somebody called me and I picked the phone. And then she now said, oh, no, I'm in one of your trials and I just wanted to try the number. You know, so she she, she didn't trust what the, the, the constant note that we gave her because she wanted to make sure that the number that is there is really somebody. And then I said, yes, I'm the PI, yes. Do you have any concern about the trial? And she said, no. She just wanted to try the number and see if the number works. You know, so, so, and then social norms, you know, uh, as I said, pregnant women and the women generally in the community, they are very vulnerable. They don't take decisions themselves. So all the social norms, the religious norms, the traditional norms are things they have to try. How do I address these problems? First of all, in terms of the healthcare, we need to do, you know, capacity building. We need to continue to train healthcare workers on, you know, how to conduct clinical trials, how safe clinical trials can be, and how, if you participate in clinical trial, how can you ensure that your participants are really safe, because that is key in any clinical trial. Then you must, you know, enabling envir environment for clinical trial. If I want to do, I have, I have challenges of even providing a space within our clinics and within our wards where we can do consent, we can take consent, we can do one in one with our participants. So somehow we need to provide an enabling environment within our clinical settings so that we can address the, 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 the lack of a, you know, good environment. And then we need to build trust of the women and communities. We need to tell the community and the women, if we're 
if we're participating in clinical trials, will not will not do harm. I mean, those are the principles of ethics. Do no harm. That's, those are the principles of ethics. Ethics. So everything we do before you do a clinical trial, you must have made sure that there is nothing that will harm. You know, the the woman or the the baby. You are responsible, and then you've got to engage the community. If you're going to do any trial related to women. You've got to go from, you know, different community stakeholders and taking them and engaging them and explaining and so on before you get approval. If it's just a man that comes, he tries whether he wants to participate or not. You create awareness of why it is important to do clinical trials. You can't do clinical trials in rabbits or in labs and then come and say you're going to give the drug or the intervention to women. You've got to do it in them to absolutely sure that it's safe and but you would have taken your phase one phase two phase three trial before you can do that um you have to do research to actually understand the barriers and the facilitators and and i'm happy to say this is now a trial this is a research that we're doing we're actually do, doing a research now they, they've done part of it in india and now we're doing it in nigeria to really find out what are the facilitators and the barriers of actually doing clinical trials in pregnant women because we've realized that they are really left uh, behind and then you've got to once you get you know evidence then you have to change the policy and change you know the the the, the decision lastly uh, i think you've got to address the gender in uh, equities of pregnant women participating in clinical trials because it's a moral imperative ground grounded by ethical uh, you know ethical principles which we know justice and equity. These are part of our, our, our you know, uh, ethical principles. And therefore, if we really want, we've got to involve, we've got to address the issues and make sure that the pregnant women are involved. And that, uh, you know, we know all eligible people should be, uh, you know, included regardless of age, gender, norms or whatever. We've got to include them, including pregnant women. And we must prioritize, uh, you know, uh, uh, include population groups that have been marginalized and these are the part of the pregnant women and therefore we need to uh, Im involve them. So uh, I really want to thank the organizers of this uh, 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 workshop and conference for actually inviting me to come and share my experience of doing clinical trials in uh, pregnant women and I'm really ready to uh, you know, take uh, uh, questions. Thank you very much for listening and Waiting for questions. Thank you. I'll stop sharing. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Yeah. Thank you, Prof. Adiza. Um, as you can sense, uh, these ladies are very enthusiastic. They are trialists, uh, whether it's uh, in pregnancy or in adolescence, which will be our next speaker. Uh, I would just like to remind my panelists that uh, we intend to, the session should uh, stop in about 15 minutes' time, so we should allow the opportunity for Q&A. Uh, I think there will be many questions. And uh, for the information of the audience, actually I've just checked with NPRA. So far, Malaysia has not embarked in any clinical trial in the pregnant women. Uh, we have done a few studies on adolescents, but um, let's hear from Prof. Kulkinia um, from Mahidol University. Um, so, Prof, the floor is yours. Another very energetic woman. Eh? Hello everyone, thank you for having me today. Uh, do you see my slide? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, oops, okay, this is the first slide. So, uh, I've taken from uh, Dr. Hadiza, uh, I will be talking about uh, uh, the clinical trial in uh, adolescents and uh, child-bearing age. Actually, female adolescents participating in the trial may encounter several challenges from informed consent, where uh, several levels of understanding uh, uh, in adolescent, you know, from young to uh, uh, from 30 to 18, there are lots of things that evolve, and uh, adolescent at 13 cannot understand many things as much as the 18 or even 15. So, so uh, I, it has to be a uh, uh, very clear, uh, uh, tailor-made uh, uh, according to their understanding uh, by their age and their. Uh, uh, personality. There are lots of sensitive issues uh, in uh, encountering in uh, joining a clinical trial. 
And um, everything has to be uh, in privacy and confidential. So, so uh, there are several sensitive health information where um, the adolescent may feel like, oh, it's uh, very private, very privacy. So uh, uh, they might concern about this and that. Uh, the big challenge for them to go to clinical files. Uh, another issue that uh, we encounter is parental consent. Uh, particularly at uh, those uh, for those who are younger than 18, um, where uh, the parents are not aware of the conditions where uh, uh, acquire them to uh, participate into the study. Uh, for example, uh, some of the um, uh, infectious diseases, STD, um, uh, uh, they wouldn't want their parents to know about it. Uh, so if we uh, uh, invite them into uh, that kind of studies uh, when they are under 18, uh, it's a big problem. Um, and also stigma and social pressure. Sometimes um, they have to be, um, you know, uh, uh, keeping all the things secret because they don't want their peers or their community to, to know that they uh, join this study because uh, people would misunderstand that they oh they are high risk. Uh, for example, we invite them to to join the um, uh, the study that related to HIV prevention in adolescents. They 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 would want to join because uh, it would make uh, their peers thought that oh you are at risk or what uh, and why you have to join this kind of study. Uh, so this is just an example, but there are many uh, negative repercussions from peers uh, uh, that are very important for teenagers, uh, adolescents. Um, another thing which is very important for adolescents, uh, uh, particularly those from marginalized or underserved community, they need a lot of support from transportation or even uh, uh, money for meals. Uh, so uh, some could uh, take the opportunity of uh, participating in uh, clinical trials as something that they would, would gain uh, money, which is uh, something that we don't like uh, that kind of thing to happen. But uh, on the other hand, uh, if we don't have good support uh, for them, then they cannot join the study because of their limitations. They have to. Um, they don't have uh, their income. Uh, they don't have uh, uh, something to support them to come to the study site. Uh, the ethical consideration is also another problem, as uh, the gender bias all the time. Uh, in several studies, uh, investigators avoid a woman in childbearing age and uh, adolescent because of uh, uh, worrying about pregnancy or uh, uh, being on contraceptions, things like that. Um, and uh, once it happened, uh, the pregnancy happened, then there are lots of uh, challenges uh, for the investigators and the participants uh, in the study. And finally, uh, the retention and compliance to the clinical trials because women have a lot of uh, competing priorities, school, work, family, uh, their, their uh, uh, social uh, uh, tasks, uh, their duties that they have to worry about, uh, as well as the communication and support. However, although uh, with a lot of challenges, adolescent uh, female are needed uh, to be uh, joining the study, particularly in the studies that need their data. And enrolling these uh, female adolescents into the clinical trials actually represents a value opportunity for them as well, because this is the time when they can gain information, uh, accurate, up-to-date information, particularly about health, reproductive health, some kind of health information where, uh, you know, they cannot easily gain from other sources. If they go to uh, Google, they might get misinformation and so on. Uh, they get uh, very personalized uh, counseling uh, guidance, uh, uh, particularly on the uh, reproductive health, sexual, sexual practices, and that could make them uh, avoid from unplanned pregnancy. And in several uh, uh, studies, um, there are behavioral interventions, and these interventions are very helpful to many adolescents. For example, we, we run a trial on um, the behavioral interventions in order to prevent uh, STI. This kind of thing really helped them to uh, reduce their risky uh, sexual behavior. 
and also empower them uh, on uh, the issue that touch on the uh, adolescents uh, very much, particularly on the reproductive health and making informed choice about sex behavior and uh, empower them uh, and uh, you know make them uh, uh, skillful uh, and get knowledge for autonomous decision on uh, healthcare seeking behaviors. And finally, we um, found that uh, several of the uh, opportunities uh, of the knowledge of the um, uh, experiences came from uh, joining the study uh, actually live with them for a lifetime. Uh, so they have long-term health benefit. Um, however, uh, having a female adolescent in uh, joining the study uh, have uh, uh, many dilemma and uh, sometimes uh, there are lots of uh, uh, problems with pregnancy during the trial. We have a female adolescent who uh, had pregnancy test positive while joining the study. And uh, of course the girl said, oh, I never have sexual intercourse, I never have a boyfriend. And that's the uh, vaccine study for a healthy adolescent and she's 14. So um, finally, after several sessions of uh, uh, interventions of counselings of uh, 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 of uh, very uh, discussion, very in depth discussion, they, she finally admit that she has uh, a boyfriend and she uh, actually was raped by uh, one of uh, her boyfriend and and she had uh, another boyfriend that uh, not frequently have uh, sexual intercourse, but uh, um, uh, that's after two or three uh, sessions of uh, uh, counseling before she really she really admit that and uh, we uh, send her to see OBGYN doctor uh, as she's only 14 we need to inform her parents so it's the big deal uh, uh, of managing her um, another case we have uh, uh, who actually 20 year old uh, and uh, have been on contraception but she uh, have poor compliance on contraception uh, on the pill. So uh, one day the pregnancy test was positive by the central lab. Uh, and she continued to um, to deny that, oh no, she doesn't have an uh, active boyfriend. And um, nobody believed her and that's sad. Uh, finally, she insists that uh, we need to retest her. We, we retest her again and found um, uh, discrepancy, discrepancy result with negative tests. So we send H, uh, beta HCG uh, to the central lab to make it more accurate. And it was found that she uh, she had negative tests. So she didn't have uh, pregnancy, but that causes a lot of turmoil, a lot of uh, 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 uncomfortable feeling. Uh, uh, particularly, uh, she was felt that she. Uh, uh, hide the truth from us. So uh, adherence, reliability, confirmatory test um, is very important. So uh, uh, having a uh, female adolescent into the trial is not easy at all. We have to be prepared. We have to be, you know, uh, uh, gentle and understanding. Finally, my very last slide is about the gender parity on the clinical investigators. Uh, and of course, uh, lady doctors, lady investigators are uh, uh, um, limited, uh, even nowadays. Um, the leadership position in clinical trials and principal investigators are, um, are still um, uh, more of, of male than female. And um, improving representation needs, uh, uh, female representation needs uh, equal opportunity on the academic uh, track. Uh, support uh, to support the female researchers, uh, address the barriers and career advancement. Um, uh, there are some programs that found helpful like mentorship program, leadership training, and uh, very important for investigators are uh, funding support. If women can have uh, uh, special funding support, uh, that will uh, improve the uh, gender uh, parity on the female clinical investigator. Um, and actually, uh, one asked why uh, we need to have female. Yes, female uh, investigator or uh, joining the team of clinical trials really make uh, the good positive impact. 
because uh, study has found that the wider range uh, of uh, investigators, uh, um, uh, 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 male and female together, will provide wider range of perspective and uh, the study designs and um, improved patient's outcome was found in the study team with a uh, uh, wide range of uh, uh, female and male uh, uh, genders uh, 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 participation as the investigator team. And uh, finally, the remainders, uh, the remain challenges is the uh, bias and the challenge here uh, that we have to balance between work and family based responsibilities. So um, for uh, gender parity on the clinical investigators for pediatricians are not that much because majority of pediatricians are women. Uh, but in other specialties, it's a big issue. Uh, so uh, we need to uh, have uh, the support uh, from management and uh, detail oriented. So that's my last slide. Uh, thanks for uh, uh, have, uh, uh, listening to my talk. And, uh, I'm ready for the discussion. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, uh, very short and concise, uh, especially the experience that you have highlighted about uh, doing clinical trials in the adolescent group and also touching about gender parity. So, ladies, uh, just for you will have uh, after Dr. T, we will be getting to know how you actually overcame these challenges in both your countries because this is something that. I think we in Malaysia have to learn from and moving forward. So uh, we are re fortunate to have the next presenter, uh, actually physical, um, Dr. T, uh, who will be uh, representing the regulatory uh, aspect uh, from the National Pharmaceutical Regulatory Authority. So Dr. T, um, can you deliver your, your uh, session? Do I need to share the slide? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shamini, for your kind introductions. Uh, it's my pleasure to, uh, to join this forum and to share my little experience about the regulatory perspective on the need for gender-inclusive clinical data. Yeah, I would like to start this forum with the story about the drugs, teridomide. It is an anti emetic uh, for morning, morning sickness. So for healthcare professionals, so what picture come into your mind when you heard about the words teridomide? Yeah, it's a, um, a tragedy happens uh, which affected estimated 10,000 infants uh, worldwide. So uh, this uh, it's happened, uh, the adverse drug re reactions following the uh, teledomite tragedy, which is called Focomalia, a rare congenital anomaly where the proximal aspect of an extremity is absent with the hand or foot at attached directly to the trunks. So let me share the whole regulatory review process in the United States US, US FDA. So in 19... Uh, before 1960, teridomide uh, uh, was registered in Europe and the sponsor submitted that new drug applications to the US FDA in September 1960. So during that time, uh, US FDA reviewed the new drug applications and the air applications based on safety aspect only. So uh, from the dosier, the peripheral neuri neuritis is the uh, ADR stated, and this side effect is not always reversible. And from uh, some of the trial report, uh, it's stated that it can be used to treat insomnia in the last trimester of the pregnancy. So for the safety for the prolonged use of teridomide, is questionable. Therefore, the US FDA review will uh, have queries to the sponsor. And before the answer come back, 
the sponsor informed the agency on November 1962 that the drug had been withdrawn from the market in Germany and because of its teratogenic effects, which is uh, the picture here for Comalia. So this is the uh, lesson that we learned uh, where when we, we want to have a clinical trial, we have to ensure that um, the reproductive toxicity study uh, uh, is conducted. Yeah, and if you look at the sample uh, package, you can see on the top line a uh, word physicians samples six tablets. Yeah, so during that time, this drug is not uh, was not registered in US FDA, and it was distributed to the physician in US for free sample for trial purpose. And the company stated that the drug has been registered in Europe. So following uh, uh, this, uh, there are cases of teratog teratogenic effects happen in US. So uh, the US FDA, uh, as usual, have the uh, US FDA investigation, and they find out about 1,200 physicians had actually received the uh, samples. And uh, after investigation, uh, the FDA find that some, uh, some investigators did not sign the agreement, do not have a proper trial record, and even after the sponsor knowing that there is a teratogenic effect, the sponsor did not if inform the physicians and there is no recall process. Yeah, uh, recall process for the free samples. So this event uh, trigger a clinical trial authorization in the US and the US FDA start to have stringent requirements uh, and stringent commitments from the sponsor and investigator for all the clinical trials. Yeah. So following the teledomite tragedy, the whole drug development process which involves application of clinical trial, uh, we, uh, normally we will evaluate heavily based on the ICH non-clinical guidance. Yeah. So one of the major guidance that relevant to the uh, drug use in women, in pregnant women, uh, is the ICHS5, which is the detections of reproductive and developmental toxicity for human pharmaceuticals. The, com the sponsors uh, are required to conduct their non-clinical studies following the ICHS5 guideline and submit the data to regulatory to support clinical trial applications or marketing authorization. Yeah, if you have an experience uh, in work in industry-sponsored trial, normally you can see this in your investigator brochure. You will have a series of non-clinical study like uh, reproductive, toxicity, reproductive toxicity study and uh, mutagenicity study. These two studies are important uh, for uh, the first in human study uh, evaluations. And this reproductive toxicity study is important. Uh, uh, it's a non clinical study that requires to be completed before a regulatory will approve a phase three trial where more women will be exposed to the investigational product. So, the aim of the developmental and reproductive toxicity study is to identify any effects of the pharmaceutical or the IP on the mammarian reproductive and development which is relevant to the human risk assessment. This guidance uh, mainly describes the potential strategies, so how the company uh, need to design their non-clinical study to supplement available data to identify assess and convey the risk relevant to reproductive study. So let us look into the general consideration of the um, reproductive, reproductive toxicity. So in general, there are several steps in the development and reproductive. So uh, the stage one will be the pre mating to the conceptions. Stage two will be the conception to implantations. Stage two, three will be a uh, implantation to closure of the heart plate and uh, to the birth and from birth to weaning and from the weaning to the sexual maturity. The risk to all the stages of the reproductions and development should be assessed unless the stage is not relevant to the intended populations. 
maybe it's not for uh, woman use. Yeah. So in this guideline, it's stated three strategy. Yeah, the first will be the strategy to address fertility and early embryonic development, FEED, which cover pre-matting to implantation. And the second strategy will be to address the embryo fetal development, EFD, which cover from implantation stage to the birth. And the third will be the strategy to address effects on pre- and postnatal development, PPND, uh, the stages in, involved from implantation to sexual maturity. So once the sponsor completed all this study uh, in effects on the male or female or their offspring from first generation, second generation to third generation. These guidelines uh, also will be read together with the ICH S6, which cover the biotechnology products in Malaysia we call biologics. ICH M3, which is the non-clinical safety study for the conduct of human clinical trials and marketing authorization for pharmaceuticals, which mentioned that for reproductive, uh, in order for you to uh, start the phase three trial, you have to cover for men, for women not of childbearing potential, women of childbearing potential, and the pregnant woman. The exceptions is applied to ICHS9, which is the non-clinical evaluation for anti-cancer pharmaceutical, which is a cancer treatment. So uh, um, reproductive toxicity study uh, is not required. Yeah. In terms of the regulatory control and experience in Malaysia, so I have been the bioequivalent study inspector, B inspector, uh, for several years. So for the practice uh, uh, in Malaysia or other country, most of the time there is a trend that during the bioequivalent studies, uh, the sponsor or the BE center, center prefer to recruit male subject instead of female subjects. Yeah. So one of the major challenge will be, um, yeah, some of the female, you know that uh, we uh, we have period monthly, and the BE study normally is a planned study. So once the subject agree to join the study, the BE center will inform the subject you need to come this week and the following week for dosing. So sometimes um, the participant, uh, especially women, uh, even though they sign the informed consent form, if you know, sometimes they have uh, uh, not feeling well, if they're having period, so they might not attend the studies. And also there's another issue that uh, uh, during period, uh, they will have blood loss and uh, in the bioequivalent study, uh, we require to draw the blood uh, quite many times and there is a tendency of low hemoglobin and it will have a uh, causing uh, adverse drug reaction, uh, uh, which some, uh, it's not related to drug, but it causes additional works to the principal investigator as well. So in some country, the BE Center Research Ward, they can house the men and women together in one place. And some country, they will separate uh, women and men. So if they were to have uh, all male subject, it's, uh, the cost to conduct the trial will be cheaper. They just need to hire a group of people to take care of uh, male subject in one place. But if they involve a male and a female, sometimes the cost will be higher a bit, a bit. They need to hire two set of staff to handle two group of um, uh, uh, two uh, uh, subjects. Yeah. And also, uh, bioequivalent study involve the uh, pharmacokinetic study, which is the measurement of the drug, the red and X drug in the plasma. So sometimes, uh, we know that women will have a lot of uh, hormonal, hormonal changes in their body and the hormone. So in those circumstances, sometimes it will affect the metabolism of the drug and affect the, uh, the concentration of the drug during the bioequivalent study. But uh, at the moment, from the regulatory perspective, in the trial protocol, normally the inclusion criteria will be adult 18 years old and above. It's up to the sponsor or BE standard 
what uh, which group of subjects uh, they uh, they will recruit. Yeah. And in terms of the clinical trial for gender, we do not require the sponsor to conduct clinical trial on pregnant women, but we have it in our post marketing uh, studies strategy. So uh, once we approve the drug for general use, uh, sometimes if there is a require if a requirement, uh, uh, we will request the sponsor to conduct additional study for a pregnant uh, woman, or sometimes the sponsor will collect a uh, retrospective data for women a pregnancy woman who accidentally exposed to this drug and they will submit the data to regulatory authority. Is there any adverse drug effect or is there any um, uh, efficacy uh, uh, from, from the exposure? But this data will require longer time for collections. If we compare to, we impose a clinical trial directly on pregnant women. So the... Uh, the regulatory environment for pregnant women involved in the trial history curry uh, um, is is the uh, the guidance are designed in a ways that uh, do not involve pregnant women during early clinical drug development, but um, like as everyone know during the COVID nineteen pandemic, a lot of pregnant women. Uh, they want to uh, get the, get the COVID nineteen vaccine. However, there's no clinical trial data conducted on pregnant women. So there is a dilemma happens, and um, uh, there are uh, people are started to voice up. There is a need for pregnant women to be involved in clinical trial, and we should change our paradigm uh, to review the clinical trial. Um, following this, USFDA have uh, issued several guidelines. Uh, three of it are still under draft conditions and one has been finalized. So uh, the regulator, I, I'm, I think that the regulatory around the world are trying to uh, start to accept the concept of accepting pregnant women in clinical trial. However, we need more um, more guidance or the guidelines to to uh, guide the industry how to conduct the trial in pregnant women or lactation women. So, for example, there is a guideline on clinical lactation study. In this guideline, it's it's a uh, start to encourage the the sponsor to conduct phase one study even uh, in lactation women. But in this case, the mother uh, should be uh, willing to discuss the breast milk after the phase one trial. The reason is uh, uh, the sponsor need to measure the drug concentration in the breast milk so that they know how much the concentration in the breast milk and whether the, the, um, the milk that uh, drink by the infant will, will affect the uh, baby. Right. And also, uh, there are uh, uh, for the pregnant woman, one of the uh, one of the issue is quite interesting. So for those pregnant women, a sponsor need to define which timing is suitable for the pregnant woman involved in the trial. So only for those uh, condition that there is no other treatment for the pregnant woman, only this new drug can treat uh, the, the the pregnant woman for such condition. For for example, the COVID nineteen. Uh, vaccine. So in this case, uh, who are, who are who will sign the informed consent form? Is it the both fathers and mothers, the parents, or yeah, who will be decide the uh, all the responsibility? Yeah, it's quite interesting. Uh, yeah, so everyone can give your comment. And this, I I think that I I think that this guide will, guideline will form the basis for uh, later all the regulatory or ethics committee when they review their clinical trial protocol which involve pregnant women, lactation women, or um, adolescents, or, or any trial involved women. So we will set a guide uh, to make sure the protocol have a proper um, a rules to safeguard the, uh, this woman group. 
that's all uh, for my sharing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. T. Um, it's very uh, promising to actually hear the regulator in, uh, in, from NPRA saying that we should be looking at it. In fact, WHO is strongly advocating that we should have the opt-in. Um, a lot of our studies, we tend to actually exclude the pregnant woman and those at the childbearing age. And hence, we don't have much information uh, regarding the effectiveness of these drugs and the safety of, a, especially in women who are of childbearing age. So, um, Prof. Hadiza, uh, we have a number of questions. Uh, the first question is, considering the different aspects of challenges and barriers present in uh, conducting clinical trials in pregnant women, how are the treatments developed and prescribed today for the pregnant women with the health concerns that we've mentioned? And uh, Prof, I would uh, like you to share your experience and how you have conducted this uh, in pregnant women, especially in Kano. Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, the director. Um, well, yes, um, that's why we really have not had so many new drugs. I mean, the drugs we're using for pregnant women have been there for ages. I mean, you don't have new drugs. As I said, something like preeclampsia, for the last two, three, two decades, is magnesium sulfate, no new drug. And even if for, you know, for, for uh, peperal sepsis and so on and so forth. So the drugs that we're using for pregnant women have been there for ages, and which means they've gone through the, you know, the protocol, as we heard from the last uh, speaker, before you can do a trial in a pregnant woman, you have to go through various you know, various stages of trying, you know, the first, the, the preclinical, first of all, trials, which means you try them in rats and rabbits and so on and so forth. Then you come to the clinical trial, you have phase one, you have phase two, you have phase three, you know. So for you to have a new drug in pregnancy and go through this, a lot of pharmaceutical companies don't want to go through this uh, hustle and through this challenge. Uh, because of previous, uh, 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 you know, studies, typically the thalidomide, which was just to be used for, uh, uh, you know, nausea and vomiting in, in pregnancy, and it ended up with this strategy. So, so, so tragedy. So, so it, that's why we really don't have enough drugs for pregnant women, and we need them. We need these drugs because a lot of women die of conditions that we feel maybe the pharmaceutical company can bring up new drugs that can save the women. You know, I mean, just the preeclampsia. I mean, it's really killing a lot of our people. And then we don't have new drugs for it. Uh, any other disease, you have drugs coming every every time, new drugs coming for different conditions, but none for pregnant women. And that's why we need to really address the issue of, you know, clinical trials in pregnant women. Uh, the second question is, how have I, you know, really been able to really conduct clinical trials. First of all, it hasn't been easy. As I said, we have a typical example of a clinical trial in Kano that brought a lot of issues, you know, even if not as bad as thalidomide, but it's a lot of issue and, you know, the companies are still suffering for it. So for me to really get into the, first of all, I had to like, you know, I'm ready for, you know, the challenges. Um, and I think what has helped one is you've got to have the skills. You cannot be a, 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 you know, somebody in clinical trials without really having the skills, which means really understanding clinical trials. So going through different courses on clinical trials so that at least you have the skills and the knowledge because you can't work in a field when you really don't have the skills and the knowledge. Uh, and, and then, of course, you need, uh, uh, you need, you need a good team. So you can't do it alone. If I'm the only person doing it, there is no way. I, having a good team is really a, a challenge for healthcare workers that are into, you know, clinical trials. So you need a good team. In a good team, you have, you know, course supervisors, you have the data people, you have the project manager, you have, you know, logistics, you have, you know, accountants, you have, you know, it's a whole team. So based on that team, you need a platform. Just as a clinician alone platform, and as you can see, Professor Kulganya is in a research institute. I'm also in a within the teaching hospital, within the university, in a research institute. So you need a platform that can support you. 
So having a good platform, which means you have an institute that supports you, I think is very important. As an individual, if you want to go into clinical trial, it's going to be difficult for you. But when you have a platform, you have an institute to support you, then that will also be, uh, uh, you know, very uh, uh, useful. Uh, and then you have to share your time with, clin with clinical work. I'm an obstetrician. And as an obstetrician and a gynecologist, your time 24 hours, you're, you're on duty uh, all through the night and so on. So when I decided to get into clinical trials, I had to reduce my, my uh, clinical, clinical work, which means being in the theater, being in the clinic, being in, uh, you know, ward rounds and so on. I had to reduce that because you need time in clinical trials. You need to dedicate time. You need to dedicate time for your clinical trial team. You've got to have meetings. You have to have, you know, you have to have trainings of your, your investigators and so on. So you need a lot of time. There is no way you can combine full clinical work and the full clinical trial. So if you want, you can reduce your uh, uh, clinical work and then you have more time for clinical trial. And if you do it the other way around, that means you're just touching a bit of clinical trial to do more of clinical work. You're not really into clinical trial. So if you really want to go into clinical trial, real clinical trial, then you have to reduce your clinical work. Uh, so I had, to, I had to do that, which was very difficult at the beginning for me because I'm really a clinician in the theater, in the ward rooms, and so on. So I really had to switch to reduce the less of that because I'm still in a teaching hospital. I still teach students. I still have to uh, attend to some of my clinical work. But I reduced that and then I had to get into the clinical trial. Then, of course, you can't do that without funding. So you need to know how to write grants and get funds. Because clinical trial, you need funds. And you don't get funds from, you know, the institution. You get funds from, you know, uh, funders. So you've got to learn how to... How to, how to write grants, how to get grants, how to now get into a, 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 a clinical trial. So I, I think this just feels so that I can leave others to also discuss. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Kokunia. <laughs> uh, uh, sorry, Prof. Kokunia, would you like to uh, share with us uh, on your experience, especially uh, on the same topic, but uh, looking at adolescents, because you seem to have already started a number of trials in the adolescence group. Uh, are you also experiencing more male uh, participants than females? And I know you've shared some of the issues. Uh, Prof, could you elaborate a bit? Yes, I will thank you for, for the question. Um, actually, before I move on to adolescent, um, in pregnant women, may I touch a little bit that there is one also uh, challenge. Uh, recently, we submitted a protocol for uh, uh, treatment in MD of MDRTB in uh, pregnant women, and uh, we were rejected by the IRB. Actually, um, uh, it's for anyone, including pregnant women, and the IRB rejected the uh, pregnant woman group, meaning uh, answer to exclude pregnant women. And we uh, 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 have to explain to them that uh, uh, the drugs that we are going to use in the trial, at least uh, past uh, their preclinical phase, and uh, 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 that there's no uh, uh, fetal toxicity or anything. And pregnant women who come down with tuberculosis in the RTD is also difficult to treat. And having them into joining into the study uh, is a good opportunity for them. It's not easy. Uh, uh, to treat the MDRTB and it caused a lot of uh, uh, morbidity uh, uh, when it happened to pregnant women. So, so uh, my point is that it's not just the woman, the family, the investigators, but also the IRB. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> everyone seems to have problems with the pregnant women uh, 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 joining the clinical trials. Um, and uh, for adolescents, um, uh, female adolescents are. Uh, uh, less preferable uh, compared to male uh, in several ways, uh, particularly uh, 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 the matter about the uh, 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 potential pregnancy, becoming pregnancy. Uh, however, uh, as a pediatrician, we, um, we don't have uh, much of the problem dealing with the female adolescent because that's our regular work. We have to <laughs> to deal with uh, female adolescent a lot. Uh, so, um, but that's true. There are several uh, studies where they 
uh, intentionally don't want to enroll uh, a female. Um, uh, there's also uh, another uh, disallowing medicine, uh, such as the contraception, where if you're taking it, you cannot go in the study because of the drug drug interactions, so on. So, um, uh, yes, uh, the, uh, uh, um, the challenge has to be, you know, uh, well prepared, uh, uh, to, um, uh, manage when it comes to pregnancy, it comes to, uh, uh, counseling, uh, that's appropriate for, for teen, for adolescents. Uh, this is highly specialist, I would say. And in several ways, we use a lot of technologies. Uh, uh, adolescents, they love technologies. Uh, uh, adults, sometimes they, they want face to face. Adolescents, they love, they love, uh, uh, digital information. They, they love <laughs> something that less, uh, less, uh, pushing. Uh, they like something to be, um, you know, in their own pace, in their own style. So we have to be prepared, uh, for them. And, uh, for, uh, childbearing, uh, uh, women, um, they are quite sensitive. Particularly, they would worry about, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the balance of their life, their image, their, um, um, uh, responsibility and, and so on. They, 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 they're concerned about their beauty, their, uh, you know, their, uh, outlook and so on. So, so it's very challenging. But yes, we, we have to have a good, uh, uh, uh study team. Uh, to be able to manage them. Thank you, Prof. So the common themes that I'm hearing is you have to, of course, the dedication of the PI, uh, there are sacrifices that need to be done by the clinician, uh, especially when embarking in clinical trials in the marginal group. Uh, you need to have a strong team, um, a dedicated team, in fact, to support you. Uh, Dr. T, um, what are the general considerations of women wishes to participate in a clinical trial? Uh, this is overall, uh, even talking about normal trials, not even a pregnant woman. Um, could you elaborate a bit of Malaysia stand? Oh, yes, uh, thank you for the questions. So actually, I have been uh, working in uh, NPRA doing clinical trial for quite a number of years. So when I'm reviewing the, all the dossier, I don't feel what happens in the ground so uh, five years ago, so I back to study and I um, I uh, I start to have my uh, study similar uh, 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 pharmacokinetic study and metabolomic study, which require to recruit patients, uh, a sub healthy volunteer uh, to uh, take sample for uh, pharmacokinetic study. So I personally personally in, involved in the um, recruitment informed consent process. So in Malaysia settings, so I put my advertisements and then uh, there are about 50% of women and 50% uh, of men come to approach me. So I briefly explain the whole study procedures and everyone uh, seems like um, uh, quite happy with the studies and uh, mostly are students, uh, postgraduate students, and they're also very happy with the re uh, reimbursement. But uh, like... 50% of the male, they sign the informed consent form on the spot. But most of the women, they tell me, um, let me think about it first. I have to uh, discuss with my parents. So one of the uh, volunteers tell me, so um, I, I try to call my mom. Hey, mom, uh, today I, I attend this uh, informed, cons uh, informed consent uh, briefing sessions. So I, I'm thinking to involve in this study. Just three weeks, and I can des get this reimbursement uh, for my time and transportations. What What do you think? Then the mom, like the response is, why you be, why you want to become a lab rat? Are you broke? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so the mentality <laughs> is um yeah why 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 you want to trouble yourself to involve in clinical trial, and yeah and for my study or oh, uh. I, I didn't get even one female involved. Uh, my study is 18 subjects, all are male subjects. Yeah, and up. Yeah, this is my personal experience, but I, I, I don't know uh, in other settings. 
So in general, uh, as a regulator, regulator who re review the clinical trial, um, I, I personally think that if the study is approved by regulatory authority, so means that uh, the regulatory authority will eva evaluate the products, the IP, based on all the non-clinical studies, uh, and ensure that the manufacturing process, the quality of the IP are uh, up to the standards. And also, uh, the study have ethics committee approval. So from, the, from your local community, your ethics committee has reviewed the study protocol, and your community, the expert in your community, uh, uh, convinced about the study to be conducted at your setting. So in this case, I think um, yeah, the, 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 uh, anyone or woman, uh, you should not have the mental, mentality that you become a lab rat. Yeah. And also, uh, one thing is very important thing, if you want to involve in trial, especially for women, you really have to listen into the briefing sessions. You have to know whether you are in the inclusion criteria or exclusion criteria. So most of the trial, it's not saying that not allow child bear, uh, women of childbearing uh, potentials, but uh, if those women in this area, then you, ne you need to have a double contraceptive uh, 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 um, practice. Yeah. So if you agree on, on this term, then... Uh, and also, please read and sign your informed consent form. Yeah, many people, they just listen and then they, they, they don't read. So sometimes what you listen, might, you might misinterpret. And then if you can read your informed consent form and sign your informed consent form. Yeah, do remember, take a copy of your informed consent form. This is your agreement. So once if you have anything, ADR or anything happen to you, you can use this informed consent form to claim your insurance later. Yeah. So uh, beware if you sign electronic consent form. So make sure that you have a copy in your email. Yeah. So this is something that's very important. So also, uh, I would like to thank in Malaysia testing. We have uh, Clinical Research Malaysia CRM. They always organize the I'm Aware program to let everyone to know that uh, participating clinical trial is something great. You are contributing to the science. So I would like to urge all the women next time if you really see the advertisement and you want you you read the um, you go through the briefing sessions and you think that uh, you 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 want to uh, participate in the trial why not when you call your mom you just say hi mom I'm going to contribute to the society to the woman in the future yeah I think you, when you start with this sentence. Um, your parents sure will uh, have positive uh, respond to you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. T. Actually, I must say that we took a bit of convincing to get Dr. T on board, but she seems to have actually opened a whole uh, different perspective of how to convince women to participate to the, uh, to the nation and, and having this information available. Um, the question to all speakers, and I think we only have less than 10 minutes left. Uh, due to the complexity of designing cl clinical trials for pregnant women and endorsers, do you think, uh, someone has put out this question, do you think AI can help? Uh, <laughs> I don't know whether we are ready to, uh, well, let me try with Prof. Kulkenya. <laughs> uh, Prof. Uh, uh, oh, Prof. Adi, okay, Prof. Kulkenya, why don't you take this first? Is well, uh, I think I think AI will be very useful, particularly when it comes to adolescents. I think uh, adolescents would love AI more than human beings sometimes, <laughs> but not all the time. We have to have human beings, no matter what, to uh, you know uh, respond to them instantaneously when they have questions. But yes, AI would be very helpful, uh, particularly in some of the sensitive questions about their, um, you know, private life or, you know, uh, their relationship or something that's, uh, you know, uh, uh, regarding this but needed uh, to, you know, for the uh, participation into the trial. Uh, I think uh, we, we have one, one um, uh, uh, example, good example uh, of uh, trying to get the teenagers uh, 
um, uh, uh, learn about how to have uh, attitude behavioral uh, and risk reduction appropriate uh, behavioral uh, 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 attitude and risk uh, and sexual risk reduction and harm reduction. We found that when we uh, give like a uh, uh, person to person interview, we have a lot of uh, misinformation and biases, and uh, sometimes. Uh, you know, they don't tell you the truth. They they try to please you sometimes. <laughs> they, they give you the answer, you know, they expect that the doctor wants to hear. But when we uh, ask them to do akasi, you know, response on their own, and particularly when uh, we tell them that whatever that response, you know, we don't know who is who. We only want the summation of the response and uh, collectively. Oh, you know, you hear a different story. So uh, AI could be very important, particularly uh, uh, something that uh, uh, deal with sensitive issues. Yeah. Yes, I would think so. And even for AI, we would actually need the data to to put into the model. And uh, already in an area where we're already lacking information, uh, Prof Hadiza, any um, anything you would like to add? <laughs> Well, uh, I'm not sure AI and pregnancy because I don't know whether AI can can get pregnant and deliver. <laughs> so, that, that's so I, a good one. I, I, I think I think for pregnancy, uh, if you really want to have the effect on the fetus and the baby, you will have to use pregnant women, unfortunately. And you see, that's why we've got to convince, you know, the society. Whether it's the clinicians, whether it's the community people, whether it's the women, whether it's, uh, you know, the legal body, you've got to convince them that you need pregnant women to participate in trials because you need answers that are concerning pregnant women. And you can't get it from pregnant rat alone or rabbit and, uh, you know, AI. You've got to have the pregnant women to be, uh, you know, participants in a clinical trial. And that's, that's why the challenge is. So somehow, you know, the, the clinical trial community, uh, whatever it is, and all the stakeholders and all the interest group will really, really need to come to terms that we've got to know how to do clinical trials in pregnant women that are safe. Even the fetus itself uh, needs clinical trials to, to, to bring out a safe fetus out of the pregnant women. So so it's, it's something that is a moral responsibility for all of us as, uh, as clinicians and as clinical trial uh, community to, to, to put in place all the regulations and all the things that are required so that we can have safe, uh, uh, you know, clinical trials in pregnancy so that we can answer the many questions that are there that really concern pregnant women and only pregnant women can give us the answer. Yes, uh, I think... Uh, um, we've heard quite a bit about the challenges of conducting clinical trials uh, in pregnant women, in female adolescents, in females per se. Uh, so this may be a challenge that I would like to also put up to DNDI because they stand for drug for neglected disease. Uh, women are a very, um, I would say marginalized actually, uh, because there are not many clinical trials in this area, and this uh, is something that we all can come together as an as an Asian community or from the lower middle income countries, because it's also very difficult to recruit such patients. Um, one thing that I'm proposing is next year will be the 25th anniversary for the uh, Institute of Clinical Research, and our theme will be uh, very much uh, looking at clinical trials, and we will have a, a, a forum to discuss and see how we can brainstorm because there's a lot of areas, potential research questions. Prof. Ariza, I can actually then invite you to come over and uh, we can sit together and see uh, if there are potential areas of drugs to be developed for the pregnant women uh, who have been neglected. Uh, I'd like to thank the panelists, uh, Prof. Hadiza from Kano, uh, thank you, uh, Prof. Kulkanya from Siraj, and also our very own Dr. T here.
for coming together and enlightening many of us in the audience, uh, both here in Satya Alam and also in Thailand. Uh, thank you, everyone, and uh, we look forward to the next session. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, and do have a nice day. Hello. Okay. Thank you so much to our session three panelists. That was really exciting to hear. Um, very educational as well to see all the experiences from the different countries. And um, thank you, Datin, Dr. Shamini. Um, quite promising to hear that Malaysia might take more initiative to include pregnant women and adolescents into our clinical trials in the future. We will break now for a little uh, coffee break and reconvene here at 3.25 p.m. Thank you. 
It is a
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. We hope you had a fantastic break. I trust the coffee has done its magic, refreshing all of you for the rest of our event. So moving to the next session, we are delighted to introduce our distinguished guest of honour, Dr. Ami Fazlin Said Mohammad, who will be delivering a special address to share some key messages on behalf of MOH Senior Management and Dengue Alliance members on gender, inclusivity and diversity in scientific R&D. Dr. Fazlin is a newly appointed director of the Institute for Medical Research, NIH Malaysia, and she's a medical doctor who previously heads the Herbal Medicine Research Centre for nine years. Her involvement in herbal research started in 2001 with evidence-based reviews of medicine, herbs, and traditional and complementary medicine. The specialization in clinical pharmacology and pharmacometrics has won a equity in the design of product development pathway at both the preclinical research and clinical trials. She is the test facility manager for the in vivo good laboratory practice laboratory, IMR and CHES, the technical committee for the national research and development of herbal medicine, the Malaysian herbal monographs and the preclinical and clinical cluster apart from being a member in the main committees. She is a Deputy Chairman of the Medical Research Ethics Committee in the Ministry of Health and served as a member of the Scientific Review Panel for Phase 1 study and several committees regarding the development of traditional and complementary medicine in Malaysia. Recently, the launching of the Framework on Traditional and Complementary Medicine Research in Malaysia and the Guideline for Herbal Medicine Research were added to these achievements in propelling the research in this area forward. Ladies and gentlemen, without further delay, let us welcome Dr. Ami Fazlin to the stage. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera, salam Malaysia Madani and a very good afternoon. Um, I would like to give salutations to Mr. Jean-Michel Pedagnel, DNDI Southeast Asia Director, Datin Dr. Shamini Sivasampu, Director of the Institute for Clinical Research, NIH. Professor Dato Dr. Adiba Kamaruzaman from the Monash University, Malaysia. Representative from Mahidol University, and especially the, fac the Faculty of Medicine, Siri Raj Hospital. And also Dr. Nitaya from the Institute of HIV Research and Innovation, Thailand. I would like to thank uh, DNDI as the main organizer of this event and uh, wish you a fulfilling 20th anniversary and for many more anniversaries to come. I would like to thank all the co-organizers for the contribution and assistance uh, in this forum. Uh, today, um, we with this forum, we have shed light on the crucial aspect of scientific research and development, especially on the gender inclusivity and also the diversity. In a rapidly evolving world where innovation is the key to progress, it is imperative that we ensure our scientific endeavors are representative and inclusive. I believe this is not only significant for the success of an organization, but also significant for the advancement of science and technology as a whole. Diversity fosters a rich tapestry of perspectives. In scientific research, a diverse team brings together individuals with unique backgrounds, experiences, and ideas. This diversity of thought can lead to more innovative solutions, as different viewpoints challenge assumptions and push the boundaries of conventional thinking. In terms of the clinical studies, the diversity of patients would allow a robust results to be obtained, and thus implementation in the community would be much closer to what was predicted by the results and hold no surprise, not, not no less surprises down the line. As we know from today's discussion, uh, there is lack of studies involving women in pregnancy and I would also like to highlight one group uh, which is in the breastfeeding group as well because that uh, the, the woman is actually also feeding the uh, infant. Uh, this uh, exclusion actually lead, lead to a lack of data and knowledge in these particular groups. 
Furthermore, there are also specific groups of patients that has been highlighted this morning with specific infectious diseases that also needs to be addressed. Today, I think to wrap up this forum, we, we, we will be listening to prominent researchers who has brought changes to their field. We hope their sharing of their struggles and challenges will inspire more researchers and open more doors for studies that will be more inclusive of the special group uh, of women. Gender inclusivity is a pivotal aspect of diversity in the scientific realm. Historically, women has been underrepresented in science, technology, engineering, as well as in the mathematical fields. However, times are changing and it's our responsibility to actively promote and support gender inclusivity in scientific R&D. It's not just about achieving a numerical balance, it's also about recognizing and eliminating the barriers that may prevent talented individuals, regardless of gender, from contributing fully to our scientific endeavors. By embracing gender inclusivity and diversity in our R&D, we not only enhance our capacity for groundbreaking discoveries and also contribute to a more just and innovative world, let us actively promote inclusivity, break down barriers and create an environment where everyone, regardless of gender, can contribute to the scientific discoveries that will shape our future. I would also like to um, say that my um, my boss, uh, Datuk Dr. No Fariza, was supposed to deliver this part of speech. Actually, send her regards and also uh, uh, thankfulness for us to have been able to conduct this uh, forum together with uh, all our co-organizers. Thank you very much. A huge thank you to Dr. Ami for her special address on the forum. We will transition into our plenary session, Women in Science and their Contributions. This session will dive into the challenges faced by women in science, including mentorship, leadership, and biases. Chairing this panel discussion is Associate Prof. Dr. No Prenu, the Vice President for International Relations and Corporate Communications, Mahidol University, Thailand. We are privileged to welcome our distinguished speakers, Professor Datuk Dr. Adiba Kamaruzaman, President and Pro Vice Chancellor, Monash University, Malaysia. Prof. Adiba is an infectious diseases physician by training, is a passionate advocate for social justice, especially for HIV prevention, treatment, as well as care and drug policies. She presently serves as the chairman of the Malaysian AIDS Foundation and is also the founding chair of Rose Foundation, an organization that is committed to eliminating cervical cancer in Malaysia and regionally. At the international level, Professor Datuk Dr. Adiba Kamaruzaman is presently the vice chair of the WHO Science Council and is a member of the Global Commission on Drug Policy and the Global Council on Inequalities, HIV and Pandemics. Joining Prof. Adiba is Professor Dr. Krisana Krasintu, who is the president of Krisana Krasintu Foundation, a not-for-profit foundation for humanitarian, social and community works in Thailand and overseas. Her passion to increase access and affordability to life-saving medicines was evident when she was appointed as director of R&D Institute, the Government Pharmaceutical Organization, GPO, Ministry of Public Health Thailand. In 2023, she was awarded the Medical Scientist of the Year by the Medical Sciences Foundation and Department of Medical Sciences for her dedication for, to the development of ARV and anti-malarial drugs benefiting Thailand and other countries around the world. Next in line, we have Professor Dr. Walasini Sakkam Duang, Dean at Faculty of Veterinary Science, Mahidol University. She is an experienced lecturer with a demonstrated history of working in the higher education industry and strong education professional with a PhD focused in veterinary cardiology from Royal Veterinary College, University of London. She also previously served as the president of the Veterinary Practitioner Association of Thailand, chair of Thailand One Health University Network and chair of Southeast Asia One Health University Network. Last but not least is Professor Dr. Rofina Yasmin Othman, 
who is the chairperson of Malaysian Research Accelerator for Technology and Innovation Meranti Malaysia and is also a council member of the Academy of Sciences Malaysia as well as an honorary professor at the Institute of Advanced Studies, University Malaya, Malaysia, having served at the university as an academic researcher and administrator for more than 30 years. She was also chairperson of life science venture firm Zeraya Capital and founder of Leaf Edge Technologies, an innovation platform focusing on promoting uptake of advances in plant science R&D. This session promises to be enlightening and insightful as we explore the pivotal role of women in science. With that, let's welcome Prof. Dato Dr. Adiba and Prof. Dr. Rofina Yasmin to the stage to begin the session. Professor of another colleagues, Professor Prisana Raisintu, and also Professor Velasini, and also Professor Rafina Yasmin. Um, we are here in um, Mahiro University International College here, and we have our, our students here as well on site um, listening to today's sessions. And uh, without further ado, um, because um, the MC has kindly um, <coughs> mentioned about the qualifications and the history experiences of all the speakers. So I would like to encourage our students here and also all distinguished guests who are online at the moment um, to be actively participate in the sessions by either asking, asking questions or engaging with our speakers later on. So uh, without uh, further ado, and I, I think I have only one hour left for the sessions, um, Today's sessions, the final sessions, um, the role of women in science, I would like to um, divide all the discussion into three parts. The first one, I would like to ask about the background of each speaker and their impressions about science in their um, time. And also, I would also like to address um, the difficulties or challenges coming um, forward for those who would like to continue on in their career as scientists. And lastly, uh, what kind of leadership and mentorship that we could offer our students here, our young students here, our young um, female students who would like to pursue their career in science. So that would be definitely the things that we are going to discuss in this one hour. So um, let me first um, give you one, um, the, the first question. I, I would like to actually know what inspired you to pursue a career in science, and were there any particular female scientists who influenced you at all when you were young? Can I start with um, um, our colleagues, uh, Dr. Adiba, please? Yes, good afternoon. Um, greetings <coughs> from Kuala Lumpur. Um, I guess I, I, I consider myself an accidental scientist. Um, you know, both Yasmin and I went to the same school that um, it was a, 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 I have to say, an elitist boarding um, school for girls that put a lot of emphasis on excellent education and, and science. And I think we just got funneled into the, at least I felt like I was being funneled into a science stream and um, did reasonably well in high school, went over to Monash University in Australia and did medicine. So I, I was never one of those people who, you know, wake up every morning and want to be a, neuro, a brain surgeon, an orthopedic surgeon or a Nobel Prize winner. I just kind of fell into it. Um, and as I was training to be a physician, an infectious disease physician, that was a time that HIV AIDS was really um, uh, becoming known. And your next question is what inspired you? I worked with some really, really inspiring clinicians um, in the field of, of HIV, and I think that's how I, I then got involved in the early clinical trials for antiretrovirals, um, for Lamivudin, for, for 3TC, the Concord trial. I mean, those of you who do HIV, you know that that feels like 100 years ago, but it was, it was about 30 years ago. And um, I think from then on, um, developed a, a 
a passion for for research around um, chemical research and, and public health research. Okay, and can I move on to Adan Prisana, please? Good afternoon. I'm sorry for the improper addressing now because I've just come back from the forest. You know, I work in the forest. So initially, I I didn't want to be a pharmacist. I didn't want to be anything or any scientist. I wanted to be a conductor. But of course, my family was in the medical background. My father was a doctor, my mother a nurse and all like that. So I, I just studied pharmacy and that's it. So uh, when I went to the UK to continue my studies, I, I just really, I wanted to help the community. So I think the only way to help the community is to improve your technology. That's why I study instrumentation. So I'm actually a, a pharmaceutical chemist expert in all the instruments and that's that's the way to go uh, forward to the community so i started working with hiv aids medicine in 1992 and thailand was the first uh, developing country to develop uh, this uh, act for mother to child transmission in 1995 and then in 2002 i left thailand and working in african countries because i believe that uh, uh, local production is a long-term solution. So one should have uh, local production so that they can provide uh, access to treatment to everybody. I think it's a basic human right, really, because everybody should get uh, access to treatment. And then after that, when everybody was uh, able to get access to treatment in some of African countries, I worked in 17 African countries for 12 years. And uh, after that, I, come back, I came back to Thailand. And uh, the way to help uh, local communities and poor Thai people all over the Thailand. That is to put the technology into the into the products or into the plants that they are producing. So that's why now I'm moving around Thailand, working like a gypsy, but because I'm, I'm called a gypsy pharmacist. And that's it. So my life is a little bit different than others because uh, I didn't want to be a scientist. I just wanted to be a conductor. But now I just, yes, I, I can be a conductor, conduct the uh, what, musical to, to everyone in the forest. So that, that's, that's my life, really, very short. Okay, in a very short, um, um, a very brief session, you can summarize what you have been through <laughs> as a scientist um, yeah. in Thailand, yes. Yeah. Uh, then, uh, Professor Vilasani, um, can I get your input, please? Yes, actually, I would like to start that my fascination in science starting early when I was in primary school. When I was a kid at grade three, perhaps, uh, I asked a teacher uh, that why buffalo or cattle eat glass, while we don't, or even dogs and cats, they don't eat glass at all. Whenever I saw dogs and cats eat glass, they seemed to be vomiting after that. Well, that time, I didn't get the answer. That is my curiosity, but you need to imagine that during that time, there was no internet, and then the computer, uh, first version of computer haven't started yet. And I keep that in the question for such a long time. And later on, I uh, study in the uh, high school, my, I would say my mentor, the, the first person that inspired me in science, she's a teacher in physics. And I enjoy learning a lot, and then she explained things easily and motivate me to even expand my thoughts more. And then during that time, I learned that why cattle eat glass rather than uh, uh, why, uh, but, but human don't eat glass at all for uh, a meal. And with that, it's uh, when I think back to that time, I imagine that, oh, my teacher in physics, she seems like to address this kind of thing like, uh, if you read a book called Sapien, a brief uh, 
a brief history of humankind. Yes, we starting uh, the life by physics, later in chemistry, biology, and so on. And then I would say, ooh, my inspiration first from the physics. And then why I become a veterinarian? Yes, it was a, wrong, uh, a, a very long history. And actually, I, uh, the thing that inspired me, because my background is a farmer. My family doing uh, farmer uh, on swine. But, but right now, we uh, discontinued that, that, that farm already. And then with that, I try to make sure that uh, we have a good production of our farm. And then thinking of, OK, we having these animals uh, to be a food for humankind. And then we need to raise them with care and in animal welfare. Therefore, I chose my career to be a veterinarian. And then my, my life changed again by having such a good mentor in the veterinary school uh, with the uh, professor of pharmacology and uh, toxicology that she motivated me a lot to learn and understand more in, in my career. And then during the time I, I study, I just doing and then see things and then question many things that I, I should ask. And, and, and with that, it fulfilled me with the activities and, and, and learning in class and so on. And then with that, uh, later on, I joined the, uh, one of the women, a woman veterinarian who is very famous. She, she just uh, uh, been promoted to be the uh, president of World Small Animal Veterinary Association. Yes, I'm talking about my boss, my first boss, and my special teacher in the school, uh, Dr. Surya Chun Kamlai. She is the first woman who was promoted to be the leader of the World Small Animal Veterinary Association which is the association of associations all around the world. And then she taught me a lot, and then I learned, and she inspired me a lot to be a veterinarian and doing my job still now. Yes, that's all about Okay, Dr. Rafina. Oh, I'll keep my, my story short, because like Adiba, I'm also an accidental scientist. And, and actually, I'm quite, um, uh, you know, um, not to say surprise, but the stories that I've heard from all three um, eminent women sort of show that uh, all of us are, are don't really uh, choose to be in science, really. And, and this is an interesting phenomenon when we talk about women in science and girls in STEM, you know. But all of us choose to stay in science. Uh, and, and a lot of it is because we are quite inspired by the impact science can make in in our life, you know, and uh, you know, I was a, a microbiologist, then a virologist, uh, inspired by many many people. Uh, I started in medical virology, but you know, I, I'm a little bit queasy with blood, so I did I did uh, change my um, focus uh, to working with uh, plants and plant viruses and 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 looking at novel uh, way to control uh, diseases in plants and. Um, along the way, you know, I got really fascinated by how science and advances in science really give us the opportunity to really look at how uh, we can chart our future in terms of uh, whether we talk about, about food, whether we're talking about health, and um, you know, it, it's it's um, it's been a, a really exciting journey uh, to be a scientist and. My first choice, and you know, I, I sympathize with my conductor. Um, really, I wanted to be an artist. I, I really wanted to, uh, you know, to paint and draw. And I was not the best of science students, and I think Adiba can tell you that uh, it was not my best subject. But really, you know, I do not regret a single second of being in science now. 
because it's it is as creative a field as painting as music you know it is orchestrating information and knowledge and really uh, putting it to impact so yeah uh, inspired by many 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 keep being inspired by everybody around me as well thank you Thank you so much. The reason I asked this question is because I would like to uh, all four of you um, to start off um, with the inspiration for our students here and also from our, uh, for our audience online, because I think we all have different dreams and we all start off differently. But at the end, I, I, I kind of like um, um, Professor Rufinus um, mentioning about we choose to stay. We might not choose to be a scientist. Um, so um, on a high sign is not by design. Some of you uh, come over to, to this profession by accident, but you choose to stay on it. And that I think um, is kind of very inspirational. And we will um, listen, we will keep um, listening to all of you four um, further why why you choose to stay on. I, I think we will come up with the um, conclusion later on. Let me move to um, another issue. Um, as women, do you think um, that there are any challenges or pressing issues you have personally faced in your career throughout these past years as a sci as scientist? Can I um, start off with Ajahn Krishna, please? Uh, yes and no. Yes, because when I was working in Africa since 2002, you know, traveling alone in African countries in those days is a bit difficult. And, and, and you are alone, traveling on your own, and you, you look for colleagues from the place where you are working. So that, is, uh, that was difficult. But, but the work is it's okay. I mean, I can work alone, I can conduct. And they can ask people to, to help me and I teach them how to uh, manufacture medicine. And that's, that's no problem at all. Because I, I never feel that I am a pharmacist or I am a woman or anything. I just feel that I am a human being. You know, to study pharmacy or study instrumentation, just a mean for me to help people. And that's all. So I think I achieved my dream. But of course, it's a bit difficult in working in those areas, in those countries, because I work in 12 African countries, of course, there are 17 countries, but I, I was able to set up the manufacturing uh, facilities in 12 countries. It was difficult. In some countries, I spent five years there uh, teaching them 10 times to manufacture drugs. It's not, it's not difficult, but, but it's very easy to communicate with them. And being a woman, I think it's a little bit difficult because they feel that uh, uh, women should not uh, play this role or whatever. I don't know, but, I, but that's not a problem for me if I want to do it. I do it. So that's it. That's, that's, that's the only uh, problem with me. But in Thailand, you know, working with your tribe people all over Thailand, of course, they speak different language. They don't speak Thai, they speak their own dialect. But that does not matter to me. And uh, I, can, I can go around using experience that I work in African countries, then that's it. I can tell one thing from listening to you. You are very determined throughout your career. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yes. very determined to help yeah. out with the community uh, to yes. um, well, provide solutions to to all other human beings that I can yeah. sense from, from what you're yes. saying. And I am an artist, I'm not a scientist. So <laughs> let me tell you again, you can, yes, I, I got my professorship by being a scientist, but actually I'm an artist. But being an artist, you know, you can have so many inventions that you can help people. So my, my right brain works very, very much better than my but and then my left brain, so that I may be different <laughs> than others. <laughs> right, you're still a conductor and not a scientist. Uh, yes, that's right. But I'm still uh, uh, playing musical instruments. You know, <laughs> I want to go around the world I mean, in this August, and uh, I just want to to paint and want to use my instrument, a musical instrument, of course. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, over to you, uh, Professor Rafina. Do you think you have faced any challenges at all? throughout your career? Uh, you know, I've been very fortunate in always being in an environment which is very supportive of women. Um, and and I, I haven't felt uh, really externally much discrimination. And, and I think Malaysia, you know, we are blessed. You know, uh, we do give a lot of opportunities. However, I, I do have um, maybe um, 
a little disclaimer on that, is in that sometimes uh, we are still um, individually really uh, constrained by our own um, self uh, and our own um, perception of a role as women in um, in our society, for instance, you know. So, uh, and when I was younger, I really felt that it was difficult for women uh, to be assertive, for instance, in the Asian culture. Um, and as you get older, you know, you get <laughs> less uh, hung up uh, by this, and you also uh, learn to uh, be more confident. But I think it's an, uh, I, I'm not sure it's just Asian thing, but um, I do feel sometimes women um, constrain themselves um, uh, in terms of uh, how they put themselves forward. And I certainly, um, not necessarily was brought up in a very conservative um, environment. And I had an incredible school which uh, did not hold uh, any barriers for girls to move forward. But still, I, I felt a, a cultural difference, which um, to me was my own um, constraint and my own issue uh, in developing as an Asian uh, woman from an Asian culture uh, in, in an environment where you need to be really successful, you need to be really more communicative, more expressive. Uh, and um, I think uh, exposure has helped me a lot. But um, yeah, in short, you know, sometimes the constraints that we have uh, could be uh, from within uh, and not really because of any external discrimination. Yeah. If I may, I can speak to that. I mean, I may be the vice chair of the WHO Global Science Council, which is ostensibly a, a very, um, a very illustrious group of people. And I still, to this day, constantly think, what am I doing here amongst these 11 sort of, um, you know, very, very um, accomplished scientists? I mean, it's chaired by Harold Bummer's um, former NIH director and Nobel Prize winner. So. The imposter syndrome is really, really real. Uh, every single meeting of the Global Science Council, the WHO Science Council I go to, I'm like, what am I doing here? I don't deserve to be here. Um, I, I don't know whether it's an inherently female trait or whether it's a combination of being a woman plus an Asian that we don't kind of naturally put ourselves forward. But I, I hear you, Yasmin, and... Um, uh, yeah, I I, uh, I sort of uh, identify with it, um, definitely. And how, how did you two overcome um, those hurdles, apart from the fact that um, once you get older and you manage to go through, um, no, I, I, like you I said, lace I, through the storm. How, how did you I overcome? Have a, I, I go to every meeting like having this imposter syndrome um, feeling. So I think getting over it means meant that I have to be very prepared for the meeting. That I have to, uh, you know, be sure what the agenda is. Be sure what my my um, talking points are going to be ahead of it. Be sure that you know, be, be on top of things because um, I don't want, you know, the, the, the feeling that I'm not good enough for this committee to kind of show its head, right? So you've got to go there and be prepared and, um, and participate. And, and if I may share, I mean, one of the traits well, that um, women are associated with is always this need to apologize before, you know, and, 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 um, and there's been lots of studies that show this. You know, psychologists have shown that women um, do not want to impose their views on others. So, so they, 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 the study showed that a lot more women start the a conversation with, um, you know, with an apology uh, when trying to put forward a point. And, and I think I was one of one of those. You know. Uh, so the ability to, to break that and to build self-confidence, I think, is a very important trait that we need to be really aware of. Yeah. 
And just to tell our students here as well that not only you that feel in, in confidence, um, you don't have any confidence in, in front of the teachers or in front of the classroom, even um, successful um, scientists such as um, all four of them, probably they have the same symptoms as well, so it's pretty normal. Okay, just to tell you that it's pretty normal to be excited in front of the classroom or anywhere you are exposed to. So, Professor Valasini, what, what, what about you? You have any challenges at all in your life? Oh, I, it was, I, I would say it was in the beginning since uh, the limitation of number of students, veterinary students into school. In my time, it was limited just only uh, 20% and and then three or four years later it's why versa uh, because they're free because they of the human right that time I come say come on to to the university that you need to change policy to uh, to allow women uh, to be in the veterinary school however uh, since the time of the challenges and and so on I, I would like to say that I I was in the age that uh, the number of or the proportion of veterinary, uh, veterinarian who is in female uh, is very smaller uh, proportion compared to male. But this time is why versa uh, about 80% of veterinary students are female. I'm proud of that. And 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 even we um and and when we look through the other uh, uh, profession uh, close to us, this, they're the same. And then sometime I, my, my colleagues uh, uh, came to me, particularly uh, the male colleagues came to me and said that, where are male they doing at the <laughs> moment? And, and then that, that's because in my career, uh, I, 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 I would like to address that we taught people to be uh, more humankind, like uh, make women stronger and make um, men softer or politer. That that's the the career uh, that that we have, and and then so the challenges and and so on for female in my career, uh, I we we don't think we see any problems with that. I think it's in terms of the proposal. Yeah, please, Adina. So, sorry, Madam Chair. I think, you know, one real um, handicap, if you like to call it that, is the biological clock of us women, you know, when the career is, is taking off, whether, you, whether it's in medicine or whether you're doing a PhD, um, is when you know you start falling in love, you start finding your life partner, you want to have children, um, and all of that. And that's a real, real problem. Um, and also, you know, as as we get um, more advanced in our career, then comes um, the the caregiving uh, issue of elderly parents that often fall onto the onto women. So, you know, although. I, I think, as, as, as Yasmin has stated, some of us are, are very lucky in having supportive environment that, have, that has allowed us to be where we are, whether it's in our families or it's in the workplace. But you know, we can't run away from the fact that the, the biological clock um, and the race towards a, a career advancement kind of collide. And that's where most women although you have 50% women entering universities or more in Malaysia and in many other places, getting on to leadership positions, you, you see the drop off. Um, I mean, I just saw some recent figures published in, in, in Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences, no less, that it's still less than 50% of, of women holding leadership positions in science. So. No, you know, it's, it's something that uh, we need to continue to talk about. We can need to continue to find ways um, to make changes. Yeah, I totally agree. I think the stereotyping of women uh, and what we, can, what we should do, what we can do 
And um, well, when you talked about the biological clock, um, who said that we have to stop working at 35 and have kids, right? But, but I think um, those are questions which still exist until now, that uh, once you get your PhD, that's the end of your career because um, you have to move on getting married and then have kids. Um, I think those kind of discourses are still there nowadays, even nowadays. And, and um, by having said that, um, what, what do you think um, from your experience, um, Professor Krishna, for example, how, how would you tell your kid, if you have any, I don't know, how would you tell families or how you will be able to educate families and people surrounding those kids, those youngsters, to, to understand the role of women in society nowadays? How, how would you correct the stereotype? Hey. My situation may be different from others. I, I determined to be single and I determined to help people since I graduated, well, PhD from UK. And that's it. So, so I'm single and I can move around freely like, like a gypsy because, because I'm single. That's it. Because that, that was determined sometimes ago on my life. And I determined it myself. And then I'm, I'm happy for what I am. And so I don't, I don't have anything to be worried. I have a family, yes. My, my mother, my, my parents both uh, passed away some time ago. I'm from Samui Island. So I, I live a very comfortable life. I mean, if I chose that way, but I wouldn't choose that, that, life, that life. So I left my home and then I just move around like this. You know, I work in African countries on my own as sponsorship. Of course, nobody spent pay for me to go to Africa, but I like it and I wanted to do it. I, so this is this is just my own determination. So I may be, may be different from other people. So don't just uh, count me as one of them. I, I may be from alien from outside the world. That's it. <laughs> She's not suggesting you should be single, guys. No, 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 no. no. I never, <laughs> I never suggest that. anybody to. No, 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 right. no, no. You know the advantage, the disadvantage of being single. Right, 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 right. Mm -hmm. It's just the benefit of being single. You don't have. Um, uh, you have you don't have to worry about anything, and you can go around the world. It, well, yeah, I that's right. yeah. That's right. So, uh, uh, Professor Valasini, is it differently? Uh, have you <laughs> faced any different experience regarding this? I, I uh, since I uh, uh, answered the, the question, that, yes, in the beginning of my career, I, I faced the situation that. Uh, uh, of like a uh, difficulty to work uh, in uh, together with uh, male and how, I, how do you how, how did you educate <laughs> them? I have to use this word. How, how how do you usually educate male colleagues to understand the role and to accept you as you are? Okay, I provide a, an example because I I used to work in acquire uh, racing, racing track in Bangkok, which is the in at Royal Bangkok Sport Club. And about 20 years ago, I, I started my career there. And then as a veterinarian in the in the race track, the, the, the racing, it was every Sunday. And uh, in the race track, there are many males uh, who are uh, who owned a race horse and then came to me very often that what did I do with that horse or why you need to inspect There's so many questions around. And then I, because I was young that time and then I need to be patient and then smiling and then explaining to them. And then it, take, it took me about two or three years to get them accepted what, what my role there. And, and, and I, I thought that that the, the hard time of, of my career, but later on things get better with that. And apart from educating our colleagues, if we have to do that still, and apart from, um, well, keep the families and neighbors and also friends informed about the ability of women as scientists. Uh, may I also um, pass over the question to our colleagues in Malaysia. In Malaysian context, do you have um, 
kind of effective or supporting programs by the government or by the community to support um, female scientists? Um, I'm not sure there are any specific programs, but, but um, I, I think there's been a, a, a lot of uh, sympathy to, or empathy to uh, women or mothers who have to be in the workplace anyway, at least um, that, that, I, that, I, that I see. I mean, I started, um, well, I started a family really late. I was uh, kind of a, a single scientist for a long time, enjoying the long hours, you know, being able to work when I want, uh, as uh, Prof uh, mentioned. Um, and I just couldn't understand this, this, this uh, you know, when I saw my uh, married colleagues you know, rush off in the middle of the day because taking children to clinic or, you know, having to go and do sports day, it, it was beyond me until I had my, until I had children. And, and that, then I, I did see um, really, you know, uh, that the responsibility of the family uh, still lay, lay um, even in, uh, in Europe uh, where, where I worked for a time, um, lay on women. And a supportive environment, uh, whether it's having um, facilities for children, uh, whether it's um, having uh, accommodation uh, near science. Scientists, we, we, we have to spend time in our work. You, there's no such thing as a nine to five scientist, to be, to be really honest. And, you know, I mean, we, there, there's, there's not really a such thing as a nine to five scientist. But uh, there's also an audio problem. Uh, are they missing uh, volume? Volume. We can hear you now. Can you hear? Yeah, you can no, hear me. It's okay now. Yeah, and I, th I think more important than institutional support, of uh, of course, uh, having a workplace that understands the needs of um, family uh, is good. But a family that is supportive, I think, is is critical. I mean, it was so much so that at, at one point, you know, when I take a postgraduate, a PhD student uh, who who is a woman, I would insist on meeting the husband. And I made all this, you know, I, I made a point of asking him to promise that he was going to be supportive in terms of time, in terms of, you know, uh, shared uh, care of children, you know. But 90% of the time, it doesn't work. The reality is that the women take responsibility for family, whether it's nature, whether it's nurture, whether it's cultural. That's the reality, right? So um, having a supportive environment that enables you to work around this, I think, is, is, is very important. And, uh, and, and understanding from all parts. I mean, I, 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 I'm, I, disclaimer, I had a very easy time in my life. Uh, it's very supportive. A uh, husband, very supportive family who looked after my children while I worked long hours. So. But not um, not many are as lucky, I think. Yeah. Adiba? yeah. So I mean, this this is going to come across as very facetious, but um, to those who are not yet married, uh, be careful who you choose. Not the, your husband, but your mother-in-law, because as you heard from Yasmin, having that support supportive environment is so, so important. And, and in the Asian context, that extended family is, is everything, right? I mean, like we all work long hours, we all travel overseas. And, and for me, the comfort of having that extended family to look after young children was, was, uh, was is um, uh, in incredibly important. So yes, when you're out there looking at your prospective husband, check on their, their mothers before. <laughs> <laughs> before saying yes, are they going to be supportive or not? Yeah, so you have, it comes down to only two choices, um, all students here. Be single, or you choose wisely who you are going to get married, okay? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I, I think this question is really important as well. Um, I, I think um, our youngsters here, our young students here, 
Um, even my kids um, at home, they've started to ask this question whether they would be able to pursue their career in science. And um, one of the things that I encourage my, my, my kids um, has always been that go for it because um, you get a total support from your family and um, probably like uh, Professor Krishna just mentioned, um, you think about what you would like to do in the future is about yourself, it's not about other people. And I asked my kids as well, why do they want to pursue the career in science? What's good for them? And I, I started off by asking those kind of questions and, and let them know that they have to be able to answer the questions by themselves. But true, um, I, I totally agree that um, the ecosystem, both the institutional support from the government, from the community, from the school, and also from the workplace, um, those are critical criteria for um, us being success, being successful in our um, scientific career. Um, I think we have like uh, around 15 minutes more. Let me go through to the final question, the inspirational part. Each of you, if I ask if you could communicate, if you could inspire our students here in, in Mahidon University, and I believe that there are some other students there online, if you could actually inspire them to pursue the career in science or um, to finally consider themselves a scientist in the future, what would be your message to them? Can I start off with Ajahn Walasini, please? Actually, um, I would like to say the first one to identify yourself, listen to your heart and make it clearly and then follow that way. You may say that, oh, what I should do when I, I, I think wrong or the, the decision I made, it was wrong. So I think start and counting again start to uh, count one, two, three again. So at least one thing that you should follow to listen to yourself, listen to your heart, and then follow your dream. OK. Um, Adina and Professor Sofina. Passion, passion. At the end of the day, whatever you do, uh, you need to really be excited by what by what you choose. You know, so um, I I didn't think I would love science as much as I did, but you know, as um, you discover uh, new things, as as you as you learn and, and meet more people, you develop the passion in. in your work, you know, um, and and I think science to be really vested in science is you need to have a real interest in in in, in what you're doing, um, and a, perhaps also a vision on where your work, you know, will make an impact, you know, um, somewhere at some point in time. Yeah, so. I totally agree. It has to come from the heart, you know, and, and then you'll be successful. Medina? Yeah, so totally agree with those two. 30%, well, 100% passion, 100% um, having that vision of where it's, it's going to lead to. It cannot be about money. Um, and because all the things that we, we talked about kind of um, speaks to the path is not always um, straightforward and easy. So being resilient and having the patience to see it through or to achieve what, what the final goal you want to achieve. I mean, I, I happen to have chosen, through passion, um, fields that are not kind of um, terribly sexy. I suppose HIV is kind of sexy, but drug use um, you know, illicit drug use is not particularly sexy, all these marginalized uh, communities. Um, but, and, and so the road has not been so straightforward and easy, but 
um, I think that's part of the challenge that's, you know, with every little win that you have, um, it's worth celebrating. And so the, the patience to kind of um, continue to do um, because you know what you're doing is the right thing to do. Um, and hopefully one day it will, it will all come together. So, yeah, passion, resilience, um, and, and, you know, wanting to do the right thing for, for mankind. Before going to Professor Krishna, because I believe that she will have a lot of inspirational messages to, to all students and also <laughs> audience, may I get back a little bit to, to <coughs> Professor Adina and uh, Rafina as well? Do you think men mentorship and support networks would, would be the, one of the most important um, factors um, of nurturing young scientists, especially women? Yeah, I, I think mentorship is really important. Um, and different institutions, different places have had mentorship programs. So it can be it can be structured, it can be formal mentorship, but I am pretty sure most of us in the room here would say that mentorship come from sometimes places that you you didn't even realize, right? And and it doesn't have to be a, another woman, it doesn't even have to be someone in the field um, uh, and it can be a collection of people that you bounce ideas that you you know vent to and and so but i completely agree that some kind of mentorship is is really important and teamwork yeah ab absolutely i think um, the, the concept of a, a mentor it, it's not necessarily as anybody said somebody in your field that you look up to, but uh, really people who ins inspire you, and and I think having role models for young women uh, is is really important, and and we should have a, a variety of role models uh, from a variety of fields. Uh, so so you know if you are doing a mentor mentorship program, I do encourage that you bring a diversity of women uh, or even men. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because uh, you know, ins inspiration comes in many forms. Yeah, but and and you know, in our life or in my <coughs> life, I've had a, a, a wide variety of mentors who have really helped me not, um, to shape, you know, the way I think, and and I, I think it's a really important um, way. But um, in iconic uh, iconic women and to inspire you as well. Thank you. Definitely. Yeah, Professor Krishna, coming back to you. <laughs> yes. So I may be different from others. You know, all of my 12 years working in African countries, in 17 African countries, I work in Eastern Africa, Central and Western African countries, speaking on different languages. But there's one word that runs through all African countries. That word is Ubuntu. You may, you may hear this word before. Ubuntu means I am because we are, or humanity towards others. This is very important that I like to convey the message to, to everyone of us, of course. Uh, you know, in Thailand, we also have this. In Africa, they use feet, their feet together, put their feet together and uh, pronounce Ubuntu. But in Thailand, especially in Northwest Thailand, in Ta province, with Hill tribe people, Pakakaya uh, Hill tribe, uh, they use their hands. The same is the same thing. So this is to show the commonality between uh, Africa, African countries, and Thailand. So just one last word is I am because we are our humanity towards others. That's it. Okay. Thank you. That's that. All of your last words were very wise. And may I also ask if. There are any questions from the floor, from our side, and also from your side as well. I cannot see who who are there in in the audience in Malaysia. But if there are any questions, please do let us know. I can actually accommodate, entertain um, a few questions before we end the sessions. Uh, I think is. Um, on the chat line, but I cannot read. 
They said no questions. <laughs> okay. Are there any questions from our side, um, kids? <laughs> I thought it was a question, but actually that was no question. If there is no question, I, I just have one last question myself. Do you think the future, what holds for the future for, for, for women in science? All of you, uh, you think the, the possibilities are really good uh, for women in this um, field, in this STEM, in this um, scientific field? If I may, I, 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 yeah, I, please go ahead. Yeah, I don't know if this is specific to Malaysia and, and what the situation in Thailand is like, but I actually worry for the future of science full stop, whether it's male or female. Um, at a time when science has become more and more exciting, right, um, with, with what's happening in, in, in computers, in digital technology, um, in molecular, you know, everything molecular, but the interest, um, at least in Malaysia, in going into um, science and technology, even continuing on into university, um, has declined. Um, the numbers keep showing that the number of um, students leaving school, entering university, is um, reducing. So I think, um, you know, rather than looking at, well, uh, just the female side, it's, it's what do we do about improving the interest in science in general? Because I think with young people wanting instant gratification, um, they would rather go and open a, a hip, stir a coffee shop somewhere and you know slog in a, in a laboratory and, and do science. Uh, my own children, they're going to die if they know I'm talking about them. Both actually, um, both actually did science. One did biology and the other did chemistry, um, which is unusual for boys, right, <laughs> to start off with. But uh, they, they did their first degree, one in biology and the other in, in chemistry. The one who did chemistry then went to do law and now wants to, you know, earn lots of money, mum, and, and become a, 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 an investment lawyer, or whatever it is that he's, he's heading towards, and the other one um, towards environment and, and, um, and uh, digital. So, um, yeah, um, I think we, the, the pursuit for financial um, gratification, unfortunately, I think is, is greater than um, the pursuit for, for science and knowledge and, and the hard road that it leads. So it, it goes back to remuneration and, and all kinds of societal, how society in general views science uh, in the first place. So I guess I did something right because all my kids said they would like to, to live in a lab. So I guess I, I might, must have done something Right <laughs> about communicating to my stu uh, to my children, um, uh, Professor Krishnaha, what yes. future holds for you for science? Oh, you know, I have told everybody that I have no future. So <laughs> my future is what I'm doing. What my future is what I'm doing today. You know, the, the possibilities is there. It's always there, depending on yourself whether you choose which way that you are choosing. So I have chosen my life, and I have no future. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Malasini. Uh, difficult for me to tell uh, for the future, but I would say that equality in gender is important, and, and even in science, I, I, I believe that it will become to be more equality in gender. Rufina, do you have any last word or um, just just uh, just want to you, you know I'm also worried about science, but it, it's uh, surprising that that um, less young people want to do science in a world so driven by scientific technology and discovery, and and I think we don't maybe um, stress enough the relationship between how we got to this 
this stage, you know, I mean, the science behind it and um, the discovery behind it. And, you know, a, a lot more girls are going into science in Malaysia, but how many are actually going into science after after a higher degree? And a, a little bit, again, it, it's about the lack of correlation to me between learning science and actually um, earning money or seeing the relationship between, um, I don't know, progress or, or uh, and, and, uh, and the pursuit of science. It, it's, it's really I quite see. baffling, really, to, to see the disconnect between, between the two. So I don't know where we're heading um, with science now. Um, and, you know, more girls do science, more, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, your boys are quite amazing. My, both my boys are not doing science. But, but um, it, it, it means that we are also losing, in terms of gender, the input from boys into the scientific profession. Because it's much harder to become a scientist if you don't have the, the basics. And, you know, it, it, it's just um, something's got to change about how we, we portray science and how we portray science in this current day and age. Yeah. Yeah, and from all of your wise words, um, I think it comes down to the conclusion that it's everybody's responsibility. Uh, I'm not a government official. Um, I'm not saying that I could actually push forward any policies, we have to ask our respective governments how they're going to, um, well, support, um, well, to provide more structural support for science uh, in our respective countries. As a teacher, as a lecturer, I would say that, like Professor Walasini just mentioned earlier, early on in the sessions that she got inspired by her teacher. So as a lecturer, as lecturers, as educators, as teachers, uh, I think that we all have the responsibility to inspire our students that um, they have their own ways in their science, um, scientific career. And as individual, as um, a mother or as a father, because um, at the end, this is not only the problems of female, um, female um, scientists in, in the clusters of, um, in the scientific cluster, but also this is um, the kind of very pessimistic way of looking at science that even male um, scientists, their futures are, are um, uh, very, very, uh, like very cloudy, very uh, gloomy. Uh, I would say that as individual, we have to educate ourselves more, perhaps, before we could actually educate our children and let them know that um, whatever way they would like to pursue, whatever career they would like to pursue, is our job to support them. Whether they would like to be single, like Professor Krishna, <laughs> or they would have to think um, um, ahead, <laughs> who they want to get married, um, I, I think is everyone's responsibility. So, and that comes to um, the conclusion of the sessions. Thank you so much for um, all kind words and all inspirations from both sides, from um, our Thai colleagues and also our Malaysian colleagues. Uh, I really hope that our students here, uh, our audience online, will get inspired somehow. Um, and I, I do believe that uh, science is the cornerstone in our lives. Um, in parallel with humanity, science must go together with humanity. Okay, thank you so much. Oh wow, that was truly an incredible session. Um, I think we need another round of applause for this wonderful woman. Um, so 
I have been such a fan of almost all the women that, that are speakers today. And, um, and the key takeaways that I can take from this session is that, um, you know, number one, being a gypsy is not only okay, but very much encouraged, guys. <laughs> Go live a simple life. The imposter syndrome, thank you, Professor Adiba, for saying that, because the imposter syndrome never goes away, but you just have to push through it, and you need to not let it constrain you. That is, that is perfect advice. And, you know, have a mentor. Always find a role model. Find many role models and, and you know, emulate them. Emulate their work culture. And lastly, listen to your heart. Love what you do, have passion, and always be excited. So thank you, ladies, for inspiring us yet again. Now we'd like to invite Professor Walasini from MUIC for her closing remarks. Yes, before the closing remark, I would like to uh, present some of presentation that I if if you if you can just a moment uh students i will show you something that perhaps you can think about it before you go back home okay so uh next slide please So we, we, I would like to uh, recap that today what we learn is exploring gender specific uh, health challenge on diseases and gender inclusive health care. Next is the closing the gender gap in clinical trials. And then lastly, just we just had women insights and their contributions. Next slide, please. So I would like to uh, address that the trends of economics today, particularly in, in Thailand, that we have six trends of business uh, in the year 2024 uh, with the trend of good health and trend of taking care of your health and then trend of pet parents which is the three trends that uh, become the three of top highest one uh, since last year. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So right now we live being at the speed of thoughts and actually I create uh, this presentation from what you may know well, it's uh, from Bing's image. And next slide, please. So we live in the time of hyper. The first one is hyper connected, followed by the second one, next slide, please. Hyper evolving. And next slide, please hyperpolarized, and next slide, please. Hypersensitive, and then next slide, please. And the last one is hyperinformation, and next slide, please. So all together with the hyper-connected, hyper-evolving, hyper-polarized, hyper-sensitive, and hyper-informed, how shall we live with hyper-era? And then, yes, we have to adapt ourselves to live in the time of hyper-era, which is, next slide, please. So, I would say that there are five B strategies. The first B is being brave and bold with purpose. Next slide, please. The second one is building trust, transparency, and strong relationship. Next slide, please. 
the third one, the third B is balancing short term and long term vision. And next slide, please. Uh, the fourth one is broadening through the global perspective. So the, the fifth one, because I can't see my slide there, the fifth one is breath aware, right? And with that, three skills that I would like to address here today, three skills important. The first one is digital AI and ESG. The second one is empathy and the third one is communication. That's all about that. I would like to uh, address the closing session today. Thank you. What an inspiring message, Dr. Walasini Sakam Duang. Thank you for your profound closing remarks. Now, it's our privilege to introduce our next speaker for the word of closing Dr. Kavita Singh, the Director of DNDI South Asia in New Delhi, India. Dr. Singh is a senior medical professional with an extensive knowledge and in-depth understanding of healthcare product development and Indian R&D ecosystem. Dr. Kavita's leadership and commitment to advancing healthcare in the region has made a significant impact and we are honoured to have her here to offer her perspective on today's discussion. Please. Join us in welcoming Dr. Kavita Singh to deliver the word of closing for our forum. Please join us in welcoming Dr. Kavita Singh to deliver the word of closing for our forum. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, distinguished guests, guests of honor, members of the media, <clears throat> members of the audience, speakers, ladies and gentlemen. A very good evening to all of you here today, both who are present physically and all those who have joined virtually. Thank you so much. As you know, we have now come to an end of what has been a remarkable day of learning, hearing, sharing, getting inspired from one another <clears throat> on this very special event for DNDI, the DNDI's 20th anniversary in Southeast Asia, a forum on gender, health, and science r and I'm extremely grateful to our esteemed speakers for sparing their precious time and so freely sharing their knowledge and thoughts on gender, health, science, and r and to make this special event an enriching experience. I'm delighted to be given this opportunity for giving a closing remarks. And, and I would like to firstly start by thanking the team from DNDI Southeast Asia, all the members in the audience, because you are who make it rich, all the attendees virtually, the media, the R&D, health practitioners. I know we have healthcare workers and lots of students also who are joined today. And all these esteemed women speakers. <coughs> It is your presence, your, your participation is deeply appreciated by each one of us at DNTI. I would especially like to thank the partnership which has been so, you know, coming forward to us and which it is only this partnership which made this even possible and has allowed us to hold it the way we've held it. And you all, as you all know, the partners today for this lovely event are the National Institutes of Health, Ministry of Health, Malaysia, Faculty of Medicine, Sri Raj Hospital, Maidal University, Thailand, Institute of HIV Research and Innovation, Thailand, and Monash University, Malaysia. 
just uh, like even before ending, I know you would have heard, have heard about DNDI, but as we continue our 20th years of existence and allowing a very unique model, a non-profit R&D and a patient-driven model to advocate for improved access to medicines and help in, in develop in life-saving affordable treatment options for neglected populations so that no one is left behind. You would, I'm sure many of you are aware and uh, you understand how proud we are of the partnership which is provided to us by Ministry of Health Malaysia for the last 20 years, and not only this event. Following on our two successes, uh, successful events which were previously organized, one was the Malaysian Women in Science Networking event, which was on April 23, and the Thailand Women in Science Networking, which was on August 23, when we discussed the contribution of women in science, health, and R&D. We gathered here today for the 20th anniversary again on Forum on Gender, Health and Science R&D. And our whole purpose of been to continuing to do this has been to better understand gender inclusivity, emphasizing the importance of empowering and spotlighting exceptional women in the fields of health, science and R&D in Asia and beyond, with a very deep desire to inspire the younger generation. And also in the meantime, ensuring that we promote gender equality, we talk about it routinely in our field of work. Indeed, the physiological differences of the uh, genders of the two bodies means that we do not respond in the same manner in which majority of, in the gender in which majority of the R&D work has happened. So we are really hoping that we have inspired today enough younger uh, you know, scientists, healthcare professionals, to consider gender-specific approaches to treatments and therefore to research and clinical trials. We are hoping this conference has also enlightened us and our uh, students on the importance of collaborative partnership. You know, this is something as a student, I never, I personally never knew the import, huge importance. But today when you grow up, so when the students are you know, informed of how critical a partnership and effective partnership is, I am hoping they take back this strong message with them. The creation of a diverse, respectful, and inclusive environment will also help the healthcare professionals to come up with the new innovative ideas for an effective healthcare that provides patients with care and treatment. And lastly, I am hoping that you all had a memorable time during the forum. You made new friends, you made new contacts, you learned something new, and we hope that let us all continue to promote gender equality and inclusion among ourselves in the field of science and beyond, and not just as a matter of justice, as we have heard today. And with this, I would like, to, as this forum ends, I declare the event officially closed and wish you a lovely day, which is left for people who are joining in physically. Thank you so much, and thank you for this opportunity to give this vote of thanks to this wonderful gathering. Thank you, Dr. Kavita, for those wonderful words. And with that, officially, it marks the conclusion of this impactful forum. On behalf of DNDI, we would like to extend our gratitude to all our partners, to the panelists and the wonderful attendees for making this forum a huge, huge success. We would also like to say that we hope this is the beginning of more fruitful discussions and collaborations across regions to ensure a world where healthcare knows no gender barriers. Thank you. Before we say our goodbyes, <laughs> let's, us, let's help us to improve by filling in the feedback form that can be retrieved by scanning the QR code on the screen. And as for the physical participants, we have some light refreshments that is being served in the ballroom to be collected before you leave. So long and have a safe journey home. Signing off, I'm Hidayah. And I'm Roche. Bye. Thank you and goodbye. Bye.